So their again, yeah. that person, Mercedes, who represents the disobedience to yeah. uh, oppressive authority, tells her beware of fawns. And the mm. fawn is the one giving her all of the instructions right. of what to do in the trials. So it's, again, I think it's all kind of like coming <laughs> together good, there, that's right? That's really good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I think. Uh, What's up, everyone? Welcome back to our monthly exclusive podcast for our subscribe stars and our patrons. I switched it around. I made the subscribe stars first. Isn't that great? Oh, good. They always feel like the afterthoughts. Yeah, Not yeah, anymore, yeah, man. Now, now, they're, uh, now they're the star of the show today. Um, today we are joined by... One of our patrons, David, who is from Spain, um, currently living in Japan. Um, I wanted to bring him on. Obviously, this movie uh, takes place in Spain in 1944. So some of the cultural and historical background, uh, I wanted to bring him on to, to have him to explain some of these things. But before we do that, David, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, a little bit of what you do. Why are you in Japan now? <laughs> uh, all that. Uh, take, take it away. Hi. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to, to join you guys. Yeah, my name is uh, David Garcia Abril, and uh, well, my profession is uh, I'm a Spanish uh, video game translator. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm living in Japan. And, uh, well, first I came to learn Japanese so I can translate from Japanese to Spanish, because right now I'm just translating from English to Spanish. And but uh, here I decided to start studying video game de design in a, in a, spe in a specialized uh, school here in Japan. And uh, well, if, um, if, you, if you are curious about which video games I, I've translated, that at least that I can't say out loud because you know NDAs and stuff. I mean, the most famous one, uh, uh, recent one, will be uh, Yakuza Like a Dragon. Oh, wow! <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, awesome, yeah. dude. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. For, so and, for the um, official Spanish translation of Yakuza Like a Dragon, you were part of the team that worked on that. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, obviously, uh, video game translation is a teamwork. So whenever, whenever I said, uh, when, whenever I talk about the games that I translate, I always say that it was one of the translators. Sometimes I do a little bit more, sometimes I do a little bit less, depending on the project. Um, Yakuza was one of the uh, ones that I was like, um, I mean, it was pretty evenly uh, sh uh, split between the team. So, but yeah, there, there's been games that I did almost all of it. Um, some, of, some of them I did only a few, a few sentences, but other games that I can say will be like, um, um, well, I, I used to work at Nintendo of Europe and uh, I think that mm. the biggest game that I did over there was uh, Fire Emblem Awakening. Oh my gosh. That is yeah. so cool, man. That's really, yeah. really awesome. Okay, so we're here to talk about Pan's Labyrinth today. Um, this is a film I've been really looking forward to talking about for a long time. I think that before we do anything, though, uh, do you want to just really quickly, David, give us just a little bit of background for time period here? This is after the Spanish Civil War. Um, yep. The Francoist regime has sort of uh, taken over Spain at this time. These are This is a fascist regime, friends of Mussolini and Hitler. Um, but, uh, there's probably some other things maybe, uh, I mean, I'm sure that you can sprinkle in some context while we're going through it, but maybe it's just as a baseline, what do you think is important to know as, as far as historical context going into the movie? Yeah. Uh, well, like you said, uh, 19, uh, 1944, that's five years after the end of the Spanish civil war, which ended just a few months before World War II uh, to start it, which means yeah. that, um, yeah, this is uh, the film is happening uh, at the same time as the uh, last year of World War II as well. There's even a, a reference uh, in, in the movie about that. But the important thing here uh, to, to know is that um, after the Spanish Civil War ended, Spain was in the post-war period, which was a period that uh, the country was still healing itself as best as you can do under under a fascist, re a fascist regime. But um, um, the things that are more re relevant to, this, to the story of the film is that Franco was uh, looking for the last uh, remnants of the um, Republican side, the, you, you know, the, the, the side of the, the, the war that lost the, the war. And uh, yeah, the, 
Uh, there are a few things in the movie that are like really accurate. Uh, there are a couple of things that are a little bit, um, I don't want to say glorified, but rather it's a little bit more um, not maybe not that accurate, but still yeah. based on reality. Sure. But uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, you will see uh, in the film there are things like uh, you know like um, uh, Vidal's uh, the, the the villain of the movie. Um, still trying to find out uh, like a group, a resistance group that it's in, uh, in in a mountain that it's not disclosed, disclosing the film. But yeah, that's that's based, for example, that's based on a group of, uh, of resistance that was real, but obviously they weren't as, you know, as successful <laughs> as they seem. Oh, sure. The there you go. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's one example. But also, um, um, for example, the the, Rus the Russian the Russians that uh, are shown in the film that that's also based on on things that happened dur during that time period. Mm. Um, yeah, and yeah, it was um, it was it was a pretty uh, brutal uh, uh, period of of, the Span of Spanish history, and there are still open wounds in Spanish society that are still debating up to the, to this up to this day about what really? really happened during that period. Yeah, 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 it's uh, pretty messy. Oh, uh... So yeah, there's like things, a lot of, yeah. so is there like a lot of disagreement about like what exactly went on or, or is it just certain points that are sort of debated? Certain points, certain points, um, especially about how bad it was, I think. I think that's, uh, that's, that's the, big, the big one. I mean, if you hear, um, I mean, I I know this is, uh, I mean, it, it might be com controversial, but yeah, the, uh, you'll have to know the version of each side in order sure. to know what, what the truth is. And um yeah, I mean, obviously, the fact that it was a fascist re regime and it was really brutal, that's pretty much un un undisputed. But, uh, for example, there are still families in Spain that are uh, claiming that, um, the, for example, the, the grandparents or great-grandparents, -great what happened to them during this period, mm. that they're still uh, demanding the government and uh, historians to disclose what really happened to them. And that's yeah. really interesting to hear because... So the filmmaker, the director here, Guillermo, I always fetch up his first name, Guillermo del Toro, is not, Guillermo del Toro, yeah. he's not Spanish, he's Mexican, right? Yeah. So I, I, you know, as I was sort of reading, I was reading some articles even as far back as like the uh, kind of around the time the film came out, which I think was 2005, 2006, something like that. 2006, um, 2006. Yeah, so, uh, you know, some people, you know, expressing... I don't know, like doubts that uh, like a Mexican filmmaker, an outsider could do like justice to that sort of like uh, period of time. I, I'm, okay. I'm badly summarizing what some people's concerns were just to get to the point that it, it's, it's interesting oh. that a, an outsider, so to speak, came uh, to, to sort of depict this, yeah. I guess, tender portion of, of Spanish history. How do you feel he did in terms of depicting that? Do you think that, uh, and, and I guess maybe what do other uh, Spaniards feel about that, yeah. that have that have seen the movie that you know? Yeah, um, from what I read on in, in interviews and stuff, well, I mean, the most important thing, I mean, Guillermo del Toro has a fascination with um, uh, the Spanish Civil War. Actually, this is not the uh, his first Spanish Civil War movie. Before this one, in 2004, if I recall correctly, he made another one called, uh, in English, The Devil's Backbone, El Espinazo del Diablo, in Spanish. Mm. And uh, that, that takes place in this, uh, during, uh, in the last few months of the Spanish Civil War as well. Although I, I haven't seen that, uh, I'm afraid, so I cannot comment on it. And uh, about him depicting, depicting the war, okay, here's the thing. Um, Guillermo del Toro ap apparently grew up in Mexico alongside the, um, the children of um, uh, uh, Spaniards who fled Spain during the Spanish Civil War. Right. Mm, so with exiles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I was reading that, that uh, mm -hmm. Mexico was one of the places that uh, yeah. people fled to. They had a lot of refugees from that war who went to Mexico, and Mexico yeah, yeah. was very welcoming of, of those hmm. people, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, um, I mean, the... The reason is pretty obvious. I mean, uh, there's no language barrier over there. Sure, right, yeah. right. <laughs> and, and also, and also because of the. Um, uh, I mean, uh, now nowadays maybe some people think that the relationship between Spain and Latin America is very pro is very um, um, thorny, but I, I I don't think it is that bad. I I think that 
even though there are uh, still some points of debate there, um, most of Latin America is pretty welcoming to to Spain and, and vice versa, excluding you know um, outliers. So uh, there were a lot of people who uh, fled Spain, uh, not only to Mexico, but for to Latin America in in general. I know that there are uh, people who fled to Argentina, for example. Sure. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, uh, obviously. Um, Many, many people who fled Spain once, uh, especially on the Republican side, obviously, since Franco won the war, the war, obviously, they were going to go back to Spain <laughs> even after the, the the war ended because obviously they, may, they will be sent to prison, if not, if not worse. So um, they stayed there and they started a new life in, in Mexico. And that included, you know, having children and just Guillermo del Toro happened to know these people so obviously since uh, he interacted mainly with people from the republican side obviously he has a little bit of a lean uh, um, sure, uh, over yeah. them but nothing that i will consider you know overly biased uh, just may maybe the things like uh, again like this uh, group of resistance that have like this big victory uh, at the end of the movie but that's pretty much it uh, for yeah. for the most part i think it's pretty it's pretty accurate and things like you know the the atmosphere of, of the country, the the costume design and all the stuff is like spot on. There are yeah. there are a few there are a few scenes in the in the movie where I can see that oh my god I literally be in a place like this. <laughs> oh cool <laughs> like, yeah yeah, times, so. yeah, yeah that's nice. great. Um, I guess one last thing. Uh, so that 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 Republican government didn't last for very long, right? Uh, the one Spain, before the yeah before before Franco, the, before Franco. Um, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, Spain was an empire for quite a while, uh, all the way up into the 1930s, I believe, right? And then mm, this was it. Was it earlier than that? 1920s. Um, well, there. I mean, there are a few points in history where you can debate when the Spanish Empire ended, but I think that the most recent one will be 1898. Oh, 1898. Okay. Was, well, the Spanish American. The American War, exactly, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, because actually, um, 1898, uh, the Amer the American Spanish uh, War was uh, like a when when Spain lost pretty much all the colonies that they had overseas. Yeah, they only yeah. had like a few. They only had they only had a few, um, a few territories in in Morocco uh, up to that point, and they didn't. And it was. Um, there were territories that Spain didn't conquer themselves. It was something that it was handed handed out from Germany, if I, if I recall correctly. Oh, sure. So yeah, yeah. And um, there, I mean, there was another incident, but uh, in 1920. But you can say that 1898 and 1920, it was the. Um, um, I I for, Excuse me one second because I forgot the, the name of the. It's all good. It's event. all good. Uh, I was just going to yeah. say though that that yeah. Republican government was sort of freshly installed at the time that uh then there became some strife between these two sides that that this spanish yeah. civil war happened between um and then it seemed pretty quick that the the, the francoist the the fascist regime kind of overtook it and it wasn't what until the 1970s 1980s that 70s. Uh, that, that that it became 70s. a democracy again yeah uh, yeah uh, franco died in uh, 1975 and democracy was reinstalled three years later 78 yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's sort of the background, uh, of the country and the, and the strife and, and the war that was going on there. Um, so why don't we, so I guess right at the start of the movie, um, it, it, it basically says España in 1944, right? Yeah. Um, but what's so fascinating about this film is the way that it blends like really really rich symbolism <laughs> uh and sort of like tells a a side-by-side -side story here between this fantasy realm that ophelia is seeing and then like what's really happening alongside that um and there's one scene in particular uh i i won't name it just yet that i think boils down more or less what this movie is really about um but i think uh I think this intro to the movie, I really, really feel there's more to this than I was able to grab yeah. from it. I feel like I have to watch the movie probably several more, more times over <laughs> many more years before I full like feel like I fully grasp just the 
first 15 minutes of the film or first 10 minutes of the film. But I feel like it's all, the whole story is there, like right in the very beginning. And, I, and I've been really eager to hear what you've got to say, particularly about the <laughs> intro of the story. Yeah. Um, but uh, why don't we start there? Why don't we start with just like that kind of introductory narration uh, yeah. and like the underground kingdom and all of that stuff? Well, it'll take me a while to get there because the very <laughs> beginning more stuff. <laughs> is just blackness, right? It is yeah. just black. The first thing we see is black. And I actually want to talk a little bit about the cinematography for the whole movie. Sure. It's really well done. Um, but the important thing to know is that when, when uh, uh, a movie screen is black and you're in a movie theater that's dark, um, you know, you, the, the film kind of shares the same space as the people watching, right? Yeah. It's not so clear where the screen starts and ends, right? And when you start to hear sounds before you've seen an image, it's kind of drawing you in, right? Mm-hmm. It's like the the world of the film and the world of the theater are kind of interacting to more or less become one. Yeah. And you, uh, you know, it's really good. So, but there, there's this great cinemat- cinematographic technique that was... Um, explained by John Alton in the book Paint by Light or Paint with Light. What was it? Paint, painting with Light, something mm, like that. Yeah. Um, and the idea is that things gradually get brighter in the screen as, as you're watching uh, the film. Sure. So things close to the audience will be dark mm. and things far from the audience will be brighter. Mm. And that kind of helps with that gradient from I'm in a theater that's dark and I'm watching something that's real. It helps, you, it helps to give that 3D perspective a little bit better yeah. so that you actually feel a part of the film, yeah. right? It also makes things that end up being very dark and very black, it actually makes it seem like they're in the theater with you because uh, they're just as dark as you are, right? Sure. And so it's almost, a, it, it gives you kind of this 3D effect. Yeah. Really, really, really well done. Um, and it, it, it it's an immersive kind of thing. Now, I'm sure, I've never seen this movie in a theater, but that's <laughs> why they did it. And yeah. I'm sure that it would just really be something else, right? Sure. So I'm going to come back to that multiple times because that actually helps to mask some of their CG yes. a little bit. I, I, I took things some that notes close, on this. I didn't yeah. know if I was going to really, really talk dark. about it too much, but there's definitely yeah. some... Uh, this is like right at the beginning of yeah. some dig- more digital. Uh, did, was this shot on film? I'm this sure it would was, have been, right? Yeah, this would uh, have been. But there seems to be like at least some digital color grading yes, and for things sure. like for that. Sure, that was yeah. like kind of a new technique at the time. At the time. Anyways, yeah. uh, I felt like there's some things <laughs> being masked. For sure. <laughs> so not only is it a good technique for a, for a theater, for an audience, and for interaction and you know feeling like you're there, it also helps to mask up some of the low budget stuff. Because sure. this was not, um, this film did not have a huge budget. Sure. Uh, but it was produced. Produced by Alfonso Cuaron. Did you know that? Yes, you I, that? I read about that. I didn't know that. He is <laughs> one of those filmmakers he's, who he's good. I, I don't talk about a lot, but he's, from a visual standpoint in particular, yeah. I, I think probably one of the best directors one of the best. in the world. So he did the third Harry Potter film, yeah, right. which is most people's favorite of yes. all the Harry Potter movies. Visually, it's just- It's, on, it's so good. On, there's no other Harry Potter film that looks but as good as that do you one. know who he replaced, who was supposed to direct the third Harry Potter film? I re- used to him. know this. I don't remember. Guillermo del Toro. Oh, really? Yes. I can't so Guillermo that. del Toro <laughs> was contacted to direct Harry Potter 3, and he turned it down to do Hellboy or Hellboy yeah. 2, something like that to do one of those films that yeah. he's all about you know and right. he gets more creative control he, he'd rather do that honestly sure. and so it's great that they those two end up kind of coming together um just a couple of years after that movie came out and then they make this movie wow so blackness yeah, the screen that, is black yeah no I, um i was i just wanted to point out that guillermo del toro uh, alfonso cuaron and alejandro iñarruti the guy who directed oh. the, the Re- revenant the, 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 the three of them oh, are, the are friends uh, oh yeah. cool mm-hmm. oh cool yeah so they yeah. made a, a lot of collaborations together so yeah all amazing filmmakers <laughs> yeah very okay so the screen is black first there was nothing darkness the viewer is clearing their mind ready for anything there's incredible potential in the use of the black screen especially in a theater the audience really does become one with the experience of the film their mind dissolves they give up their attention and in many ways they give up their being to the direction of the filmmaker so like Jacques Lacan felt that movies revert us back to the mirror stage of development making us like children who are dreaming and Mm. makes us able to project our own ego onto the protagonist of the film right while the screen is yet black the The first sound we hear of the film, in the darkness, is the sound of a woman breathing. Her breathing Mm. indicates fear or difficulty. It's shaking. Something's wrong. But there is nothing. Then there is the void. 
But no, there is nothing, the void. Then there is breath, the ruach, which is Hebrew for breath. Um, We hear the song, which evokes the comfort of a mother, right? It's beautiful and serene like a lullaby. This serenity is in contrast to the scared cries of the girl. Um, It's as though the girl is in her mother's arms, whimpering and scared. You, you can, you, I almost can feel my mind being transported to like me being a child oh my and my goodness, mom holding dude. me, right? I really love where you're going with this because yeah. I think this is supposed to be the rebirth of the princess to yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ophelia's <laughs> mother, right? Sure, that's, sure, yes. That's really, really interesting because I mean, it, it goes through that whole intro where it talks about that, yes. which we'll get into, but which I didn't to get put into. it together that this is actually Ophelia's birth. Yeah, that yeah. we're seeing here. That's, wow. that's kind of what we're going through. And actually birth is bas- is the theme of this whole movie o- over yeah. and over in so many different ways. So the mother holds her and, whis- er, and hums a lullaby to comfort her. This is the image that these sounds evoke without any anything for the eyes to draw upon. You sure, don't know. Yeah. You're not seeing anything, right? So the lullaby sounds de- uh, distant and echoey and kind of ominous. Next, still without an image, we begin to hear the wind blowing, the crickets chirping. This tells us that it's nighttime outdoors, right? Mm. So... Not, so first, there's nothing. Then we have the breath along with a song that then you have the hint of a world, that a world exists here that you aren't seeing, but the world is void and without form. Sure, yeah. <laughs> if you will. Uh, Genesis 1, chapter 2 or something. Or <laughs> chapter 1, verse 2. Okay, so then... Spain, 1944 happens, right? Then we have the let there be light moment. The images begin to appear on the screen. Mm. The screen lights up. It, it's it's sort of like a birth, right? It's yeah. really beautiful. Um, but it's crazy because this is not what you're expecting to see. It's like there's a woman humming. There's a girl. She's scared. You don't know what's happening. It's dark. You're outside. The last thing you're expecting in this enlightening moment of the director as God, basically, like presenting you with this new world, yeah. is to see death at mm. the beginning of it. Yeah. That, and yeah. it's kind right. of playing backwards, right? right? But yeah. it's like, whoa, a dead person. This yes. is really disconcerting, right? Yeah, sure. But at the same time, you have the sacrifice that is the foundation of this new world. Yes. Right. right. And so it's like, holy crap, this is like really deep and religious yeah, in a lot sure. of ways. In fact, this whole film is very deep and religious while at the same time taking stabs at some organized religion. Well, sure. one particular organized sure. religion <laughs> uh, here and there. Um, oh but, God, you, you, have, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but but still, it is a it is a it is just a, a religious and like a spiritual experience that, sure. that Guillermo del Toro is able to kind of evoke with doing almost nothing, but yeah. just giving you one image and darkness and sound, right? He's able to just like, just, you know, create, craft this new world, right? Yeah. Uh, so the girl is lying. She's bleeding. The The color is blue. It's sad and somber. It takes a little bit to realize what's going on, but the time is playing in reverse. Mm-hmm. Uh, that takes a while. And once again, you, you're, you really don't know what to make of this. It's very disconcerting. But you see that this sacrifice is being undone, mm-hmm. right? So the sacrifice that made this reality possible, that founded this new world that we're about to enter into, um, is being played in reverse and is being undone. Mm. So there we go. We zoom into her eyes and that's where we see, we hear the fairy tale world, right? right? And such a beautiful way is like, okay, so Guillermo del Toro drops us into the harsh reality of life and death, right? Boom, right at the beginning. But he begins to unwind reality in favor of re-entering into this world of a fairy tale. So what he's doing is he's undoing the objective reality that we see and he's, he's, doing, <laughs> he's winding, he's spinning a new tale of this fairy tale mm. in its place, right? Yeah. So that's super cool. I just love that in general. Nice. Um, and before we get into this fairy tale, is there anything else that you want to add? <laughs> um, well- We're one shot into the film so far. I, I think what you said, it, it kind of sparked in me because they do talk about in the fairy tale that comes up here, uh, the story of the princess of the underworld yes. who is Ophelia, who yeah. uh, tries to go up to the surface- um, the light blinds her and she loses her memory yes. and that she's reborn or she, she dies there and then, With the then promise. is then, yeah, to be reborn again. Later. But I, what yes. I didn't put together is that this is the birth yeah, yeah. of the princess right there. And um, when, when you connect it with the end of the film, yes, that is that is right. That so is that's that's really really cool. Right. Um, but the no, birth, I don't have anything until death. we get up to where they're actually explaining the. the okay. How about you, uh, David? Did you have anything? 
that well, are... uh, about um, uh, about the narration. The um, I would like I, I would oh. like to talk about the uh, the voice actor who who, oh, sure. who talks there, because he's also the the guy who uh, dub over uh, Doug Jones' uh, performance. His name, his oh, name Doug is... Jones. Oh, for Pan, for Doug the phone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for the phone. Yeah, the thing is that every everyone talks uh, about Doug Jones' performance in this in this movie for good reason, but I don't see many people talking about his voice actor. And I who was like so to... good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His name is uh, Pablo Adan. He's uh, he, uh, and he's uh, a veteran Spanish voice actor, and he's uh, also uh, um, he's al also a, a theater actor. But he's mo mostly mm. known for his voice acting uh, career. And uh, yeah, pretty much. Even if they don't know the, their name, many people in Spain have heard his voice. And uh, he's he's dubbed a lot of uh, a lot of movies, a lot of TV shows. He's also a voice acting director. And um, some of the roles that he's uh, most known for, uh, I think that maybe the mo the most recognizable ones for um, geeky audiences will be uh, Goliath in the t TV show Gargoyles. Oh, oh really? Cool. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's really he's he's really good, but um, he's also uh, he's also double uh, uh, very often uh, uh, James Woods. Oh, okay, oh, okay. okay, I yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and uh, ah, and the and the and the last uh, last but not least, um, he's the the Span the European Spanish voice for Sully in the Uncharted games. Oh, nice. Okay. Cool. Oh, and cool, cool, cool. Oh, yeah, cool. Sully, okay. the the kind of the older mentor character for Sweet. Okay. for Nathan Drake. Yeah, yeah. So so if you so so if you uh, play those games in European Spanish, you will say, "Hey, why why is uh, the phone mentoring?" <laughs> hey, Falmo, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's great. That's funny. He's got a great voice. So I guess he's the narrator too. That's awesome. Yeah. Yep. So we have you know we have the narrator who is you know building us, continuing on the theme of building us this world. Um, so there was an underground world, but a princess who dreamed of blue skies, a soft breeze and sunshine. She, es she escaped to the world above the cave. Now we get a bit, a little bit of a Plato's cave allegory. Sure. Um, and the beautif beautiful thing about uh, Plato's cave is that, so you've, you're in the cave, you see the shadows on the wall, right? This is the allegory of Plato's cave. Uh, but then one person decides to go up to the above world and right. to experience reality. But the important point about Plato's cave is that that person then comes back down right. to, to then share it with everybody, right? right. And there's and, and, you know, depending on how the story is told, that person then is killed <laughs> for mm -hmm. bringing light to the people who wanted to remain uh, slaves. Um, but anyways, um, you have this princess who goes up but does not ever make this return journey, right? Yeah. So the above girl, she suffered cold, sickness, and pain, and eventually she died. But the king knew she would come back one day in a different body in another place at another time. Mm -hmm. And then Guillermo del Toro takes us on this journey upwards, right? So first yeah. blackness, then darkness, then a fairy tale, then an ascent up to a new world, right? Yeah. So Guillermo del Toro has, in the first two minutes of the movie, taken us on a journey from nothingness into an underworld, right, up into a new higher realm, right? So we're dealing with something more than reality. We're dealing with something kind of, you know, on a little bit different, uh, of a different level. Um, uh, one that seems similar to Spain in 1944, but as we shall see, is a world of fantasy mixed with reality. Right. Uh, magic realism is yes. the like, oh, sub-genre oh, okay. of, of what the film is. And that, that's what he has specifically worked a lot in is this magic this seems to be like genre. his thing right? yeah, yeah yeah exactly right. i've noticed that um, so when it's mentioned the princess would return that's when we see ophelia right? yeah so. right um uh, one one thing uh, i wanted to mention here you, you talked about plato's cave but uh oh, yeah. for those who have followed my channel i've done uh coverage of a game called terranigma which is a yeah. similar very very similar i have not played it um archetype archetype for a story yeah as this or plato's cave mm. um and that's i think that's one we're gonna have to start putting on the, Put on the, the voting list here yeah. soon because i think you'd really get a kick out of the symbolism in that game that sounds <laughs> that fun. game sounds tells fun. its story mostly through visuals and through oh, symbols that's cool. not as much through exposition uh, and text interesting. so cool. anyway that's for a future uh future podcast but <laughs> i started to see the terra enigma parallels kind of like as i was going through this this time i was like hey yeah. you know that's cool we're gonna have to talk about that sometime yeah. um one, one of my favorite games by the way Terra Enigma. <laughs> yeah oh, oh yeah. Cool. Uh, nice. that's yeah. because it was released in europe 
but it was never yep. released in North America. So you would have had a yeah, chance we, to play yeah, that on the world. Super Nintendo. Yeah, 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 actually. And uh, yeah, we. Uh, I like to say that Terranigma was the European Chrono Trigger. Yeah, pretty oh, much, yes. Cool. Pretty much, yes. <laughs> cool. that's, exact, that's exactly what Dude, I would call I have it. To and it's, it's as good as... It's as good as that, in my opinion. That's so. crazy. That's crazy. Um, okay, so uh, my next note here is uh, while while they're driving through sort of the Spanish countryside, right, um, there's this wide shot of a ruined bell tower. And uh, maybe David would know more about this. Um, it, it's, it's a, like... It's. I think that the name of this town, or was called Bel Belchite or Belchite. Oh yeah. Um, Belchite. Uh, which was. It's. It's like. A, it's actually a, kind of a, like a tourist site now, as like mm. a, a site oh. for Spanish Civil War tourism. Oh. Cool. Um, I think a, a drawing of it actually. I I read appeared on a Francoist magazine uh, as early as like 1940. So. This, this village that they're showing that the cars are kind of driving past is like one of those sort of mm. historical sites of the Spanish oh, Civil War, cool. like this ruined village. Um, so that's, that's actually one. I think that's the first shot that they show once you come up yeah. from the underground. And it just shows this ruined town, these, these cars, you know, in, in sort of a caravan Unison, or sort of yeah, driving yeah. Yeah. past that. So, yeah, um, I mean, I'm I'm not familiar with this site in in in, part, in particular. I'm afraid, other that um, it's a, in um, in, in a province called Soria, which is uh, around the you know the center of the of the country, a little bit north. north. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. And um, although I think that the movie is supposed to take place in the uh, close to the to the French uh, French border, although I'm not positive about about oh, this last okay. thing. Mm, sure. Okay. But uh, but yeah, but it's a uh, pretty representative of how. Uh, the state that many Spanish villages and, uh, ended up. Yeah, uh, so it's, during uh, that time. Yeah, you know, like mm. yeah, every everything in ruins. Maybe the the church is a, li uh, a little bit more intact than the, uh, the other side, sure, but still yeah. attacked. So yeah. 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 Crazy. Um. So yeah, this been, first. I I I, I, I well, no. I wanted to say that I've been in uh, in in villages like uh, like that, although mostly on, only in passing. But it's a pretty familiar uh, familiar um, landscape if you know where to look. Oh sure, in like the Spanish countryside, you'll see a lot of villages still. Well, like basically. Well, uh, I mean, nowadays, nowadays is uh, a few of them, but uh, but yeah. Oh wow! Because most of them have been, have been, most of them were rebuilt, obviously. Sure. But yeah, there yeah. are still a few ones. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Um, okay, so as we come into this next scene here, where we get our introduction to Ophelia and her mother, um, Carmen, as yeah. they're driving, there there's more to this than I feel like I was able to like fully grasp the way I wanted to. I know that there's more here. Yeah. Um, I, I feel, I feel like almost the entire movie to an extent is sort of condensed into these opening scenes here. Mm. But essentially what happens is they're driving. She's, she's reading fairy tales. Yep. She's obviously into, uh, you know, fantasy and fairy tales and things like that. Her mother is pregnant, um, with a child of uh, a captain of, uh, what what was the, what's the name I guess of the I mean it's the Francoist regime but like the army would it just be like the the Spanish army I mean like what yeah the, Sp the Spanish army although um, well the, what we've seen in, in in the film is a mix between the Spanish the regular Spanish army but also uh, um, a Spanish um, pol an army police called Guardia Civil or the Civil there we Guard go. Guardia yeah. Civil yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah. it yeah. so that's that's what uh, Vidal Guard. Vidal would be a captain of right it would be that sort of yeah. branch or arm of the yeah. military so uh, she Carmen has remarried this captain she's pregnant with his child and. Uh, what's noteworthy here, and I'm going to get more into this in a little bit, Carmen is telling Ophelia she's becoming too old to be reading this stuff. Yeah, like you shouldn't, yeah. you shouldn't, these are silly stories and you shouldn't be reading this, right? Yeah. Now she gets too ill during the course of this drive and they have to kind of pull over and, uh, and let her out to, to stop for a second. And it's in stopping. It's in like not sort of rushing to the destination. It's in taking a second to sort of like take in the surroundings Yeah, that Ophelia comes across a little stone on the ground that has uh, a carving of an eye in it. Yeah. She goes off the road. So off the path, off the beaten path mm. to this statue that is missing the eye. Um, and I know that there's 
important symbolism with this, <laughs> where she puts the eye back inside of it. And yes. that is sort of what unlocks the magical world for her, that the fairy, which is more of just an insect. Yeah. I yeah. thought it was really interesting that she that immediately cool. identifies it as a fairy. Yeah, She's yeah, not yeah. like, oh my gosh, an insect, that's, that thing's huge, that's scary. Yeah, it yeah. was, oh, a fairy, I saw a fairy was almost the first thought she had. Mm. And it looks nothing like even right. the fairies in her books because that's she right, shows right. it to the thing later. later this on, is a fairy yeah, yeah. and then it transforms itself yes. more into what the typical fairy, you know, is supposed to look like. So, yeah. There's more going on here than I felt like I was quite able to parse, but I, I did think of the story of Odin, who mm. had to sacrifice his eye for, for knowledge, and gnosis, power, yeah. right? Um, and th that there's some kind of like opening of the third eye happening here for Ophelia in mm. particular, um, and that you know I felt like there was something to that with not rushing to a destination with taking your time to stop maybe maybe uh, some kind of metaphor for meditation mm. taking a second to like look inside and to she is awakening her third eye she is essentially gaining a, a higher knowledge and gnosis and it's it's uh, beginning with this process where she kind of puts this stone eye back into the into the statue outside of that I, I couldn't really, I, I still don't feel like that's complete. I feel like there's more to it that I, I wasn't quite able to put my finger on, but. Um, that was great. I that? thought that was great. Um, I actually did not have uh, anything there. In fact, my <laughs> note, my note was so brief, but like you, I had an intuition that there, yeah. this means something more, but I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't grasp it. So it. I yeah. had, I had to move on. Um, so uh, anyway, she, she says, oh, I saw a fairy or whatever. They, they get back into the car and then they kind of pull up to yes. this old mill, which is serving as sort of a base of operations for this, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a platoon or uh, something like that, uh, yeah, that, yeah. that Captain Vial is, is commanding here. They're, they're mm. tasked to hunt down the rebels that are hiding in the mountains here. So right. that's his job, right? And he's waiting for them. And the yes. first thing he says is 15 minutes late, right? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I so, love that as an introduction to him. The step and the reason why they were 15 minutes late because she had to throw had up. To like stop, the, yeah. she was sick, she couldn't like with so, his child, right? And yeah. he's not happy that yeah. he feels like they you you should have been on time, you should have just dealt with it right anyways. He's got a very strict attitude. But the stepfather is holding a watch. Uh, he says, 15 minutes late, as the car pulls up, this indicates to us that he is a keeper of time, right? Mm -hmm. He is a keeper of order, someone who does not tolerate the chaos of life, or another way you could put it is wandering off the path right? sure. to, yes. to explore and to re-put things in place that are elsewhere. You know, he's yep. saying, no, you stay on the stay path. Stay focused. Yep. So the thing that an overly orderly, orderly minded individual will want to have control over is time itself. That's like the number one elusive yep. snake that's like ever changing and that's, it's never in a straight line. It's always moving. You can't ever control it. It's time. So he wants to control everything. And in a way he wants the power to ultimately stop time itself. He's constantly mm. looking at time. He's a master of it to the extent that um, he uses it to control his life and everyone else's life, but he cannot yet control it, right? But that's what he seeks. Um, this is revealed a bit later on uh, with the watch of his father, which stopped the moment he was killed. So the the dictator's dream is for time to stop the moment he dies as well, this dictator's dream. Mm. Um, his life would have that much more meaning. His death would stop time. Just as the years of the earth are counted relative to the birth of Christ, he wants time to stop when he dies with his own death. Yep. The way that in his mind, time did stop for, for his, his father. father right. right. And it's like there's this symbolic thing, right? Um, also, this is the ultimate goal of the conservative extremist, right? Which is to stop time and the connection. Well, actually, the ultimate goal would be to reverse time. <laughs> reverse. <laughs> Anyways, um, go back in time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, a, um, to a better yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Previous. Exactly. Uh, and the connection yeah, to it. <laughs> what? No, sorry. It was I say that? Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, Franco wanted to make Spain great again. <laughs> there you go. Like, there you go. There well, it is. He was. Yep. He was I, uh, well, my understanding was he was less of a fascist and more of kind of like a monarchist, right? He kind of he wanted yeah, to restore exactly. the monarchy. Yeah. Okay, actually, so there's a bit of that. that. 
Yeah, Go something ahead. that I wanted to point out uh, at some point is that, yeah, uh, Franco's regime was fascist, but that fascist has a bunch of asterisks on it. I, I yeah, noticed, because right. he didn't really <laughs> yeah. join the war on the side of, well, he, I mean, they had just had a civil war, right? So they were separate, but yeah. he didn't, I know that Germany and Italy wanted Spain to join the war, and they were, Franco was like... No, I can't do it. No. I can't do it. I can't help yeah. you. I'm sorry. I can't do it. And then, of course, America. Anyways, it's it's a funny situation with Spain. Um, so there was one thing that I wanted to. Now that we've had the introduction to Vidal, and I really loved that that he wants the time. He's a master to, of time to yeah. stop on his death, like his father. Yes, he's obsessed yes. with legacy, right? Oh yes. Now oh, that yes. we've had um, an introduction to this character, I want to read. Essentially what I think, well, for me, is really the core or root theme or, or, or sort of a message of the film here. Um, and, and it comes a little bit later. And I, I feel like when you watch the movie under this lens, there's a lot of things that really fall into place. Yeah. And that is the scene late in the movie when the doctor uh, does not keep oh, the prisoner yes. alive. He well, kills him like out of mercy instead. Yes. Yeah. And Vidal cannot grasp yeah. why you would do that. You know you're going to die you're, if you yeah, do that. Right. And, he's, yeah. and he says um, something to the effect of the only I, I people no, able to quote, obey yeah. without, without questioning. questioning are men like you. Yep. Right? So when, when you watch the film, specifically Ophelia's sort of quest through the film under that mm. lens, that that's the lesson – that she's really meant to learn here. Yeah. Um, That's the theme a, of the movie in yeah, a lot of ways. A lot of things, in, in particular with yes. the trials, which yes. can be a little bit difficult to kind like, of parse. Why is she doing this? Yeah, yeah. Like, what does the symbolism mean? I'm there's so you, many ways I'm to interpret it. I'm glad you caught on to that, actually. Yeah. yeah, but that's really what she's meant to learn in this movie is to not obey just because authority said for the to sake do it. Of obeying. You need yes. to. Uh, think for yourself and in many ways trust your own inherent goodness. Yes. And I've I think notes that, on that you have notes on that too. Yes. So that's kind yes. of where we're going with this. And I just yeah. wanted to make that clear at the beginning because that's kind of where my analysis is going from here okay, on. I'm okay. going to be looking at basically everything with that as like the thematic point of every scene. So okay. um, where should we move to next here? We've, we've just come to the introduction of Vidal. Uh... Oh, there's okay. One, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, there's one thing uh, about his introduction that gets uh, a little bit lost in translation. Case and maybe okay. you picked on, on this that when um, Ophe uh, Ophelia and, and her mother uh, get down the uh, leave the car, uh, Vidal greets them with "Bienvenidos." Bienvenidos. Yes, 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 uh, yes, yes, plural. yes. You, did, plural. did you pick on that? Yeah. I'll yeah. Um, yes. 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 More, than yeah. that, more than that. Uh, the thing is that uh, if he was going to greet two uh, two women, he will have said bienvenidas. Yes, exactly. So but he, he says, knows. Bien bienvenidos. Yeah. Now I do have a question though. Okay, so he says bienvenidos, but um, because okay, so I see. So your implication is that he's not talking to Ophelia and Carmen. Mm -hmm. He's talking to Carmen and his son. Yes. And exactly. he's leaving Ophelia out completely. I, yes. I agree with that. that I agree okay, with that perfect. completely. And yes. I think a lot of this is also evident in the fact that, I mean, right from the start, he takes Carmen's agency away. Oh, yeah. She he's like, says, sit in the chair. I can walk. Yes. Like, I don't need the wheelchair. And he doesn't, he, I mean, he does it in a way where yeah. uh, 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 from someone looking on the outside, he's not forcing. He's like, do it for me. Yes, he, yes, but, yes. but he's only, that's a show. Yeah. That's a mask. He's not letting, he never gives any of the women <laughs> really right. any attention or. Um, unless, yeah, yes. Unless they have a baby boy in their tummy that yes. is his. <laughs> and uh, to the extent that that baby's no longer there, he's like, forget her. Yeah. You know, they have no agency with yes. him. They have no status with him. Um, he yes, is basically a, a, a perfect symbol of this sort of patriarchal oppressive force. Right. Um, and Ophelia has two uh, sort of maternal figures in this movie. Yes. Her mother, which yeah. is Carmen, who is an example of the feminine side basically giving in to please the masculine, uh, uh, sacrificing or um, giving into the fear, I guess, of being alone, which she talks about uh, a little bit later. 
uh, in order to please the man. Whereas Mercedes, yeah. Mercedes, is yeah. the the symbol of a woman who refuses to do that. Right. And Ophelia is is learning to make a choice throughout this movie about whether to obey or not, or when it is right. moral to obey or not. Right. Carmen obeys because she's told to do that. Yes. And Mercedes does not. Does not. And Ophelia does not. <laughs> yes, exactly, right? And yes. so this is kind of the first example of seeing, Ophelia seeing, okay, she has a choice here. And the fact that the book that the fawn gets her later is called The Book of the Crossroads, I thought was really interesting mm, too. Yeah. You have a choice here. And the choice is- That's right. The, the choice your mother makes- Yep. Or the choice Mercedes makes. Well, the choice right. of the right hand and the choice of, of the, the left, left hand. Of the left hand, yes. We're going to bring that up because <laughs> this is great. Uh, also, as soon as um, Vidal meets Ophelia, she puts up her left hand to mm. shake his hand. Yes. And she's, she's, first off, you can say, oh, she's immature. She's unacquainted with the world. She doesn't sure, know how things doesn't work. doesn't know how it's supposed um, to work. But there's way more to it than just, than just that, right? So, you know, Vidal grabs it and says, es la otra mano, Ophelia. And he like just yeah. does away with her and just yeah, leaves. And right. he won't, he won't even wait for her to correct it, right? He's nope. just like, you screwed, you done screwed up, kid. Knock it off. Throws her hand down, leaves. And then, but- the the idea that she offered her left hand is the idea that I don't know how to explain this. I actually probably put this in my notes a little bit better. Um, you know what? The, the, let's just say that the left hand occurs frequently in, in the, this in, the film. in this yeah. film, and it's the left hand is the hand of disobedience, right? The left yes. hand is the hand of 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 chaos. It's the it's the you know it's the black. For the yin, the yin and the yang, the yin, it's yeah. it's like it's the left, right? It's yes. it's the improper thing to do. Um, but Ophelia does not seem to be left-handed. When she writes in the book, it's she right. writes with her right her hand. Right hand, yeah. But her left hand, she does a few important things with her left hand, this being one of them. I bring up a few others. Um, but it's very important to understand that th the idea of the left hand and that there is value in the left hand, yes. right? Because let's just say, I'm going to jump to the end of the film right now just to make my point, but we're, we'll keep going. Don't worry. Um, in the Bible, in the New Testament, if you endure things well and you suffer and you yeah. can be seated on the right hand of God, right? right? Mm -hmm. The right hand of God. Right. You can think of Christ as the judge, as one who, who uh, brings people in on his right hand. Yes. But then on the left hand, pushes people away or um, that the left hand is the, it, it's a different job that the left hand does. Sure. Well, when Ophelia at the very end of this film, when she goes back to be with the king, she is seated on the left hand of the king. Right. And not only is it like, you know, a, a, the king has his right hand and his left hand, but that there is use for the right hand, but that there's also use for the left hand. Sure. It's not something to be expunged. It's not something to be done away with. It's something that has valuable uh, value and needs to be in, in its place, right? Yeah. You can't forget about it. You can't only focus on the right hand. Anyways, there's a lot here and we'll, we'll keep well, touching on it as this Yeah, and there's, there's so much there that we've even talked about with the, you know, Carl, Jung's anima and animus, right? Like oh, yeah, the integration yeah. of the two. That's right. The integration right. of the shadow, not the rejection of one side yes. of the yin or yang that exactly. both need to be integrated together. Yeah. And I think not only in fascist regimes or, um, it, you know, sort of oppressive patriarchal uh, situations, whether it's in the family or whether it's in a community or whether it's in the government or whatever it might be, where, you know, women were obviously treated as lesser uh, citizens had lower status than men for a super long time. Mm. Um, but, but also in religion, this was the case too, right? Uh, in traditionally. So uh, this idea that we're, we're kind of seeing a representation of all the things in the right hand in this movie having all the power, yeah. but the left hand is shown to be not more important, but equally important, that there's Equal. an integration of the two. That it can't be forgotten. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. That you can't, you can't reject the left and only hold to the order and the ideals of the of the yang and yes. the, that, that and the, just do away with the yin completely. Sure, yeah, you, well, you, you can't. There's do another. That. There's another thing um, I would like to add. 
I'm not I'm not sure how much of this was intentional on Del Toro's uh, part, but the thing is that the use of the of the uh, of the left hand was discouraging in in Franco's in Franco's. Uh, That's Spain. true. Uh, left, yeah. Left-handed people, right? You were forced yeah, yeah, to actually, write with your right hand, right? Yeah, for a long time uh, yeah, the, in schools, the they made you write with your right mm, hand instead of your left hand. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, when I was in the what will be the, the equivalent to mi middle school, I had yeah, a. Yeah. One one of my classmates was uh, left-handed, and there was one teacher. It was only one teacher who tried, uh, and it was a, a Spanish language teacher who uh -huh. tried to force him to, into using the right hand because he no said way. left hand because she said the left hand was the the, the hand of the devil. Yes, yes, no, yes. That's the idea here, mm -hmm. that, and I think Guillermo del Toro is drawing on that type of an idea when he's yeah. got Ophelia using her left hand. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was a whole yeah, well, thing uh, where, like, left-handedness, there was, like, a huge spike in people reporting uh, being left-handed after it became, like, acceptable. mandatory in oh, school and things like that uh, for okay. people to be forced to use their right hand. Yeah, There yeah. was, like, all of a sudden, all these people were... <laughs> so, like, you know, people were yeah. allowed to be their natural selves, <laughs> and all of a sudden you yeah, get yeah. a better yeah, idea I, of how I, many left-handed people, there, left -handed mm -hmm. people there actually are, right? Yeah, yeah, I, w I wanted to... to make this clear but um the this incident with my uh, uh, former classmate it was only one teacher she was pretty she was okay, pretty okay. old and uh oh, everyone sure. thought that it was stupid <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm sure by that time because i don't even i mean it would have been well, pretty i mean a pretty long time ago that that would have yeah, been yeah done that, away that was with, the but... late late 90s late, late, late 90s, 90s. And yeah there was, it was it was a little bit yeah i mean uh, obviously we were too young to know all the implications but we all thought yeah, it was stupid and the school the school told, told her to to knock it off so. yeah right there there is great symbolism to the right and left hand though and the right and left side yeah it, it's just i think i think the idea is that yes they're different but um that doesn't mean one's better or that one is good and the other's bad. No. Right. You that, need I think them that's both. what he's saying. Um, and there's also the idea of Ian McGilchrist wrote The Master and His Emissary, right, which talks about the left right brain split. And according to Ian McGilchrist, the right brain is more dealing with the chaos of nature, and the mm. left brain is more dealing with ordering than being specific. And of course, the left brain controls the right hand, and the right yes, brain controls right. the left They're hand. Opposite. And mm. so the idea is that with the right, with the right brain, your left hand will kind of, you know, vaguely, you know, feel through places. And this is for most people who are not left-handed, I guess. Yeah. Um, and will kind of deal with nature as in broad swaths, whereas mm. the right hand is pointed and it grabs things. And it's very specific. And it's, I want to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to grab it. I'm going to order this. Um, the left hand deals more with nature. Anyway, so there's some there's some science to sure. the, the left-right thing as well. Right. Um, okay, so... Um, my next note here. Uh, so when she leaves camp, right? Uh, and goes yeah, because so because yeah, so uh, everyone kind of goes inside, and and she's led away by this fairy that she saw, yeah. where she finds the labyrinth, and this is where she meets yep. Mercedes. But first, there's a gate. Yes, she walks under this circular gate, right, with the yeah. head of the fawn. Yeah, at the center of the gate. Right. So um, this is kind of the introduction to the fawn's labyrinth that she'll be going into later. Um, Mercedes catches her here before she really gets inside and kind of pulls her back out. Yeah, yeah. Get an introduction to that character. Um, uh, I the one note that I took here that I thought was really interesting, and this this is I think huge, uh, is that Ophelia explains, or, or when she's talking to Mercedes, she says that her mother is sick with a baby. Ah, yes. Did you notice? That's a very now. Yeah. Maybe you, because I was, I was questioning this. I don't, I'm not a native Spanish speaker. I, I yeah. know very little really Están in the scheme of things. But is that like a normal way of describing somebody being pregnant? pregnant? Because and, in and English, butter. you would not say that. She's and sick butter. with a baby. You'd say she has, uh, what's the term for it, for uh, pregnancy when with, women are sick when they're with pregnant? child in Spanish or English? No, in English, when you're, when they're just, it's like morning sickness or yeah. they have some way of describing it. But you wouldn't say, oh, I she's sick right with now. a baby. You wouldn't say she's sick with a baby, no. Is, would that be normal <laughs> in Spanish? I just want to make sure I'm right <laughs> in saying no on that. <laughs> uh, this, uh, I, I didn't take a note about what, what she said specifically. Uh, in Spanish, uh, right. In Spanish, yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm it's all I mean, good. I, I, she could have said, well, she's even, sick and has a baby. Well, I, I think I, I'm her. pretty sure that that is what she says in Spanish. She says she's sick with a baby in Spanish too. Yeah. But what I'm curious about is, is that a normal way of describing someone who's pregnant in the culture to say someone's sick with mm -hmm. a baby? 
Okay. Not really, not really. Okay. No. Uh, now, although, keep in mind, keep, 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 I mean, keep in mind, um, maybe this is a, a good time to bring this up that there's a, the English subtitles. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, the thing is that um, Guillermo del Toro himself wrote the subtitles in in in, in English, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, crazy. it's been a long time since the since the last time that I saw the the movie with English subtitles. But I remember disagreeing a few things with sure, uh, yeah. in a few translation choices. Maybe that that, that was one of them. Okay. Interesting. So, um, uh, yeah, they, I I don't remember I don't remember hearing anything weird in the in, in that part of the of the movie. So probably it's a yeah. translation issue. Okay. Well, the reason I bring this up is because I I it's not really like a normal way. It, that is interesting though, and I didn't know that 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 he did the English translation. Yeah, of the that's film. fascinating. That's so good. That, that is something to consider. Yeah. Though. But it's it's not really a normal way of describing that. My mom's no. pregnant and she's feeling sick because she's pregnant, but. She is in many ways sick with a baby you're, because I like you're reading here. This yeah. is Vidal's child, and his poison is killing her. Uh, yes, now, this yes, is yes. the entire symbolism of the first trial, where yeah. she goes into the tree and the toad is yes. poisoning the yes, tree. Yes, this is big. This right? is big. Yes. So I feel like that's a very intentional uh, line there, being a little bit different than you would usually describe that, because it's it's true for this film. She is sick with the baby. The baby, yeah. the poison the baby, of Vidal is yes. making her sick. Vidal has made her sick with right. with his, his poison. His, <laughs> yes, exactly. With his seed, <laughs> right? So I really liked yeah, that I line a lot. Um, the idea of her going under the gate is her entrance into a new world, a new space, right? So she enters this kind of this alternate world. Yeah. Um, it's worth noting that Ophelia seems to be about 13 or so ish, yeah, 12, 13 ish, maybe like in this movie. It's very important as that age is a natural entrance into a new world for four yeah. girls becoming women. Yeah, sure. Um, they pass from being girls into being women. Um, so this is a good time for the movie to be taking place as well. Um, and passageways. Well. Each time she goes into a passageway, she comes out a different person, mm-hmm. right? So it is kind of like a rebirth, but many times over. Right, so right. she keeps she keeps having these experiences where she is reborn through this passage through a passageway, a different person each time. Right, yeah, it's it's right. very interesting. Yeah. Although maybe, uh, well, I would like to point out. Uh, apparently, Guillermo del Toro uh, originally wanted uh, someone who was younger, so around mm. like uh, seven or eight oh. years old. Oh, but really? He was, yeah, but he was so impressed with Ivana Vaquero's performance that he decided to change his plan. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. she is huh? really good. I she mean, was quite good. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what she's gone on to do since this movie. Obviously, I'm not like well versed in Spanish it would be cinema, in Spain, probably. but yeah, she, she's she's excellent. She, yeah, she she moved she moved to uh, with her family to New Zealand, and apparently he did a bunch of oh. stuff uh, over there. And now oh. she's in the in her in her late twenties. Now she uh, she, uh, she went back to to Spain, and she's made a couple of uh, Netflix t- TV shows, if, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. So okay, she, oh, nice. she, she's still she's still around. She's still around. Around. That's good. And and and, well, you know the um, uh, the, Go- the Goya Awards. That's the the Spanish equivalent to the Academy Awards in Spain. Oh, okay. Oh, sure. She Maybe. she won uh, a Goya for her performance in the in this movie, and she's the youngest oh, yeah. winner in in. The oh, movie. that's hey. awesome! Oh, cool, Awards. cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, oh well she deserved. totally deserved it. Her, her, yeah. her performance is amazing. This film. Another thing um, too, after she tells Mercedes that um, her mom's sick with a the baby, then she asks, "Have you seen my mother? She's so beautiful." Right? Yeah, right. Like mm-hmm. it's so cute. I I think it's adorable. <laughs> but Ophelia has an obsession as a child, of course, with her mother. Yes, and this is part of the passage of her becoming going from going girl to woman. woman. Yep. Is that she's going to have to separate that? Yep. Right. She's she's becoming less of a child and more of an adult throughout the course of this film. Yeah. Um, so she thinks her mother is the most beautiful person in the world, but this makes her kind of similar to the antagonist in a very important way. Sure. Because um, Vidal thinks his father was just the yep. coolest person That's in the true. world. He and he wants to be like his dad, right? Yeah. So, um, but remember, and this is a note that I'd skipped over earlier, talking about conservatism and how it's, it's important for cultures to have a conservative element. I don't want to be um, mean to that kind of idea. Conservatism is important. It's just the way that Vidal uses it to further his own ambitions is really what's what's really bad here. Well, right. And it's, so- It's the whole intrication of the left and right Exactly. Hand, right? You, the you left can't, and right. You can't stick so far to one side. Exactly. That. Thank you. So um, I said, remember, it's not merely the traditional and the ancestor reverence that makes 
her stepfather so evil. It's more the way he uses those things to further his own ambitions, right? right? But whereas Ophelia uses her reverence for her mother to help people, to help sure. her mother, and to even help her her brother, who she would feel no connection to otherwise. Sure, right. Um, okay, so my next note, which is not really like, a, it was just kind of a note I made while I was watching the film, was uh, the doctor telling Ophelia two drops as, as medicine for the mother. I knew that Those that was going to be a, a big setup for later, which it is. Yes, um, it is. But then the next <laughs> sort of like major note I took was when she's in bed with her mother, they're kind of going to sleep. Uh, and Carmen is talking about how she's going to give her a surprise the next day. Oh, and yeah. the first thing Ophelia goes to is, a book? Did mm, you get me a book? Yep, yep, yep. And she says, no, no. something much better. Now it's the dress, right? Right. It's the yeah. it's obviously the dress. It's, way it's, better it's than this the book. <laughs> this sort of like again ideal of femininity that uh, Carmen yes. is representing in the film, one yes. which is um, submissive to yes, yeah. the sort of dominant right-handed force, mm-hmm. right? So she thinks the greatest gift or surprise she can give is a symbol of that in sure. a dress, in the etiquette of the time, in pleasing. Right. Vidal, right? By, yes. by outwardly, that's true. Representing what a little girl is supposed to be in the yeah. culture, right? This is less a gift for Ophelia; it's more a gift for Vidal. Yes, yeah. it's exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah, and but so, honestly, here's the, here's an important thing though, because Ophelia would ask her at some point in the film, I can't remember where, um, like, "Hey, why do you stick with him?" And she says something like, "Oh, you'll understand when you're older. Like, you yeah. don't like life is complicated." Right. Now, civil civil war torn countries and. A woman who has a child finds some a high status male that's willing to help her live. Yeah. Right. Like, I don't want to be. And I'm not saying that you are or anything, but sure. I I don't want to be too hard on Carmen here. Sure. Because no. she is doing the best she can to ensure that her daughter lives. Yeah. And sure. her daughter is doing everything to undermine her. Yeah. And the end result is that her daughter dies. Yeah. Right. So in some, it, there's a way of looking at this film to say that um, Carmen was right. <laughs> like sure. She. She was doing what she could do for the survival of her family. And that includes, yes, being subservient to a jerk, but who has the status to keep her alive, right? Sure. This was a really tough time to live. I think, Just to throw I think the, one second, I think the way that I would put this is that, and, and we've talked about this in, in a lot of other um, uh, podcasts we've done, uh, particularly Nausicaa or, or Hellblade, like acting mm-hmm. on fear, right? Yeah, this yeah. choice was one that was clearly made from the fear of destitution, yes. Yes. not being able to survive, whatnot, yeah. right? Very present um, driven reality. by that, and which is why she's willing. Yeah. Now, uh, to call that the right or wrong choice, I don't even think I, I have any place to say when it comes to the survival of your child, right? Right. In a war-torn country, when you're a woman and you have no status. Right. That being said, what she's discouraging her from doing is reading yeah. and using her imagination. Yes. Which are yeah. absolutely like important things to encourage and foster. Yes. And so she's she's trying to stifle the left hand of Ophelia's yeah. curiosity, imagination, uh, seeking of knowledge, making her own choices, having her own agency by telling her, no, it's not good to read. It's not good to exercise right. your imagination in these you know, silly worlds, right? And and what do we do on this podcast? All we do is talk about <laughs> fiction, but what is the por- yeah. purpose of well, it? Well, we also it's, live very comfortable lives in non-war ravaged sure. countries. But my point is that, it, it, it is that uh, engaging in fiction is not just entertainment value. Yes. It's, it's you're learning important life oh, yeah. lessons. Well, that's in what it. we try it's, to do. It's, yeah. it's like, um, it's like uh, vicarious learning almost. Yes. Right? So it's a very important part of almost every culture is mm-hmm. is art and fiction and and uh, yeah, expressing stories. ideas yeah. and uh, allowing other people to engage with those ideas and critique them and like this is a very very important thing to develop it's all being stifled out of the fear yeah. of we got to please this man so that we can live right? right and while the intention there I think is of course a good intention um I don't think it's a good thing that she's doing. That's my personal opinion. And, and that's course, Guillermo del Toro's opinion as well. Sure. And I love that Guillermo del Toro, I don't love love this. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's fascinating in a very touching way, really, that he does, that she does die in the end. 
Yeah, right. Because Guillermo del Toro, if he really wanted to tell the story uh, to, to, to further his own like ideas of, oh, you always disobey and then things turn out great for you in the sure, end. Yeah. And it's like, he didn't do that. He's no, like, that's what yeah, I love about she disobeyed. Too. And if she obeyed, she would, she would have lived. But she disobeyed and died. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but she lived a life that was, well, we're going to get into it a little yeah, bit later. Right. But Guillermo del Toro is still saying, yeah, in this part of the fairy tale, yes, even though the girl who left the underworld experienced the cold and hardships of life, life is still worth living right. even because of coldness and hardships. And right. even and, and and it's even worth giving up your life so that other people can experience even harsh the harshness well, of reality. That's That comes, and I'm going to pass it to David here in just one second, but that's yeah. all embodied in this fairy tale she reads to her brother in the womb with yes, the story the of rose. the rose and the yes. thorns, right? Oh, I so let's get into that of ourselves, maybe. in one second. I'm going to pass it over to you because uh, I knew you had something to say there. Yeah, well, a couple of things. First off, um, we have to go back to, to the conversation, but you, um, I, I've seen um, a few people online uh, w uh, wondering why the hell Carmen uh, married this, this bastard. Yeah, these but, are people uh, who live comfortable lives, yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah, the thing is that you have to keep in mind it was uh, after a civil war. Basically, yeah. she married uh, a, a person who was in the safest, at least in theory, the safest place she could be, which was married yeah. to a member of the military. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And a high and, status, um, and he exactly. made good money. And it's difficult for a single mother to remarry into a high status. That's... That does not happen very often, mm. right? If you have a 12-year-old kid, like most guys are going to be like, I don't want that, especially if they're high status enough. They're going to be like, no, I'm going to pick a younger woman. I'm going to pick somebody else. Um, but the fact that he married Carmen, I actually don't have an answer for that. I don't yeah. know why he did that. <laughs> why he would um, do that, yeah. But anyways, well, well, maybe we can speculate a little bit later. But yeah, yeah. that that's something that in in a time of, of, of drought and death, you don't turn that down. Well- not to speculate too much yet on the on the reason. Um, mm. I mean, I'm sure he could have, yeah, pretty much had any woman he wanted. I but believe the, I so. think the yeah. important thing here is that he doesn't really care no. at all no. about yeah, yeah. It could a, have been a relationship. Or it, yeah, that's yeah. I think that's the point. Yeah, it, it didn't matter who it was. It's yes. just a vessel for his legacy. And I guess he didn't care about the daughter because he's like, I'm not going to take care of her anyways. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. Also, could be it. Well, um the second thing that I wanted to say, when, um, when Carmen Carmen talks about that thing that was so much better than a book, and um, yeah, uh, I mean, the dress was part of it, but there's a little bit more of symbolism in the shoes. Oh, oh that's yes. right. Yes. That's right, yeah. the shoes. Okay, yeah, go yeah, on. She, go mean, on. Yeah, she 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 basically points them uh, points them out. Especially is um, I don't know how they translate it in English. In Spanish, it's called tarol. I think in English, it's called lacquer. Oh, yeah. lacquer. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The thing, the thing is that um, those uh, that, that kind of shoes, the tarot shoes, um, in Spanish, in Spanish culture, they have a little bit of of, of meaning because they're, they're oh. supposed to be like a, especially beautiful, especially for women. There's okay. even a, a pretty, there, there's even a pretty popular song that is ded dedicated to them. Oh, really? About how? Yeah, yeah. So basically, the, the those shoes are supposed to bring uh, bring Ophelia's uh, childlike beauty. Uh, it, they accentuate them basically. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Well, I feel yeah. like I'm trying to remember now. Was Ophelia? Ophelia was happy to get the shoes. She didn't like the dress. Am I? Am I wrong I, about that? I, I can't don't. Remember. I can't. Re I don't remember like taking a note on that. I uh, didn't as much didn't. as as feeling just in general that like. She doesn't care that much about dressing up well, and looking yeah, pretty uh, as much as she cares about uh, these trials she has to do. Right? Sure, sure. Where are you going to say? Yeah, Dan? what I remember, what I remember is that uh, they told they told her that uh, she wore if she wears the dress and, and the shoes, she will look like a princess. And I think that's, that's uh, the part. That's oh, what, like, yes. Maybe that's it. Okay. That was the part that okay. she was and excited about. She was like, about. "Oh, cool! Oh, because yeah. she let's, wants to let's get want that. to be." I uh, thank you for bringing it up. I think that's right. Um, cool. Okay, so. The, yeah, so let's talk about that fairy tale that she she reads to her brother because uh, the Carmen says, "Oh, your brother is um, is acting up again. Can you read him one of your stories or tell him one of your stories?" And she she basically yeah. uh, tells this story. Where is it? Uh, about a mountain 
that's surrounded by poisonous thorns, right? Yeah. Um, there's a rose kind of at the top that's a representation of eternal life. If you possess yes. that rose, you would have eternal life, but it's surrounded by all these poisonous thorns. And that all the people, all they ever talked about when they were discussing this was the Where's pain the and the death yes. that would occur if you tried to go there. Yep. But no one ever talked about the promise of the eternal life. The life. Now, that's kind of like, uh, more or less a metaphor for life, right? right. Like you the have best to pass life through the trials. Is to be found, yes, the best life is to be found uh, at the end of or through suffering and, and pain. And yeah. this is something we talked about a lot in our podcast series on Xenosaga with alchemy, yeah. right? Which That's is a right, big yes. uh, symbol used to represent yeah. uh, the how the, the characters, and, and, um, each character's like progression through having to face something really difficult that they don't want to. They'd rather run away from it. They'd yeah. rather not pursue that sort of introspective course that is uh, a process of refining that is painful and difficult and hard. Yeah. But at the end of that is the the the, the, the red, the, the yeah, red yeah. jewel, right? Yeah. In this case, the rose. The rose. Through that path of thorns yes. that everyone's too afraid yeah. to face. And, uh, you know, again, sort of tipping off something from the end, but that rose is represented on her dress in the return to the magical kingdom when she sits on the ah, left hand cool. of her father. Yes, it's yes, there yes. on her dress, right? Oh, she that's went cool. Through I actually didn't notice the that. pass of thorns cool. and, and she, she obtained So she obtained the thorn the, the eternal rose. life, the rose through, by the end of the movie. Yes. At the, but, that was not without cost. Yeah. But yeah, so that's that it. that's again uh every single scene in this movie is, is so <laughs> rich symbolically in this way. Yeah. Um but I didn't know if anybody else had any more um notes on that uh little story she tells her brother there. No. Um well, I do, actually. I do a little bit. And okay. I, I'll get there. Well, let me just go ahead and read them right now. Okay. Um, yeah, so I said this is similar to parents and teachers and governments. Um, authorities, in general, they will keep you from great things because you might get hurt along the way. Yes. They talk of the pain and the death, but not of the potential promises that such a dangerous journey can hold. Right. This, in many ways, is the world we live in. It reminds me of the amazing quote from the book Dune. Uh, shelter your child too much and he'll not grow strong enough to fulfill any destiny. Mm -hmm. You can keep your kids safe. You can keep your people safe. You can do everything you can to corral them in this little room and make sure that they're safe and nothing will ever happen. It's like that, uh, <clears throat> that SpongeBob episode where he stays indoors <laughs> and he's got a chip and a used napkin and a coin <laughs> and that those are his friends, you know, and he's like, everything's so great when you're inside, you never get hurt. Everything's perfect. Um, but the idea is that, yeah, you also don't do anything either. Right. right? You don't and so anything. sheltering and setting rules, uh, sheltering and setting rules about children, uh, to only concern them with death and fear and pain will ultimately deny them the transcendent fruits of life and experience that I think Guillermo del Toro found, uh, finds so valuable. They're worth the pain, even death. This movie is making that point yeah. in a way. Yeah, I agree. Uh, totally. And then um, I, have, I have something else here too, talking about fairy tales just in general. Um, the grownups, they just lie to her. All the time. All the time. It's her mother. Hey, are you okay, mom? Yes, I'm fine. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no problem. Everyone just lies to her. Uh, the grownups insist that she's the one living in a, in a fairy tale. Right. But they're all living in their own fairy tales. Yeah, exactly. Right? So Vidal about his grandfather, Carmen his about father. Vidal, and Ophelia about everything. But also Mercedes, like she, like this is the thing. Like you think that the rebels aren't living in a fairy tale. <laughs> like, why are they doing yeah. what they're doing? Clearly, right. they don't have realistic hopes and dreams. Yeah. They're living a fantasy world where they can still win. Yeah. They don't win. Just spoiler alert. They don't win. <laughs> nope. Maybe 30 years later, something like what they wanted ends up happening. But like, this does not result in success. No. They're not living in reality. They're living a fairy tale. Everyone mm. is living in a fairy tale, right? It's but so they true. all think that she's the one and that they're all living in their own objective reality that's real and she's wrong and all that. Yeah. It's n not nearly that simple. Right. So mixing fantasy with historical events makes for such a good movie. And yeah. I don't mean modern fantasy, like power trips and all that. I mean classic fairy tale fantasy, yes, right. right? That's why this movie draws me in yeah, so much. For, for real. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was, uh, I, I don't remember what I was reading. This is a total tangent for just a second. Um, <laughs> I was reading something and, and sort of researching this film and, and they were talking about how fairy tales in general have been so watered down for uh, like more yes. recent generations, yes. in particular with more 
like the darker and I like more it. mature kind of like content that used to be in them. Yeah. That's like, oh, that's not appropriate for my child to yes. hear now. This kind yes. of goes yeah, along yeah, with what yeah. we're talking about of the it overprotectiveness does. of children, right? Yeah. And this has happened, uh, I think, even to like another level since I was a kid, right? So like yeah. I grew up watching movies like The Dark Crystal Oh yeah, there you go. The yeah, Never yeah. Ending Story and yeah, uh, and uh, Labyrinth and things like yeah, that. Labyrinth. We're kind of like creepy, yeah, dark yeah. fantasy films. Yep. But it was like considered you can you can take your kid to see this. Yeah, yeah. And there's some messed up stuff that happens in there. Sure. Um. There yeah. there's some imagery that's a little scary. Uh. Like, uh, well, well, the uh, uh, Atreus' horse being, you know, uh, yeah. sucked down and in, in, into right. the uh, what is it? That swamp of sadness or whatever, Where, yeah, and dying. Pull it up. That was like really hard to watch as a kid. I remember yeah. being really sad watching that movie. But that's okay. You're not supposed right. to just like feel good feelings all the time. And children yeah. need to be like introduced to that. You can't protect Younger. them entirely. Yes, I agree. <laughs> now, to what at what age it's appropriate? Of yeah. course, there's some gray area. But what I'm saying is, is that. I, I, I don't like how that is the case. And this is, like you're saying, much more true to sort of like the traditional structure and mm -hmm. archetype of a fairy tale, which yeah, yeah. had a lot darker material. And these oh, were supposed more. to be stories way. you tell your kids. Yeah, and yeah. there's a reason because they need to be introduced to this stuff. They in need a to- In a safe kind of way. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in a safe environment. But, and so, but still death and all that, yeah. Yeah, death yeah. in particular, you know, learning to grapple with that from a young age, I think is important. I think, you know, waiting too long I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll say this while also saying that um, I love my mother to death. I think she's wonderful. She's one of the mm -hmm. most amazing people I've ever met. Your mom is awesome. I think she was yeah. really too overprotective of us. And that's mm -hmm. why she took us out of school for a little while. Right, we were, were homeschooled school, yeah. for a bit. She didn't want us being, you know, influenced in certain ways. She didn't want yeah. us to be introduced to drugs. She didn't, but it's like- It worked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, but like- I, I actually think she did us a, a, a disservice in a certain way yeah. by, by being so overprotective because it yeah, took yeah. me a while to adjust socially. And I came across all that stuff anyways at some point. Eventually. Yeah. And, and you have to just, that's why teaching early is a good idea. Exposing right. early is a good idea. And you say, mm. see, here's the dark and scary thing. Now you're aware of it. You feel the impact of right. it. That's scary, right? Now here's how you avoid the thing, right? Here's a yeah. story I'm going to tell you about how to live right. life the right way. Don't be like Pinocchio. Don't go, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, anyway, I was just thinking of that because Del Toro just did a, a Pinocchio film. I, I have words about that, that as well. I have but words. But it, it's, it's have closer words. to like the darker fairy tale version than the Disney version, right? Yes. Anyway. I have words. Total tangent there. <laughs> but I just wanted to say, I, I really believe in that. And uh, Good. that, that, Telling your that that introducing children at a younger age to some of the darker aspects of those story uh, those fairy tale stories I I think is important, um, and I wish I had seen more of that than the Disney versions personally. But <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's all that's all really good. By the way, um, I have a comment here on like fantasy and especially relating to the fact that everyone here is living in a fantasy sure, a little bit yeah. to one way or another. <laughs> um, when I first watched this movie, I had uh, opinions about whether or not the events of the film actually happened the way that they're oh, described yes. in the film. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> yes, for sure. The question about which parts of the film are of Ophelia's subjective imagination and which parts are to be considered objectively factual is a question I actually just have no interest in anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just don't care. Like which parts are just in her head and which parts are true is a dichotomy that holds little value to me anymore. Uh, the fact is that we all live in our own like little fairy tale worlds. Mm. We all believe in things that can never be proven. Uh, we all see projections from our own mind and not the objective world. Um, we are all dreaming all the time. Life is a mix between whatever you understand reality to be and a fairy tale. It just simply is. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien had a great essay called On Fairy Stories, mm -hmm. where he illustrates this beautifully. Yep. We tell ourselves stories. We tell each other stories. We invent stories. We dream. We listen to stories. Even at night, we're just inundated with a story in one form or another. Um, everyone is at all times immersed in stories. Yeah. And if you hear a story from someone and think you just heard an 
objective description of actual events in reality, you're kidding yourself. Sure. If you watch the news and think you know what is actually happening in objective reality instead of hearing stories and tales, yes. you're once again kidding yourself. 100%. And so on and so forth. In a very real sense, you create the world around you in multiple ways. Uh, life is a journey of dipping in and out of lucidity. In fact, Del Toro does not give more weight to history or reality as than he does to fantasy or the non-rational aspects of the film. Uh, they are both in operation in the world. We all live our own delusions, but whether or not we think someone else is delusional or not depends on how well their delusion lines up with our own. If one person isn't in line with the collective delusion of the people in the community, then they're considered delusional and they are, you know, outcasts. Um, and because the people around us all have similar collective delusions to ourselves, we get to call it objective reality. Yes, right. For us, right. That's my note. Now, <laughs> I, I love that you brought this up because this is something I've, I've thought so much about I used in, to, in recent yeah. years. Um, and I've kind of, again, got, gotten to this point where I, I, I've just, in order to not go insane, I've had to just say like, it doesn't matter almost. Like sure. you just can't sure. think about it that yeah, much. Yeah. But it, it this was kind of part of um, what was like so prevalent on my mind when we rebranded the channel to resident oh, Arc. right when i was sort of um really obsessed with this idea that stories are kind of like at the center of everything we do of the world uh, yeah the and, center and of the, the world. fact that you brought up like the news right like yeah, not yeah, to yeah. get like political or anything that's not really the point i want to bring you up but in the early 90s at least in the united states mm. most of the 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 large news broadcast uh there were four companies, channels right uh were bought by entertainment conglomerates, right? Mm, sure, um, that makes sense. And this is where you began to see the the, the start of um, uh, political personality opinion shows. Oh, I right? see. Right, where okay, it's all about okay. spinning a story. <clears throat> it's all about they're good at it. What is yeah. the st and and that's all they do. I mean, you see it all the time. Like, what's the story here? Yeah. It, it, even in sports news, right? Oh yes. Like, what's the most they compelling story? story? Yep, yep, like yep. when they're when yep. they're uh, when you're watching the 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 minutes leading up to Monday Night Football or something yes. like that, right? What are the they're stories? going to talk yeah. about players, coaches? If there's beef between them, they're yeah, going to yeah. talk about these playoff implications. They are trying to create a compelling narrative that yeah. build the stakes behind the event that's going right. to happen, and that is all the news is. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yes. It is a yeah. business. They are yeah. not in the business of telling you the truth. Right. They are in the business of creating the most compelling story they can, so that you watch the advertisements during the commercials, so that they can mm. get paid. That you know, that is it. <laughs> um, and so stories yeah. dominate every Everything. aspect of Everything. our lives. Yep. Even your your history books or or history. <clears throat> it's all just it's all stories. Family dinner conversation. Yes, that's true. Everything. Yeah. Now, I would argue it happened even before earlier. the 90s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even, what's his name? Pulitzer, the guy who the sure. Pulitzer Prize is named after? Yeah. He's the reason why we have the concept of yellow journalism, which is sure. basically journalism to get America into the Spanish-American War of yeah. all wars. Uh, actually, yeah. as, it, as it turns out, that the Havana Harbor attack, that uh, Pulitzer, he was the one who pushed it. He was like, hey, this was Spain attacked us. Spain did this, and it ended up being completely false. And But, well, we fought the whole war. And mm. at the end of the war, it was determined that, oh, the journalists just kind of made that up. Oh, oh, cool. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> yeah. uh, so <laughs> it happened to be in the government's interest, and so then you've got a whole other thing. But, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the idea. We're inundated by stories all the time everywhere. You can't, you can't get around it. Um, and the foundation of the world is stories. So, did you have something to add there, David? No, it's um, the the thing is that um, when you brought up the um, the Spanish American War, yeah, it's just that uh, yeah, it, it was pretty wild. The thing is that are you guys um, taught about that about yellow journalism and the the oh, way yeah. that oh Pulitzer God, yes, yes, basically yes, faked yes, yeah. the I whole mean, yeah yeah. I mean uh, yeah, there's a lot of um, yellow. Uh, well, we have yellow press and we have what we call pink press which is about oh, you know about a... the, fam the rich and famous <laughs> but oh, oh yeah. Yeah, okay yeah, yeah. the puff pieces and the <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. and um yeah the thing is that uh, there's a, a, a big contrast with uh, america in and spain in, the, in that regard about telling stories the thing is that uh, spain um sometimes uh, at least historically tried to go to the radical opposite of that trying to be as objective as possible 
Not all, and but sometimes to their detriment. Sometimes yeah, so sure. I would argue for yeah. sure to their detriment, yes. Because they're kidding themselves into thinking that their version of events is objective to begin with. Sure. That's yeah. their fault. Yeah. And then they go down saying it was objective. And it's like, dude, that was your own little narrative story. You don't even realize it, right? Because we try to yeah. pretend that we're past that. But it's like, no, we're cavemen. <laughs> 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 we aren't yeah. past sitting around a fire telling stories to each other. We yeah. aren't. Yeah, I think that uh, something that I that I like to say is that Spain is spectacularly bad at, uh, at uh, fighting off propaganda in general. Oh, we really? Can, we could argue. We actually we can argue that the Spanish Empire uh, lost two wars because of propaganda because they didn't know how to counter it, and one of them was, was <laughs> one was of them was the American War. Yeah. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. I would argue America was going to take Cuba, whether Spain, you know, whether no, that no, yeah. journal is, <laughs> whether that Literally, article was printed or not. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah. you know, it gave them a, a decent excuse to do what they wanted to do anyways. Yeah. <clears> okay. <throat> so, um, um, yeah, so what I love too is even, even Ophelia's mother is yeah. kind of in this vein because of, uh, oh, the mother tells Ophelia that she's too old to be reading fairy stories. But when she's in pain and when the baby hurts her, what does she ask Ophelia to do? Read a story. Can you please tell a story mm -hmm. for some, and the, the, the admission here is like, hey, we're an objective reality. We don't deal with stories. But for some weird reason, your stories work and are powerful. Yep. So keep doing it, but <laughs> I'm going to talk down to you and tell you that's not how the world works because right. it's not, as far as I know, but it kind of has some secret power. There's like a yeah. hidden power to the story right. and the fairy tale in particular that anyone can know, anyone can realize, right? Yeah. But that some people have a hard time because you can't quantify it. You can't figure out why it works, but it works. It's powerful, right? So yeah, yeah. anyways, that's where the whole story of the flower gets told. Um, so my next note here is on, uh, the captain, Me too. uh, he's working on his watch, his yeah, father's yeah. watch, right? This is, I think yep. this is where we see that it doesn't actually move. It's not um, actually the there time. Are two, I think they're two they're, separate watches. Yes. That, so I was confused about work, this. Yes. And there's, there's one, one that, that doesn't. Yes. <laughs> but he keeps the one that doesn't work on him at all times. Yeah. Right. It's a good luck charm. But then the one that does work is how he's constantly, he's you know, checking the, the time. time. Yes, right. He, I, he maybe he intends to times. smash that one on his death or something. Because he was going to hand it when he dies. He's going to yeah, hand it to, to the his, rebels, you right. know, yeah. saying, hey, make it this stop. But Yeah. So anyways, he's working on this watch. Um, uh, and and the, the, point, the note that I made here is his certainty that his child is going to be a boy, right? Yes. He, he <laughs> knows. <laughs> his line. <laughs> It's going to be his son, right? It's so good. Well, because yeah. the doctor asks him that specifically, yeah, like, how, I, I, how, how can you be so yeah, sure yeah. that it is a boy? And he's just like, <laughs> don't, 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 don't F with me, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> exactly. Don't, <laughs> well, like, it's almost like he's, his, he thinks his will is so strong. He, he lives in the fairy tale of believing he can make it real just it's by crazy. the power of his words or something. And, and the, the craziest thing is that in both Carmen's case, and in Vidal's case, they're both right. Yeah. Carmen is right that her daughter will die yeah. um, if she doesn't follow the rules. Yeah. And well, gosh, I don't know that she wouldn't have died uh, otherwise, but, but sure. my guess is that they, that Mercedes would not have killed Ophelia. Um, anyways, and then, um, and then Vidal's right that his son was a boy. Like, wow. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, these guys both are like, they're both right in their own like wrong way. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> But um, one of his lines there too, talking about the doctor, he says, um, a son should be born where the father is. Yes. Right? And yes. this this is just, it reveals his character so well. So it's like, I yeah, agree I, that a father and a son should be in the same place when the childbirth happens. Sure. But it probably should be the father that goes to the mother's home. Yes. Instead not of bringing the child her. to a war-torn exactly. mountainous area where you could possibly get shot or blown up, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. So this just shows you, he's like, okay, he's got right priorities. He, he's got the tradition, right? The tradition, the conservative position is that the father should be present when the son is born. But he screwed it up into his yeah. own personal selfish way, which is, oh, oh, so I'm going to take this tradition and like impose it and like force it to come to me, you know, yes. because, because I'm the head honcho, yes, right? That's so the it's key. like, he takes the tradition, which is fine in and of itself, and he turns it into this like evil thing, you know? It's not the father should be present for the birth of the child. It's exactly. The child should be born where I am. Yes. He should come to me. Yeah. It's freaking crazy. Yeah, um, I got I gotta Go say ahead. that uh, I mean, uh, I remember that line specifically because of the um, the tone that uh, the the actor uh, Sergi Lopez uh, uses. I mean, it, it triggers so many flashbacks for me oh, <laughs> from, really? from, from my childhood because that yeah that tone of authority mm. it, it feels yeah it's very 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 Spanish. <laughs> I oh mean, really? Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah, really? Yeah. 
I mean, it's a little bit, uh, uh, maybe a little bit uh, harder than, than usual, but it goes in that, in that direction. It was like hearing that line, uh, that voice sound, it was, oh my God, I'm nine years old again. Wow. Oh, wow. That's, That's crazy. Great. That's great. Wow. Yeah, we wouldn't have picked up on that. I, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next scene is uh, one of his subordinates come out. They, they think that they've captured uh, some possible yeah. rebels, right? These are just brutal. hunters. Now, yeah. this is the most brutal scene in the movie, it the is. most violent by the far. most extreme and I think necessary really to sort of build a, sort of a complete picture here of, of Vidal's character. Um, so essentially what really happened were these were just two guys out hunting for rabbits for their family yes. to eat. <laughs> that was what was really going on. Now these, these, uh, these military guys are paranoid about everyone they encounter in the mountains because there's rebels out there that they're supposed to be you know, snuffing out. Yes. So they're assuming that they could be that. So they're having him come down to check and yeah. we want you to, you know, make a determination. What should we do with them? So he comes down and he's asking them questions. Uh, it seems to be even maybe even leading questions mm -hmm. and the son. So they have a father and son. The son is continuing to just interject and defend his father's honor. Like, no, my father is, is a, we're, we're just, yeah, yeah. you know, hunting rabbits. That's it. And, and the, I think it's like three times that Vidal tells him, like, stop talking. Like, like yeah. you know, I don't need to hear it from you. I'd like to hear it from him or whatever. Mm. Um, if, and, you know, like, if my father says we were hunting rabbits, that's what, we, what, that's what he was doing. And there's like, I think it's the third or fourth time that he finally gets fed up. And then just yeah. like basically takes the butt of, is it his gun or think, the bottle? It the seemed bottle. like a bottle. That was, the bottle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I heard something. Guillermo del Toro, apparently once he saw a fight occur where somebody got smashed over the head with a bottle, but the bottle didn't break and that yeah. guy got jacked. Right. And he was like, whoa, it's way worse when the bottle doesn't break. Yeah. And so he wanted to put that in this film, showing right. somebody get just, hit with a bottle where the bottle doesn't just shatter. And it just, it's, it's brutal. Yeah. It's, it's horrible. Yeah. And like, uh, this is a scene where, you know, I think a lot of people just can't, you can't even look at it. It's so just <laughs> gruesome and just the, the gore of it is so horrific yeah. as he just like basically caves this guy's face in his face uh, his with this bottle, just hitting him over and over and over and over and over and over again. And, uh, you know, then they execute the father as well. And uh, then they find the rabbits in the packs. And his yeah. response to this is not, it's, like, it's not, he doesn't oh, feel bad, I yeah. made a mistake. How right. could I have done that? Or, Right. get angry at them for not, he just well, like he was like you guys made a mistake yeah well why i think his his line is like check these assholes before, before. you come bothering yeah. me yes exactly yeah. not because we killed an innocent person right. or anything it's just like yeah. don't bother me when you could have figured out all yeah. along that these guys were who they said they were right he has no no remorse no yeah. remorse whatsoever yeah. for what he did and yeah, yeah it's it's unbelievable so, well, I, um, I want to find out something here about this scene. I mean, this is one of the scenes that maybe uh, Guillermo del Toro goes a little bit outside of the reality. <laughs> because sure. No, no, no. I mean, the thing is that a, a scene like this, you know, like finding uh, like uh, alleged uh, rebels in, in the forest and just kill them on, on the spot. Maybe maybe that's something that will happen during the war, but not after the, the, the war. Oh, because sure. At that oh, point, I, see. I mean, yeah, because I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, the repression was still brutal. But at that point in time, the repression was much more uh, bureaucratic, you know. Oh, I mean, okay. um, most likely, most likely they they will have. I mean, they will have been arrested and sent to jail. Uh, but let's say that if this scene happened in the real world, then Vidal had had to uh, give a lot of explanations. <laughs> sure, oh, okay, I mean, like okay. stand uh, on tribunal or. Uh, whatever yeah, it would yeah. have been, right? Because it's not but. just it's not just that. Oh, he killed somebody. He shouldn't have done that. It's like they're they're in a town. We see multiple times right. the bread lines, and yeah. like there are people here who are putting up with this military business in their little village, sure. right? You don't want them to turn against the military, right? Yeah. And that's why even a captain would would not be able to get away with something like this. Yeah, it's like don't sure. make the yeah, people yeah. in the village that we rely on to for support hate us. Yeah. Um, the yeah, only other note I, mean, I had I, uh, in the scene. Oh, go ahead, David. Nice. Um, I mean, I, I don't, uh, I don't regret the the film from from doing this because I mean, the point of this right. scene is not to, to tell how things were back then. It's to show Vidal's character. So sure. exactly. it's not yeah, a big deal. Point. Which it yeah. does brilliantly. Um, 
But the only the only other note I took here was that he he takes out like some kind of I don't know if it's an almanac or some kind of paper or, or document from the bag that said no country or no god no country no master which he would have viewed as like propag- rebel propaganda probably oh, which is okay. why they were suspicious right. in the first place and they were, um, they were saying oh this is just an old map like it's not it's not representative of like who we are which we just use this to navigate or something like right, that right okay right. so that was um, why they were so suspicious so right and then they found the rabbits uh, afterwards and found yeah. out yeah these guys were nobody um, we only made it through roughly 20 minutes of the movie in our first yep. episode of this analysis. So we're However, going to try to move a little faster. This uh, yes, time. <laughs> I think we will. We made it through only 20 minutes of the film, but halfway through my prepared notes. So yeah, I think it was a good yeah. stop from as far as notes go. It's a good yeah, balance. yeah. I think that it shouldn't be a problem uh, to get through the rest of the film today, but we're going to try to do that. So uh, hopefully uh, you guys are ready for that. Um, yeah. We left off, but I know you have another note before yes, we get into yes. this, but we left off right when Ophelia was going to follow the fairy into yeah. the fawn's uh, labyrinth. And my note is just about that. As the fairy is leading us, as our leading Ophelia, as the fairy turns into, as the bug turns into a fairy to begin with, um, we, we see that technique that I mentioned before of things that are really close to the camera being darker mm, right yeah. and as the fairy kind of moves around and close to the camera and especially as the fairy as the bug turns into a fairy right then and there you just get this darkness that kind of helps the cg to, mm. to look more real i think um and it really helped them to kind of uh, blend the world so i just wanted to mention that um the john alton strategy is like super useful here and it's really good yeah uh anything else the moon was at one quarter it was a quarter moon uh so this whole thing needs to be done within the cycle of a moon, right? Oh, because yeah, she got the lunar tattoo yes. or birthmark. Yeah. And I, I'll mention that as well. But yes, um, it's a quarter moon, but also, yeah, so it's going to go. This whole thing needs to be done within one month, I think. But it's, it's a specific reference to the moon. Right. And then, uh, yeah, the labyrinth. Okay. So um, there's kind of a lot, I think, to talk about in this, this scene where – uh, the yeah. fawn introduces himself. He calls her Princess Moana. Moana. Says, yeah. you are not born of man. It was the moon that bore you. Mm. Did you find anything significant in that symbolism? Why is uh, it uh, the moon? moon? Yes. Well, first off, now we're going to jump ahead a little bit, but the mark on her left shoulder. Yeah. Not the right. The left. Not the right. The left <laughs> is of a quarter moon. Uh, so the moon is a symbol of the feminine, right? So- she must pass these three tests before the moon becomes full, right? Right. Um, you could think of it in terms of a new moon. Well, a new moon being like a birth, and then there's like the 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 waxing and then the waning, right? right? We're already at a quarter, then a half, then the gibbous, and then the full, right? So there's the the four parts, right? So she's she's been she's been birthed. We're not at the new moon. We're starting at the quarter moon. So she's already a few days in. Mm. And so this whole thing needs to be done before that point. Now, I do have to bring up, I see Ophelia at her age, and a moon can, a moon represents the feminine for a lot of reasons. One of them being the, the period cycle, right? Sure. And that tends to be, uh, it tends to, how would you track along with the moon because Mm. it's 28 days and it just, I, that there seems to be a connection there. Right. Um, and I want to say that the symbol of, of her becoming a woman is something along the lines of that, of her entry into womanhood. The trouble is I heard that the original script, this girl was supposed to be like eight years old. Right. (laughs) Uh, isn't that what you mentioned? So, so yeah. that could call my interpretation here into question. Um, but given what we see from the film, at, maybe it wasn't intended, but what we're getting from the symbolism of the film and her connection to the moon is her entry into womanhood. Yeah. Um, and that's where I would connect it there. And the, the moon is a symbol of the feminine for lots of reasons. Uh, but that would be one of them. And I think in that sense that she being a daughter of the moon, it also identifies her more with her mother than with her father. Mm. It's not that she's the daughter of the king. It's that she's the daughter of a queen. And that's uh, the moon, yeah. right? And then now she is the daughter of a king, but they're specifically identifying her with the moon here. Uh, and given that she is the daughter of a single mother, like that's that's kind of where her heart is at. Like mm. she really wants a mother. She doesn't know if she needs a father, right. but she knows she needs a mother. Right. And that's like where her heart is. So she sees herself as being uh, the a daughter of the feminine as opposed to a daughter of the masculine for the time being. Right. 
You know, that's funny because I had not seen this movie in a, a, quite a long time before yeah. we watched it for the podcast here. So there were certain details I had forgotten and or were wasn't like super clear on. And I had sort of a similar feeling um, that this was a representation of her movement into womanhood. Yes. And it was because of that clear. that I expected when she opens the book and sees the... Oh, to be I, I thought it was going to be like oh, her period starting or something. That's interesting. That's interesting. But it was like, oh, that's not how that goes. That's right. It's her mother and her mother starts, you know, freaking out. Um, but anyways, I, it was it was just something I was expecting to happen next and well, go like, why did I expect that? I've seen this movie before. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's fascinating. But I do have to mention that come the full, when the cycle is completed at the full moon, there is there is blood. Oh, her. sure. It yeah, is, right. it, and it is her entry into the next right. phase of life. Yeah. But it's, it's uh, well, it's different in the movie than what I just said. Yeah. All right. So um, it was not, you're not born of man, it was the moon that bore you. Yes. Um, and basically he tells her that he has to make sure that her essence is intact and that she hasn't become a mortal, right? Ah, uh, yes, um, yes. That's why she has to complete three tasks is to prove this. So, um and, and the way that I read that was more that she hasn't become a mortal in like mindset rather than like in her morality and in her mindset less than mm. like in body. Cause obviously she's okay. mortal. Like she can die. She can be killed. She's killed at the end of the movie. Yeah. So when he says we have to make sure you're yes. not mortal, I think he's trying to say that you have a higher sense of morality than the moral, the mortals do. Hmm. Right. And that kind of boils yeah. all down into what I was sort of leading into last time is when is it moral or necessary to disobey, to not do what you're told to do. Right. This is something that mortals struggle with. So I think the tests are there in right. order to make sure that she's not like them and she's not just going to do what is, seems... is told uh, well, just because she's it. told. Yes. Right? And that, that would go along with the theme here. Yeah. Yes, Absolutely. So, I also have a little bit. Oh, c you oh. can continue this. Well, uh, since we mentioned Moana, let me just go ahead and okay, go ahead. Uh, expound yeah. a little bit on this. Um, Moana, the name Moana is of Greek origin, and it means ocean, actually, mm. which is yeah, of course, right because it's uh, a yeah. along with the moon, right. right? You got the title, the title cycle, along with the placement of the moon in the sky, and, right? Yeah. Like there's a lot of relevance uh, between the ocean and the moon, both of them being feminine as well, um, and. The word Moana, also from the Greek, it likely comes from the same word, which actually means single or alone as well, right. which is interesting. Um, so the water, I don't know. It's a very feminine, it's a very feminine name. Let's mm -hmm. we'll put it that way. Yeah. Um, okay. So he gives her a book called The Book of the Crossroads, which I thought was really interesting that it's called that. I mean, there's nothing from the book itself that would suggest the name Crossroads other than she's going to have to make choices. Yes, that's the point. It's the in, book of choices. Yeah, yeah. The choices you in these trials that. she's going to face. Absolutely. And that choice is going to be related to, are you going to do as you were instructed to do or not? Yeah. Um, are you going to obey authority or follow your own instinct, right. your, uh, your own sense of morality about what's right and wrong to do? Um, and so that's yeah. why I think why it, it, they chose that name, Book of the Crossroads. You um, can choose the right side or you can choose the left right. path. Right. right. And she favors the left right. often. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this, the circle symbol that's in the center. There's like a, what do you call it? Sort of a pillar in the middle. Yes. That the totem has, kind of, yeah. Yeah. It has um, the fawn and then Ophelia and a little baby on it. Yeah. But then there are six circles going around the outside. I think it's more or less just to, meant to kind of represent the labyrinth itself, right? Mm -hmm. But I think later on in the movie, I, I was really disappointed by this. He said something <laughs> about um, the seven gardens. Did I take this note down? I really hope I did. Uh, he says something about the, the seven gardens of, I might have to look for this later. Because this is going to drive me crazy if I didn't take mm. this down. But anyways, the reason I was disappointed was because there was only six circles. I was I was I was sure it was going to be seven circles in that symbol <laughs> to represent the the seven gardens of her uh, home paradise or whatever. Ah, uh, that that's keeps. interesting. But 
Well, I did, it, it doesn't have that. It's just I think it's just supposed to be the labyrinth in there at the center of it. Ah, I see. Okay, but is the labyrinth at the center of six circles? Six circles going around, and then the labyrinth being like. I, I wish I remembered the because all I wrote down. We were just talking about this before <laughs> we came over. All I wrote down was circle symbol. That was my note <laughs> to talk about it. <laughs> and so, like, oh, I great. I can't. I didn't take down the the exact line, but I remember the fawn saying something about. I'm well. I'll, maybe I'll have to cut this in or something yeah, to yeah. find it. But he says something like that. Um, okay. Anyway, it didn't relate in the way that I was expecting that it would. Interesting. But, uh, Okay, you got anything so far, David? Or are we good to move on to the next yeah, thing here? Well, um, well, there are a couple of things. Uh, um, the first thing about the the, the, book, the book of cross, Crossroads in Spanish is called uh, Libro de las Encrucijadas. Encrucijada, yeah, it can mm -hmm. be translated as crossroad, but it also has um, another meaning attached to it, which is also like a moral. Uh, it can be also a moral dilemma, like a very mm. tough choice. Yeah, uh, where, where there's no where there's no uh, easy answer. So yeah, mm -hmm. that adds a little bit uh, to that to that um, uh, uh, to that symbolism. The other one, it's something that I saw in um, in a documentary, a, a making of documentary. Apparently, the fawn throughout the film ages backwards. Oh, he gets younger. Yes, he does. He looks cleaner. That's true. Yes. Yeah, in this first scene, uh, you uh, you can see that. Um, yeah, first of all, he seems to be blind. Uh, his movements are very Yankee, very um, uh, very clumsy. But yes, the film true. goes on, he becomes more more graceful. That oh, is I, totally I didn't, correct. I mean, I I now that you say that, yeah, yeah, like mm. that is true. I wonder why. Like, I wonder what the reason is for that. Well, as I mentioned before, Vidal has this obsession with time, but yeah. he can't do anything about it. Yeah. Um, yet Ophelia is encountering these creatures who ha have that type of power. Mm. Also, at the very beginning of the film, we see time moving backwards, right? right. Uh, time, time for Ophelia does seem to be, I don't know, she or her experience does seem to have some control over time whereas vidal's is 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 not able to do that and that's all that's all i got hmm. yeah it's um yeah, yeah you can see i mean doug young's uh, apparently was very specific about that about how he yeah. had to adapt his movements you can also hear it in in pablo adam's voice uh, as well that uh, oh, yeah. he, his voice is a little gruffier I'll leave it it yeah. really was at the beginning. That's true. When you first meet the fawn, it's like pretty scary. It's yeah, like he's, really, he's pretty jacked. <laughs> like really unsettling. Uh, yeah. Whereas by the end, he's certainly, certainly uh, not as scary of a figure, I think. Yeah. 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 And uh, well, um, something that I uh, failed to mention last time when I was talking about Pablo Adán's uh, perform vocal performance. Yeah. Was, um, well, the thing is that uh, Doc Jones, obviously, he had to speak in, in, uh, on set, so Ivan yes. Ivana Vaquero could react to something. His and, mouth had um, to move. <laughs> exactly. And obviously, he, he had to re um, remember his lines uh, phonetically. Oh, right. Yeah. So yeah. he had to memorize he them speak like that. Spanish, yeah, yeah. No, nothing. No, actually, but uh, no, he, he did a very uh, good job. If he if you watch the. Um, the um, Make it up documentaries. Uh, you you can hear him uh, speaking with his own voice in Spanish, obviously with a very thick accent. Yeah, but it was good enough that Pablo Adan has said that um, Doug Jones made his uh, his job much easier because uh, he was vocalizing so well that he had no problem at all to match uh, his uh, his lip movements. So oh good wow good that's, that's awesome cool. that's cool that's super awesome. Yeah. Okay, my next note here is Ophelia's mother. Uh, thinking that dresses and shoes are much better than reading. Uh, I think we already talked about that last time. Yeah, but this we did is, a little bit. She gets the dress the next day. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, she's supposed to keep clean and be back that night for a, a dinner that they're going to have, that the, the that oh, um, right. Vidal's going to have, right? Yes. Um, I also made this note about Mercedes hiding a knife under her belt on her dress. Mm -hmm. um, for sure. It, it, yeah, there, there, there's, there's interesting parallels going on between again Mercedes and Ophelia, mm -hmm. in, in that Mercedes sort of represents the symbol of femininity that Ophelia ends up following, rather than her yes. own mother's, right? Yes, yes, so absolutely. So the, yeah. the, re, the rewards, the <laughs> it's not a reward, it's not a video game. The what she gets from each trial, right? The first one is a key. The second one is a dagger. A dagger, yeah. And Mercedes is the 
keeper of the key to yes. the like the mill house. Yes. And also holds a dagger underneath yes, under her dress, or a knife. Good, but yeah. so yeah. I think that that's kind of paralleling the fact that Ophelia follows that path, right? Of femininity and morality of disobedience, mm -hmm. rather than Carmen's femininity and obedience. Yes, yes. And anyways, I think it's all sort of wrapped up in that. They're they're paralleling their stories in a really nice way there. Um. So Merthetis also tells uh, tells Ophelia that because she she I think Ophelia tries to tell her like I met a fawn in the labyrinth and blah 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 <laughs> <laughs> and Merthetis says that her mother oh, that's Merthetis's mother warned her her grandmother, grandmother. Or, or it was Merthetis's grandmother warned yep. her to beware of fawns right like mm, so again yeah. that person Merthetis who represents the disobedience to yeah. uh, oppressive authority, masculine authority, in particular Vidal, tells her beware of fawns. And the mm. fawn is the one giving her all of the instructions right. of what to do in the trials. So it's, again, I think it's all kind of like coming <laughs> together good, there, that's right? That's really good, yeah, yeah, that's good. I think um, she, uh, Ophelia also asks Mercedes if she um, believes in cuentos de hadas, right? The oh, yeah. Fairy tales. Fairy, yep. fairy tales, and, yeah. And, um, Mercedes, uh, Mercedes, she says she does not believe in fairies, but she did when she was a child, mm. right? So Mercedes, in that sense, is like a grown-up version of Ophelia. That's what yep. I get here. It's like it's almost like Mercedes can be a a future. It's like we're seeing into the Ophelia's future yep. here when we look at Mercedes, and she's talking about how she did used to believe in in these kinds of things, but you know now that she's grown out of it, it's the harsh realities of the world have kind of beaten that out of her. Right. Um, I would guess that Carmen probably also read fairy tales when she was younger. But. Right. So I think this is where we're going to get a lot of good information from David here. Uh, we've moved into the scene where they're rationing supplies and uh, food yeah. and oh, yeah. people are lining up for this. So Merthetis, all I'm going to say about this scene is that Merthetis is the one with the key. If there's mm. only one, she tells Vidal there's only one key. She does. And uh, the captain, or Vidal, takes it. So he, as That's far right. as he knows... He's the only one who has a key to yes. get into this place where all the rations are being kept now. Well, this is important too for Ophelia's first task. Yes. Because as soon as Mer Mercedes loses <laughs> the key, she loses it. She doesn't yeah. no, no longer have that key. She needs to get it back. Mm -hmm. And then we see Ophelia going through all these troubles to get a key back or right. to get a key. Right. So it's very similar to Mercedes struggles as well, right there. Right. So, uh, right. David was telling us last time that he had a lot of good historical context surrounding this, uh, this ration line and everything like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not only that, but also the, um, the, the dining scene that comes right after that. But yeah, uh, during the post-war period, uh, obviously the country was in shambles. Um, mm. Many, uh, many areas around the country didn't have access to a lot of food. Oh, and sure. um, the, the, both the agriculture infra infrastructure was also uh, pretty much destroyed. So they, they were building, building back it up. And yeah, that meant that they had to rationalize a, a lot of uh, food supplies in many, especially right. in small towns. Mm. But um, so yeah, that's a very uh, accurate the, the depiction of how it was with people uh, forming lines uh, and having to give the, uh, give their names to make sure that everyone got one right uh, the the ration that was due to them. Mm. But also, um, I think. But the the thing that was um, more. I mean, here's when uh, Guillermo del Toro starts to show his um, criticism to the Catholic Church. The thing is that oh, you cannot uh, you can you cannot understand um, Spain as a whole without the Catholic Church because okay. uh, during most of the Spanish Empire uh, there there are historians who argue that the real rulers of, of the Spanish Empire were not the kings it it, it, it was it, it, it was the Vatican so okay. right yeah yeah and um, the thing is that um, when when the, uh, Franco San, Sanjurjo and, and the other generals who uh, rebelled against the the Republican government uh, took arms, the church uh, sided with them pretty much immediately, because as far as they were con as as far as the Catholic Church was concerned, that was more than a war. It was a a, a religious crusade. Mm. 
hmm. because um, the thing is that the the republic the republican um, uh, government was trying to secularize the country, and uh, obviously uh, in um, a, a country that was uh, up to that point pretty much. Uh, um, I think in English it's called the, uh, the, theocracy. You know theocracy. that. Uh, that yeah. Theocracy. Yeah. theocracy. Yeah, yeah. A theocracy. So obviously the the church was not very happy about losing their privileges, of but also they couldn't fight directly. So um, um, basically they sacralized the the the, the fight for for the national the national nationalist side uh, as uh, as if they were like the almost the, the warriors from from God trying to mm. uh, put the, the church back in uh, in charge. So that's yeah. why they um, they they had a very privileged uh, position um, during Franco's regime because of that. And yeah, uh, Kason, you you mentioned last week that um, Franco himself wasn't a fascist in the same way that uh, right. Fra uh, Hitler or even Mussolini were. He yeah, was exactly. more like a, a very ultra religious man who wanted the, right. the church to be back on on, on charge. Yeah, he wanted to restore so yeah, that, the church, and and he ultimately restored the monarchy, and that was his. Yeah. That was he. He was very much a traditionalist for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's the big. Yeah, um, but also Franco was more in it for, for for himself. Something that one of the main things that I wanted to say at, at some point, maybe some uh, especially in 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 the U.S., but also in in many countries and even some Spaniards. They like to think uh, about Franco as uh, some kind of Iberian version of Hitler or, or Mussolini, but he really I, I wasn't. I don't see that. No, he wasn't at yeah. all. Yeah. yeah. If you want, if you want yeah. a dictator to compare him to, ironically enough, uh, the, the best comparison will be Vladimir Putin right now. Oh, oh wow. sure. You know what? Yeah, there's, yeah. Something, there's something there. There's because, something there. because he was more trying to create... Um, I called around him uh, around himself. He was, uh, I mean, the only the only uh, ideology that he was following was his own, which okay. obviously uh, it, it was about church tradition and uh, keeping uh, things the way the the, the way they were. And uh, he was against the, the republic because they were trying to modernize the country more than anything. Mm. So yeah, and um, okay. Yeah, then um, Guillermo del Toro is um, a Catholic man himself, so obviously he's, uh, he seems to be pretty troubled when it comes to the the role that uh, the church had, had in, in the war. And you can see that uh, this isn't the entire scene where uh, they are talking about how they are rationalizing the food for, for, the, for, the, um, for the people while they are having like a very luxurious meal themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's, like, that's right. Oh. That's yeah. a good contrast. That's good uh, juxtaposition. Yeah. There. Well, yeah, and then there's the there's the priest that's there, and he he yeah. says something about you know, he says something along the lines of what what you're saying, David, about how uh, what they're doing, uh, Franco's regime is is you know God's will or something like that, right? Doesn't exactly, doesn't yeah. that priest say something like that at the table? I'll, I'll put yeah, it on the said, screen when I edit this. Yeah. Um. Uh, well, well, like um. I, ha I will have to make my own translation because I didn't. Uh, I, oh, I watch didn't it in get the, oh, the, Spanish, the, the, the English subtitles. But he said uh, he says um, uh, those people uh, talking about the rebels. Th those people's uh, uh, souls have have already been saved by God. Whatever happens mm. to their bodies, the Lord doesn't care. Yeah, that's right. Mm. That's right. I remember that line and uh, that sticking out to me as the church being involved, kind of in this. Uh, yeah. In in the in the Franco. Regime. Well, they have a seat at the table in a literal sense. Yes, here. right, in yeah, an yeah. authoritarian regime there. So, yeah. um, cool. Right. So we're gonna get to we're gonna come back to that uh, dinner scene here in just a minute. Good. Let's let's talk about um, Ophelia's first task. So, oh, it's great. She goes to the tree. It's actually the one you can see behind this us tree, here. Yeah. It's that tree right there. And um, I believe that uh, Del Toro said this in the. Uh, director's commentary if mm -hmm. you like have the DVD of the movie he says that they purposefully designed that tree to look like a vaginal opening yes um, yeah that that's like a very purposeful thing it's like she's going into a womb here yes. that is poison yep, yep, yep. which again mm -hmm. as we were saying last time as is her mother right? representing her mother exactly. being poisoned by Vidal yes so and it's not just the entrance there um, the sh you you the te the name of the shape is Mendorla but anyways, okay. <laughs> um, it's uh, 
it's fallopian tubes as well. If you look up on the side here, you'll see that it kind of um, oh, goes yeah. out in both right. sides. Right, b- b- out. Yes, yep. so mm-hmm. it's a womb, and it, it definitely, definitely, definitely elicits that kind of imagery. Right. Um, so she goes inside, and there's a toad, like a disgusting toad <laughs> yeah. inside that's just like poisoning the tree, right? Yeah. Um, and what she's supposed to do is is make this toad eat the stone that was given to her, the stones that were given to her by the fawn. Yes. Um, and so there's all these little bugs. I'm not sure what the insect is called. It just looks like little, just roly polies. Yeah, like Except pill bugs or something. really big. Yeah. yeah <laughs> 10 times the size. And so she ends up tricking it into eating them by- A louse. That's what it, a louse. A louse. Roly poly. I don't know who calls. <laughs> <laughs> I call it roly polies. <laughs> I do too, but I don't know if everyone does. Um, anyway, she she puts it in her hand, the, the bug on yeah. top of the stones and then- it, it, you know, takes it and swallows it. And, um, it's sort of like, it's, it's kind of hard for me to like parse how it dies. It's like, it's it like it, oh it's, it's like it it's, sheds its skin. It's crazy. Yeah. By, by like vomiting its insides, all of its insides. Everything. Out. Yeah. <laughs> it's like pretty gross. <laughs> it was really um, gross. <laughs> and it's just filled with all these bugs it's been eating and it's just massive flesh and nasty stuff and she has to reach in there grab the key but the important part here was that she was told by her mother earlier you know with this dress and the new shoes and everything like that Mm -hmm. you know like don't get into trouble yeah so she puts her dress up on a branch yeah she tried she tried a little bit she did try to not become to not you know make the dress filthy right but I mean, if she were really following what she was told to do, she wouldn't have gone and done this at all, no, not, <laughs> crawling through the mud. But this was more yeah. important. Oh, sure. Yeah. In, instinctually, she yes. knew the right thing to do here was not to follow what she was told to do yeah. and stay pretty and, you know, uh, be able to please Vidal later on and be the picture perfect little stepdaughter or whatever. Mm. Uh, it was more important that she go through with this yeah. trial. And so this is the first act of disobedience. Yes. In which she uh, is doing these trials. You know what's crazy? It, it, we're we're mixing um, Mercedes and Carmen into one in this instance. It's great yeah. because she has to find the key, which is what Mercedes needs, yeah. so that the, she can help her people. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, we have to uh, kill the, her baby brother. <laughs> basically, Mm -hmm. which is a thing that will come up again later. Um, But they're kind of mixed into one. So Mercedes is looking for a key that is kept in a monster's keeping, basically. Mm -hmm. But then also Carmen is the tree that's being killed by this monster that's inside of her. Right. Um, I love that we have an abstraction of those two ideas put into a fairy tale that mixes Mercedes and uh, Carmen into their stories into one thing that a child can then go do something about it. Right. Like it's really creative. It's really well done. Yeah. Um, but the frog representing her baby brother, this is fascinating. Um, it's a monster who does nothing but consume. That is, yep. I don't know if the word monster is right, but babies do nothing but consume. They suck and they eat. <clears throat> uh, if we're going to use our uh, Bioshock terminology, it's parasite. <laughs> parasite, they're looters. They loot, they loot the mom. Okay, so to the detriment of the mother, but to the benefit of the child. This is amazing symbolism because in the end, she needs to decide whether or not to kill her brother. There is a microcosm here as well, which I absolutely love. So the frog is big and fat. It's killing its own environment by eating all the bugs. It's praying. It's the big preying on the small. It's the, mm-hmm. the strong preying on the weak, right? Yep. So how does Ophelia get it to self-destruct? And this is where this this was likely unintentional from Guillermo del Toro. Left hand. But I, well, yes, it it, left, first off, it's with the, the left, left hand. hand. Yes. Yeah. But the unintentional part is, and I, anyways... She offers it poison mixed with one tiny bug. Eating all the bugs is bad, right? Rene Girard, who is the, what would you call him, the scapegoat theorist guy, he is great. He's, he's done a lot of good work. But this is great because if she uses one small bug as a sacrifice, it puts an end to the whole regime of the large uh, toad eating the small I bugs. See where you're going. Yep. So, so it's, it's a re. What would you call it? It's a reinstitution of the principle that allows the world to exist in the first place. Yeah. So, and it's like, okay, how do I get, how do I get this frog to stop eating all of the bugs? 
I can't do it without sacrificing one of one them. of them. She has to take one and allow one to be killed so that the rest can be saved. There, there now I don't even know if that that was totally intentional because sure. I think it actually kind of goes against a theme of the in movie. this book yeah. of like no, don't don't sacrifice. We can all live and everything will be okay. Well, obviously we can't all live, so maybe it's not a total <laughs> theme of the movie. Anyways, but I, I, it's something that I didn't catch until this most recent time um, watching it. Right, so. Um, without the sacrifice, it wouldn't have worked. So she had to participate in order to put an end to it. Uh, The principle of sacrifice works in this scene as it does in real life, which establishes something very important for the story going forward. At at the very least, whether Guillermo del Toro did this on purpose or not, um, it establishes the fact that a sacrificial system exists and that it works. (laughs) Right. And that, um, you know... There, there may be reasons not to do it, but the fact is that it would work were she to do it, right? So Ophelia has this idea that this is how things work. When it comes time for her to offer an, a bigger sacrifice, um, she then has this option to say no. Right. Uh, but earlier on, she does it without thinking, really. Mm. Yeah, I didn't make that connection at all. It's really interesting. I wonder if anyone made that connection, <laughs> but it's just a fact of the world. And yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know how else she would have gotten him to eat those rocks. Sure. Okay, so um, it's kind of. I'm trying to remember the exact order of things. I believe we see the dinner. Okay. After Before. this scene, because she comes out, the dress had been yes blown so, off. I love this too. So <laughs> she gets dirty, right? She is filthy doing yeah, this. Really filthy. Vidal would hate that. Yep. She is doing what Vidal would never do. Never yeah. in a million years. Okay, yeah. not in a million years. He definitely, he'd probably be okay to getting dirty if it was for the right cause. Sure. But he is not a, a dirty person, right? He is a clean person. Um, and also I have to bring up that she finds treasures in dark places. That's just... Um, it's another way that the world works. <laughs> yeah, right. We find a lot of secrets of the world um, that Guillermo del Toro is giving to us through um, this little fairy tale that Ophelia is participating in. So the fairy tale world and the events of the Spanish Civil War, as portrayed in the film, also mirror each other in a few different ways, especially the maid rebel lady. And that's where we talk about the key, right? Mm-hmm. So now I'm at the dinner scene. Okay. So I didn't really take many notes on this other than what's already been said by David. Okay. Um, but to keep think, in, there are a few more things, but okay, yeah, good. but just to keep in mind a parallel here with Vidal, the fireplace that's behind him, like the kind of the room itself Let's remember and the, the table yeah. with tons of like just luxurious, like, uh, yeah. basically just, um, way more food than they actually need. Right. It's right. like an extravagance, it's it's a luxury all this food that's there while they're hoarding that and and rationing tiny bits out to families who get like i don't know they said like a loaf of bread once a week or i can't remember exactly what they they said something about yes. bread earlier in the movie but um keep that in mind for trial 2 <laughs> the 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 setting in which the dinner is happening right um let's see you you said you had something more to add to that david yeah let's keep going on yeah, the dinner uh, the dinner scene yeah no, it's um well well, first, uh, one thing about, uh, about before that scene uh, when they yeah. are um, uh, delivering the rations, and well, I, well, I think that comes late. Well, anyway, I think that that scene where the the the, the town the townspeople are in line to get their rations, uh, one of the members of the Guardia Civil, uh, when yeah. when he takes one one of one of the uh, a loaf of bread and he says uh, this line that it's a. Uh, um, en la España, en España Nacional, una grande y libre, no hay una, eh, no hay, eh, no hay un, ah, no hay una casa sin lumbre y una, y una, eh, ni, un, ni una familia sin pan. So in, in, um, in national, national Spain, uh, one, um, uh, one big and, and great, uh, there's no, uh, sorry, I'm translating as I go. <laughs> it's all good. And uh, there's, yeah, there's, um, there's not um, a, a home without a light and there's no, no family without, without bread. That line was actually used by the, the Franco uh, pro- pro- propaganda uh, machine for years. Wow. Oh, okay, okay. There you go. Nice. Yeah. It's a, it's a very, it's a very good, um, it, it's a very good uh, representation of how Franco's propaganda machine worked back then. Yeah, it was uh, trying to uh, spread this uh, um, the, um, this idea that uh, Franco has essentially uh, liberated the, the country from uh, from the from the tyranny of of the republic that they were liars and well, obviously, 
I mean, it's true that the republic that the, the Republican side they weren't saints uh, uh, either. They made a trust. Uh, a trust. Oh shoot! I think we lost you there. And it's true that before the Civil War, there were a, a few it's problems that made a lot of people think that the country was falling apart. But uh, it's it was mostly like propaganda. <laughs> hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. So the idea there is, uh, no one will go without now that Franco is in yeah, power, exactly. right? But like uh, clearly. <laughs> trying to, I, I guess the, ter- the the way they're trying to turn the tables on the idea of rationing food, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> where it's yeah. like, oh, we we everybody has less now, or or is essentially having to make sacrifices, go hungry, uh, but no, under my watch, like everyone receives bread. It's just funny the way that they try to change the context behind what's actually happening. Yeah, that's uh, how yeah. North Korea, and then, North Korea does, and that. then you see. And then you see then how they have like these uh, copious meal themselves for the, for themselves with lamps yep, and yep. stuff like that. It was like, oh my god, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was pretty hypocr- hypocritical. Absolutely. And uh, well, going back to the to the to the dining scene, and I think that we can use this as a, as a, as a way to talk about uh, Vidal's backstory when uh, one of the um, one of the guests talks about how he met Vidal's uh, fa- uh, father in Morocco. Yes, thank you for bringing this up. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, well, most likely uh, the the battle where uh, Vidal's uh, uh, Vidal's father died is is supposed to be what it's uh, called in Spanish el desastre de de anual, the annual disaster. Uh It was a battle in in Morocco where um, the 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 Spanish uh, the the Spanish army 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 was uh, had a very uh, heavy loss uh, against uh, uh, Moroccan uh, rebels. Because uh, and that was a really big blow to the morale of of, uh, of Spain as a whole. Uh, I, men- I mentioned last last time that um, 1898 is usually the year where yeah. most historians say that say that the Spanish Empire was finished because they lost yeah. their, their, their most most of their uh, of their colonies. Yep. But uh, there are some people so, who say that that was the, the time when you can say that okay, the Spanish Empire is officially gone because um, some people say that it was a little bit like the Vietnam War for, for America, in the sense that it was uh, a war that most people in the country thought it was completely nonsense. Hmm. It was, what the hell are we doing here? And that heavy uh, heavy loss in Anual was um, um, like the, the big representation of, of it all. It was the moment where the morale of the of the country took a, no, a, a nosedive. Wow. Interesting. Well. Wow. And uh, um, most and most most of the people in the in the nationalist uh, side fought in that war, and was a big uh, reason why they were, they were much better organized and disciplined than the, than the Republicans the Republican side. That, that makes, makes a sense. lot of sense. That yeah, makes sense. Uh, I'm glad that you brought this up too because I think it's really a really interesting sort of moment for Vidal too because this man who's speaking about his father and how he died and was more or less talking about what an amazing soldier in general he was um vidal tells him it's nonsense that it's just a rumor that it, that like of course not that's crazy and you would think he mm-hmm. wouldn't say that because he keeps that watch and it's very important to him like the fact that his he's proud of who his father was he's trying to live up to that legacy he's trying to create a legacy just like it right for yeah. his own son so why why would he deny that right like why would he uh uh just kind of outright dismiss the notion that that's what happened. Well, I, I have a thought here. I don't know how many people know about him keeping his father's watch. That's um, it's a little superstitious. Right? Yeah, sure. It almost seems like Vidal internally, when he's alone, he believes in fairy tales. Yes, he he believes in you know things that are not objectively like like obvious, um, but he has an image that he has to keep with everybody else and yeah. it's no nonsense no if it, the story even seems a little out of place like no get rid of it yeah. no 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 fantasies no fairy tales we're we're objectively like in the real world um but the 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 truth the uh, you know the big pill for him to swallow is the fact that he doesn't actually believe that he really right. does believe in the fairy tales he just um has this face that says that he doesn't. I right. Don't know. That's, and I, that's, that's the, a similar thought to what I had. It's, yeah. it's, it's also that it shows vulnerability. It shows that he has yes, some kind of like attachment to his father 
yeah. and that that could be exploited by an mm, enemy, of right? Course, of course. So, like, you can't ever show that part of yourself. Yes. Yeah, Same yeah. with um, Carmen, who's sharing the story of how they met. Oh my gosh, and this was and great. she's she's being really sweet about it, and she's speaking very highly of him. She's putting him in a good light. Yes. Just like the other soldier put his father in good light, but he still wants nothing to do with that because it shows yeah. that he has a, a different side. That's true. A vulnerability and attachment yeah. to another person he and that could be exploited. And That's so good. he does, he wants no one to see that side of himself, which yeah. I thought was really really cool actually. Yeah, I thought that was good. And you know what's funny? It's not just it's not just his wife that he basically repudiates like right then and there at the yeah. table. It's also the other women. Right? Yes. Because it was a woman who asked Carmen. She yes. said, "Oh, how did you meet?" And then she says how they met. And he doesn't he says, forgive my wife. She thinks such stories are interesting. Yeah. But, and, and that, that wasn't just his wife. That was also to the other girls who asked that question. Yes. Don't ask stupid questions and don't answer stupid questions. Right. Yes. He, it's to all the women at the table. Yes. He was just like, this is boring. Let's talk about something well, else. Well, and then also she, she thinks that we would find, I think he says something like such feminine. He doesn't say feminine. I don't remember what the word is, but. Some kind no, of like in Spanish, in Spanish, in Spanish, he says it. Uh, estas tonterías. Tonterías. It's nonsense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. nonsense. Uh, interesting, right? Le that they would find this interesting, and that's that's how he views women in general. He doesn't give them the light of day. They're not interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this is why Mercedes is able to do everything she does right under his nose because he doesn't consider her. Like interesting capable or, or capable enough potentially yeah, yeah to be his enemy right she's just a woman yeah, yeah. and so That's it's that entire mindset that is his yeah. undoing essentially yes. yeah it's uh yeah the, the the two women that uh comment on on the on carmen's story uh okay just to give you an idea uh i i watched the movie the last time that i was uh, the movie was with my best friend uh, who i mean he's a really big uh, history buff and uh, basically he he helped me to research for, for the movie oh, good. good and when those two women came into the scene without them speaking any word any any word he he just he he just said whoa what a pair of fa uh, or or fachas fata is a slang word uh, spanish is slang for for fascist so oh <laughs> oh that's funny so, yeah. fascist fascist women <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, if you want to, uh, it's like, um, they are like the lead image of a, of a Spanish fascist woman, or at least a Francoist woman at the time. And the thing is that the way they, they, they say, oh, that story is very interesting. I mean, there's a little bit like a condensation, condensation in, in, in their voice. Mm, yeah. I don't yeah. know if you picked it up. So it's like, yeah, we don't buy it. I think that's what mm. they're trying to, to say. Oh, so even the women there found were, were being condescending to Carmen. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, I didn't. I didn't catch. Yeah, that. I didn't. I didn't pick up on that either. That's really interesting. <laughs> so, um, okay, again, I'm kind of losing a little bit of the. I think this is where Ophelia chronology comes back, here. and it's a big. So uh, Ophelia problem. comes back, Mercedes and she's. Finds her first. I think it's important, though. I'm trying to tie this in. Maybe it's not, but I think it is for something that comes up later. She's Carmen is obviously furious because she's pulled away and, and she goes yes. and she sees Ophelia's filthy and the dress is destroyed yeah, yeah, yeah. and that was her gift and, and everything like that. So she treated it with no respect. So she sends her to bed without supper. Right. So yes. she doesn't eat. Right. I, I think this is important for the next trial. I think so. But uh, she goes to bed without eating and she tells her how disappointed she is in her and all this stuff. Um, but we also have two different scenes with the fawn here. There's the one where he tells her, he gives her the chalk and tells her mm. about the second trial, but she doesn't do it right away because she goes and she opens the book and that's where she sees right. the bleeding uterus and her yeah. mother ends up, um, you know, of course, uh, almost dying. The doctor is called in, tells uh, Ophelia she needs to sleep in a different room. Um, like, like a really bad episode with, with the pregnancy going bad there. Um, so when the fawn comes back and says, D have you used the chalk yet? Ophelia says, no, my mother was sick or whatever. And she, he's like, that's not an excuse. Like he's mm -hmm. like really firm about it or whatever. And then, but then he offers her this, uh, mandrake root to use to try to help uh, her mother where right, he's got to, she's got to put it in the bowl of milk and, she and has give, to give it, it two blood. drops. Yeah. And it's supposed specifically two drops, which I thought was interesting because yeah. that's the same Those number of drops tests. that the doctor earlier said she needs to give the medicine to her mother every night. It's two mm. drops as well. So again, just Very another nice. way where the real world and the fantasy world are sort of paralleling yeah. or, or the same thing is happening in both. Now, um, I 
don't have any other notes up until when she actually uses the chalk and she goes oh, no, to the okay. second well, I can, uh, trial. So if anybody I else has anything to say before that. Well, um, yeah, uh, maybe this is a good opportunity to bring, up, uh, bring, uh, bring back up uh, something that we talked about last time, about that line in, in, uh, when uh, Ophelia says that her, mo- her mother is uh, sick from the baby. And, oh, <laughs> oh yes, sure, yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. let's hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the line in Spanish is uh, "está enferma del bebé." I mean, uh, in the end, it's, uh, I think it's Sick not of, supposed yeah. to, to be that 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 deep. Maybe uh, with the throat, you can never be too sure. But basically, it's a little bit of a spin on a Sp- on a, on a Spanish uh, idiomatic phrase to uh, say that someone is sick. The thing is that if you in in Spanish uh, "estar enfermo de" whatever, to be yeah, sick okay, from yeah, whatever. Yeah, Clark, yeah, yeah. yeah, and uh, basically, w- if you want to say that you are sick, but you don't know the name of the of the, of the the sickness, you say the part of your body that, is, that feels unwell. For example, if you have a heart ah. disease, you say, es enfermo del corazón. Corazón, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, he's a, a sick from, uh, from, from the heart. And uh, Ophelia... So in, it's probably it's not... It's a little it. bit of, of, okay. of, child, of child speak. Uh, basically, she's saying... Uh, it's a little spin of that. It, it, she's basically saying that she, she's uh, sick from the pregnancy. But instead of saying that, uh, that she said that she's sick, sick, uh, she's sick from the baby, using that yeah. little spin on, on that on that idiomatic phrase. So, yeah. Interesting. Okay, cool. I wonder if that's maybe more common for a, a kid to say. Yeah. Like that. But yeah. I, I, I still think that it, like, plays into the fact that oh, the sure. baby is a poisonous parasite <laughs> yeah. in a way okay. I mean, in, 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 in terms of the in terms you, of the trial right go ahead yeah. david i mean if you if you allow me i mean this is one part that maybe i disagree with you guys a little bit for two reasons well when it comes to when it comes to the to the scene itself uh you know it's a the the camera is pulling back the ophelia and mercedes voices are getting loud, louder so uh cinematic uh, cinematically speaking i don't think that uh, del toro is focusing too much on it but most importantly is that at the end of the day, the child is supposed to be completely innocent. Yes, that's that is the other so, part too. And and I yeah, agree. I, I think it's just Ophelia's perception. Yes, not necessarily. Not I, I don't think that. True. Uh, the yeah, like Ophelia before she meets the baby, right? She sees only her mother's suffering. Yeah. I think it's once the baby's born, she's got the baby in her arms, which I guess we'll mm-hmm. talk about when we get to that point that it's a little different. Now, she also reads the story to the brother. She calls him her, her hermano um, and yeah, things like yeah. that. But uh, I, I, I do think that there is a link between the toad and, and, and the womb in the being represented by the tree and her going in there. Um, well, there's also the fact that she's mm-hmm. taking the baby away from Vidal. Vidal's the real source of the poison, right? Like if the yeah. baby mm-hmm. had been raised by Vidal, like who knows? Like it could have become that toad or something like that. <laughs> oh uh, sure, right. But because well, in she some ways Vidal does represent the toad, at least for Mercedes, who needs the key from Vidal. Um, yeah. So in that sense, the toad can also represent Vidal. So yeah. it's and not an inconceivable to say that well, that's Vidal. That's the <laughs> part of Vidal that's inside of Carmen. Right. Yeah. yeah. Not that it's necessarily but representative the of, the of the baby. baby. Oh, yeah. Not that it's necessarily representative of the baby per yeah. se that the baby is I'm, I'm 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 actually not that i'm glad you brought this up because yeah. that's not like the point i'm trying to make with linking the toad to the baby <laughs> is that the baby is like evil or something <laughs> the okay. baby is innocent and that's clear by the end of the film more that either you look at it from ophelia's perception or you look at it from the fact that that the fact that uh vidal took ophelia ophelia's mother carmen it, it, it has resulted in this, mm-hmm. right? Or yeah, that, that the baby, when it is in the influence of Vidal, there is a potential for it to become as poisonous as he is. But in her disobedience, again, by the end of the film, taking the baby away, like, sh- saves him for that fate. Anyway. Okay. With symbolism, it's, there, <laughs> you know, it's, it's never, like, so specific or on the nose that you can really pin things. There's lots of different ways to kind of look at it, but yeah, that's true. Uh, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I do want to clarify. I, I am in no way trying to say that the baby is okay. the toad <laughs> because it's enough, evil inherently somehow. So I've got that um, um, Vidal. Vidal doesn't really like Carmen all that much. Um, yeah. She only married him for security. Yeah. Uh, but there's that line a little bit later on at night 
um, where she said that Ophelia would understand when she was older. Yes. And that's one thing I put down here as well. Um, and then, of course, there is the line from Vidal that he only wants the boy saved, not the woman. He says, if right. you have to choose between the two, save right. the boy. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. So she becomes, Carmen becomes just a means for him to pass on his legacy. That's that's all she's there for. Yeah. yeah. And then um, also, it, it's also revealed, and Ophelia, I mean, she's pretty sharp. So she catches on that uh, Mercedes is helping the men in the woods. And yes. she brings it up to her. And yeah, Mercedes she, is like, yeah. did you tell anyone? Right. <laughs> and Ophelia is like, no, I know. I, I get what's going on here. Like, Ophelia isn't so in fantasy land that she doesn't understand her situation. Yeah, right. She's a smart girl. She knows what's going on around her. Um, and she, in some ways, can kind of separate the fantasy world from from what she feel like is happening feels like is happening to the adults around her. Yeah. Um, and this is where um, Mercedes hums the lullaby. The lullaby, right. Which right. It, I totally forgot that it was Mercedes who does that, not Carmen. Yep. And that was so, I don't know, that was so interesting. It's almost like um, we see this connection with Ophelia because at the very beginning, remember, at the very beginning, we hear that song being hummed and you yep. know it sounds like a motherly thing, yep. right? But Mercedes doesn't have children i don't right. believe no um but she is becoming a mother to ophelia right. throughout the course of this right. of this um of this movie and i feel like this was a really good scene right here where she kind of takes on that mantle and she becomes the type of mother figure that can comfort ophelia after carmen is gone yep yeah um and then of course mercedes braves great danger to get the key to the medicine she ends up uh taking some daring risks Mm -hmm. that uh, put her into that spot, right? Right. Um, And then, of course, and I'm getting to the the chalk part here. Um, When... When Ophelia puts the mandrake under her mother's bed, what she's doing is she's replacing the child back in her mother's care, right? So if what she had done earlier was seen in her mind as trying to help her mother by, you know, somehow getting rid of this, like, thing that's making her sick... Um, at this point, she is now replacing back the child. She is in her mind. She's kind of just like, I am now giving you, I'm, I'm approving of the child now, something like that. Like, I want the baby to live. And so she puts this uh, little mandrake, right? Uh, she sees the child as the only thing now that can save her mother, not the other way around. So mm. if, if before she felt like the baby was, you know, making the pregnancy was making her mother sick. She now sees, uh, I think just through talking to her mom and she kind of sings to the baby or, or no, she tells him the baby, the story and stuff that happened beforehand. Um, but I wrote down here that she seems to feel like the baby needs to live now. The, yeah. the baby is the only thing that can actually save her mother, not the other way around. Isn't there, it's, I think it's also around that same time. She kind of puts her head to her mother's stomach. Her mother's sleeping and she, and she tells her brother like, the don't, don't hurt my oh, mother too yes, bad. Yes, yes. That's like, right. That's you right. know, she's really beautiful. You'll see. Like, yes, you'll see when she's born. Yeah. Yes. So she starts to connect with the baby. She starts right. to connect with them a little bit more, right. I think. Yes. So she takes the image of a baby in the form of a tree, right? The mandrake root, and she sets it beneath the bed of her mother. But the milk is what infants need for sustenance. So the sustenance of the child under the mother's care is what can provide for the health of the mother to get better. Yeah. So she, instead of seeing one thing as the problem and the other thing as the solution, she now sees them both as intrinsically tied and she actually needs to solve the thing that she thought was the problem. Um, she needs to fix the the baby first but and then the baby will fix the mother. Right? Yeah, right. It's very good. Um, anything else before we get to the... Nope, nope. My next note starts with the words pale man. Um, okay. Well, for so, me, this, just to ahead. say that... Uh, uh, just, just to say that... The um, the room that uh, Ophelia uh, moves to uh, after her, her mother gets sick, it was oh my oh, god, yeah. it's like it, it triggered it trigger flashbacks for me because it's like <laughs> a very big version of a room where I used to stay at in my grandfather's oh, no. uh, uh, townhouse. It was like so yeah, oh, it's really very, yeah, <laughs> oh, nice. yeah. Wow, so when wow. I saw when I saw that, he's like, "Wait a minute, this feels somewhat familiar." <laughs> uh, not in a good way. Yeah. So, so did your your, your <laughs> yeah. grandfather live in kind of a a very rural village, kind of like that? Well, he was from, originally from a very small village. The thing is that he uh, he later on moved to a bigger city. But uh, every uh, when I was a child, I was spent at least a couple of weeks in in that very small uh, in that very small town when there the, was the, the summer festival. And yeah, cool, there, cool. he had like a, a small, um, a small room in in the in in, in an attic. Although in attic, again, yeah, it's yeah. it was much much more uh, much smaller. 
but yeah, if you want to know, uh, that's a very good um, uh, indication of how good Del Toro represents uh, how Sp uh, Spain looked at the time. Wow, that's awesome. That's great. Okay, so this next scene here is probably the most memorable, and there's, there's kind of a lot to break down here. And I also want to bring this up now because there was uh, one of our patrons who watched the first episode uh, of this analysis we put up who said that he sort of lost connection to Ophelia during this trial in particular. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. Did, you, did you see that comment? So um, I, I hope that uh, we can provide some insight here that will kind of help uh, yes. change the context behind it. Um, I think in part, we've already sort of built up to this by talking about how disobedience is what she's meant to learn here, not following orders exactly as she's told to do it. Yes. So uh, go ahead. And if you have issues with, um, I, as I do with Del Toro's theme here, um, I will, I will bring them up here soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, she uses the chalk to create a door. Yes. Uh, she also has a, like a, uh, what do you call it? Where the sand falls out? An oh, hour an hourglass. Glass. Yeah. An hourglass. She turns up that chance. She's got to yep. do it in a certain time frame. Yeah. So she goes in and, sh and her, her, um, instructions are basically to not touch anything to not eat any of the food, don't do anything, just go straight yeah. and open, use the key to open the door that gets you the next thing that you need. And that's right. it. And then just leave, right? So that's what she's instructed to do. So as she walks in, um, man, there's so much to break down here. First of all, the monster is amazing as, 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 as in terms of monster design. It's, it's really cool. excellent. <laughs> really cool. One of the um, coolest I've ever seen. Yeah. It's just so striking. Um, and yeah. frightening, just like truly frightening, yeah. uh, visually. Um, basically, uh, just a sack of skin, but, but the, the, the skin hangs a lot on it. Uh, maybe suggesting yes. that at one time this monster was much bigger than yes. it is now. Oh, sure. Sure. Um, and it's it's blind, but uh, in its hands are orifices, I guess, in which it it will grab its eyes and then lift its hands up like this to see. Yeah, um, just I incredibly unique. I mean, yeah. I've never seen anything like that before. No, it's, me neither. <laughs> it's yeah, it's apparently. really freaky. Um, well, uh, from what I see, well, from what I see, I, I think uh, I I forgot, but apparently he um, Del Toro uh, was inspired by a Japanese uh, uh, yokai. That oh, uh, really? uh, oh. the uh, the um, the rising in their hands. Although I don't remember what, uh, what was the name. Uh, we'll have oh, to <laughs> to look it up. <laughs> and uh, about um, and yeah, the thing is that uh, this is again like um, according uh, according to Del Toro in the making of the uh, documentaries that uh, yeah, that monster is supposed to be a representation of the, of the Catholic Church. What, what, uh, once yes. Again. Well, I have yes. To because I, say about also, that. yeah, the entire the. the I mean, the reason why the monster has this skin hanging, hanging, uh, yes. uh, hanging out, um, according to the Toro, he, he was supposed to be like a very old, very fat man who lost yes. weight very, very quickly. Yeah. Yes. Right. And and yeah. I, I I love how the murals, like on the ceiling, they almost look like paintings you would see in the Sistine Chapel. Yeah, they look like, like yeah. Like the, the paintings of the monster. And the children being brutalized, <laughs> and, and and it's very disturbing. They're done, yeah, and gory. like Renaissance art style. Yeah, yeah, they are. They look they they look like a stained glass that you will find in most Catholic churches. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So is. that that tie to religion is definitely there. There's also shoes piled up, kind of shoes all and around clothes of yeah. of the children that this yeah. monster has devoured. Right. Um, so just overall it's a very very unsettling oh, yeah. <laughs> scene that they paint but also the table the fireplace behind the monster all very reminiscent of the same dinner scene that we saw with vidal yes and the others earlier yes so a as a symbol of the the power of the catholic church the, the fascist regime and of vidal himself kind of all embodied here in the pale man the name of the, this monster um yeah it's really good so she, the fairies are leading her. She, that's the other thing that, that the fawn gave to her were, were the fairies to guide her. Yeah, um, there's three, I think. They lead her to a door and point to it and say to open this one. But Ophelia says, no, 
She doesn't open the one they tell them to. She opens a right. different one, and that's where she gets the dagger, not from the one she was told to open. And do you, you, even, do, well, you which, even go back. Which one did she open? It was the left. Yes. Not the one in the middle, which left. I think is the one that they wanted her to pick. Left. The left hand, right? She chose the left, yeah. Now, that was great. Also, when, when she was being told about the trial, she opened the book, and there's like a, a painting that's sort of like, you know, the ink sort of like comes onto the page or it like reveals oh, right. it. Yeah, yeah. It shows uh, the pale man and it shows a girl opening up the same door that the fairies told her to open. In the middle, right? That's what was in the book. Hmm. But she doesn't open the one she was told right. to open. She yes. uses her intuition to say, no, that's not the right door. Maybe like she's remembering something from, a, she's just like, no, I just don't feel like that's the right one. Right. And the one she opens is the right one. This is important because of what one of our patrons uh, wrote in the comment, right? Because after this, she's making her way out and she stops and she sees a grape. Yes. And she decides to eat it, even though the to, fairies are trying to stop her. To her left. Yes. She turns around and as she's going, supposed to go straight back to the door she made, she to her left looks and sees a grape. Yeah. Very nice, very good looking grape. Right. <laughs> like big, <laughs> they, plump, they do look juicy freaking looking delicious. Grape. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, and of course, this awakens the monster. Uh, the, yeah. t- I think two of the fairies get eaten uh, yeah. by it so, as they try to stop him from attacking her. It's uh, once again something of um, a sacrifice was offered to save Ophelia again. Yeah. So each time she's gone down to do things, people have died for her to be able to get out. Right. <laughs> Right. It's very which is Which is also important to point out because of yeah. the third trial, right? Yes. Now, I had, I think, a very similar feeling as our commenter. I'm, I'm sorry that I, I'm not remembering the name right now who, who wrote it. It's someone who's been following us for a long time, though. I know yeah. that. Um, you watch this and you just go, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, what are you doing? This is so, this just is wrong. Like, the, just, the just rules, leave, just the leave, The rules just leave. were so simple. I know. Just follow the rules. <laughs> uh, right? And... That is kind of the point that's yes. being made here. You got to realize that. Ophelia was right. I think there's actually a couple different ways you can look at this. Mm. First of all, Ophelia was right to not follow the instruction she was given by the fairy and the fawn earlier. She got the dagger from the correct door because she did what she thought was right. Right. So there is some, I guess, justification or reason for her to think, no, I want to do this. I think I'm going to be okay. That's good. I That's like that. one. I like that. Two, she went to bed without any dinner. She's probably freaking starving. Mm. The food on the table is representative of the hoard, the hoarding that the that the Francoists are doing. Right. Right? And and everyone else is told, no, you just get these rations. Yes. And 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 this is, you know, as as David was saying earlier, uh, the the propaganda surrounding that. Like, right. You should be thankful for this. Under, yes. under Franco, you're be not going to go hungry. You have. The question is, is it wrong for her to take some of the hoard yes. of food that is kept by the church, the government, whatever it may be? Yes. Right? Is that wrong? Yes. Or is she doing the right thing? Right. By taking that food? Yeah. That, so there, there's the that question. way to look at it. Is it yeah. actually wrong? Now, the, the reason it comes intuitively across as if it is is because these two fairies get freaking bitten well, in half and that it's really I have another um, thing to bring up that I don't think you've you brought up it's it, it's disturbing to see and so it I is. think your initial feeling is oh that outcome was so horrible that was the wrong thing to do yes just keep in mind it, you could you could, there's a way to see this to where it wasn't because people get sacrificed when you uh, poke the bear so to speak mm-hmm. when you take from the table of the uh, of the authoritarian fascist regime uh some some there are going to be some casualties for that but does that make it wrong that's one way to look at it another way is maybe she got a little too confident in her own ability to tell which Mm. choices are right and wrong sure and and there might have been a consequence and she was hungry but she felt like hey you know what yeah like i don't i i disobeyed and it was fine yes so she already tested the water she already dipped her toe in and was like that wasn't so bad Right. So it's okay to maybe put your whole foot in this. But line. also keep in mind, sometimes the right thing leads to really bad consequences. Uh, this whole movie is basically that. Yeah. She dies. She dies right. in the end. So Did she do the wrong things though? Is it really wrong when you're starving, 
to yeah. take from those who are hoarding the food, even if the the bear gets pissed and eats somebody because right. of it. Is it, it does that make it wrong? Did you when uh, is it right, right then? If there are if it's going to require sacrifice to take down yeah. a regime like that. At some point, somebody needs to take what those in power have from them. Yeah. At some point, right? Yes. Otherwise, it just continues forever. Right. So, yeah. again, this brings into kind of question, if, if, is it right if the only way, if it's necessary, if the only way that, uh, I guess, if, if the only way forward is that a sacrifice must be made in order mm. to do, in order to try to take down a regime <laughs> like this, people will die. Right. It's Generally, we would see that as being wrong. If I make a decision, right. people die because of it's wrong. But right. what if it's the only way? Because at some point, like that is the case. Like sacrifices, right. bag, big, horrible, terrible sacrifices have to be made in these types of choices where you're going to try to take down your government because the amount of suffering that would occur if you did nothing would continue on for who knows how many generations until somebody had the courage to say, listen, it's people are going to die, but like, in the end, it's, it's, it, where is that threshold between yeah. the consequences, uh, uh, the, the being justified, uh, the, the means being justified by the ends, I guess. Right. Right. You know, we talk about extremism and ideology, ideological extremism in our Bioshock. So mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of like finding two ends of the answer here. Like yeah, clearly yeah. it's some, at, in some points it is, there is, you're going to be able to say, I have to. Right. Even though the consequences will be severe, even though the, uh, the, the, the means go against what would typically be considered morally right, the ends are way more important. But at what point do you get to where you can start justifying that is, is kind of the hard question to yes. answer, right? So that's why this is such a, a, a really interesting and rich scene because it can be read kind of both ways. Was the sacrifice worth it in this case for one grape? You could see it as yes or no. Well, it depends. I don't know how valuable fairy lives are. <laughs> sure. <laughs> how many fairy lives equal a human? <laughs> Just mostly uh, joking there. But um, go ahead. You had something you were going to add. I there, have a though. thousand. Things. Right, so, um, <laughs> just, just my, well, just my take. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I get what, um, uh, what, uh, where that, that coming is uh, coming from because I, I agree with it, with it a little bit. There is one problem with the, with the with the um, uh, line of thought that uh, Ophelia was starving. The problem is that yeah, she w she went to bed without dinner, but apparently the, uh, between that and, um, and this scene, there's at least one day, a full day. That is so, what I was going to bring up when I was watching the film, and I was trying to think about the scene. I was like, wait a minute, it, how much time has passed? since she went to bed without dinner and this scene because it would be interesting had she not had dinner and she was really hungry but i i i was questioning the same thing while i was watching it is wait has a full day passed has she had a meal before this um so uh, i i think uh, when when watching it again there's a high likelihood that there has been time passed and I was going to bring that up. So I was just going to make that, but I'll pass it back over to you now. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, I don't know. I don't know if it's a problem with the script or maybe there was a, like a, um, a scene missing there that was uh, cut out in the, in the editing room or something like that. But yeah, it's like the problem is that I think that maybe this is the only thing in the movie that I would call a misstep that Del Toro doesn't make very clear how much time has happened with, 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 between those two points and whether or not uh, Ophelia ate something. So, you know because what, though? It's, not very, it's not very clear if she's really starving or, or not. At, at no, least, it's uh, not. I can tell. But I don't think Guillermo del Toro cares. <laughs> 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 His point is, doesn't matter. She could have just eaten a whole big meal right before that. She could. Yeah. She can eat. She can eat a grape. She right. can take a grape yeah, from the Catholic exactly. Church's um, table. I guess. I guess, I guess my, my, my problem with that, with that is that, well, first of all, yeah, um, as far as, as we know, is not aware of the, uh, of the situation with the Russians. And, uh, or, at least, be, or, yeah. or even if she, she does, if she does under, understand, uh, understand the situation because she doesn't, I, I doubt that she knows that yeah. the Catholic still, Church is still are having like, this meal. So. But, still not, but, re still not relevant. Guillermo mm, del Toro mm. still doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I see yeah. where you're, where you're coming from by saying that in, mm. in that. When it comes it's to the, the, the symbolism of yeah, yeah. the scene, it's mm -hmm. it's not um, necessarily 
perfectly relevant that we show a, a specific detail in the real world version of events happening that Ophelia is hungry. Uh, so the symbolism still works, I, I think right. is kind of what you're getting at. But I, I do agree that it would be stronger as a tie-in to, which we've been doing the whole movie, right? And the whole movie, the symbolism of the fantasy world has tied in really well with something happening in the real world. That's why I kind of like to think of it as a, a day hasn't passed, that she went to bed without dinner and the fawn visited her twice and being like, hey, I haven't used that chalk yet. Mm. <laughs> and she's like, no, my mom got sick and I got moved to this other room. See, I think it feels like time has passed, like a long time has passed, but I'm actually not sure whether it has, which is why I had this mm. question. Right. Because and just, um, in, it, a lot happens in one night. Go ahead, David. No, I said, and I, I, I rewatched the, the scene yesterday. And yeah, there's a, a, it passes at, at the release one day, if not more. At the okay. release one day, because because uh, she goes to bed without dinner then the next morning her mother uh, gets sick and then when she goes into the um, into the monsters uh, lair uh, it's already nighttime which means that uh, at least okay. one day has passed but i mean my problem with uh, with the, the line of thought is that uh, without giving um uh, ophelia a more clear motivation for taking the the, the grape okay the the theme uh, the probably the main theme of the whole movie is the uh, what uh, well it's Basically spelled out by uh, uh, um, uh, by the doctor later is that obedience for his, for his, for for his own sake is bad, right. but right. without giving Ophelia a strong motive uh, or well maybe not strong but maybe a clear motivation that it comes across a little bit of uh, disobedience for 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 its own sake as well. And I'm I, not right. sure. If that... uh, yes, I have some I have some things to say about that actually. Yeah, I, and and I actually do agree with this because yeah, I think I think the problem in structuring it the way that it is, is that it, it left at least our, our commenter um, feeling like he could no longer connect with Ophelia anymore. Like, oh my goodness, she made this choice and like, I can't believe that, that was so awful. Like, right. and, and that's kind of the, like I said, the intuitive feeling I had about the scene the first time I watched it. Like, what are you doing? How could you have done that? And that's kind of the, the opposite I have, I have purpose of the something that might help you guys there. see this a little. But, but my point is, is I, I think that it works either way now because yes. you can see it one as her uh, disobeying and that it being justified, even though a sacrifice was needed. We just went through that, mm. but also you could see it as she became overconfident in her ability to tell when it is morally right to disobey. And that the second time she did it. So the first time was using the key in the, in the different door. The second time was taking the grape and that in that case, it wasn't justified. It either way works. Because it doesn't, it, it's not, it, it, she's learning about when it is morally correct sure. to disobey. And right. in learning, you're going to make mistakes from time to time. Right. So you could see it either way. But go ahead with what you were going to say. Oh, gosh. I, I don't even know where to start. We've, <laughs> we've, gone, we've gone so far here. Um, but I have to say, I agree and disagree on both fronts. I think the symbolism and the theme are very strong. Guillermo del Toro doesn't care about that stuff. I, however, also would critique him on, I critique him for his choice of theme, actually. Okay. That's what I critique him on. Um, so I just want to point out, first of all, the pale man is at the end of the table and sits in the exact seat where her father sits. Vidal. Right. Was that? So it's like the head of the table, boom, right there with the fireplace behind him, right? Um, I love that she chooses the door to the left. It's just so good, right? But this is so good. So for the pale man, as long as she obeys the rules, she'll be safe. But that's not in her nature. That's not what she does. She disobeys. And it brings her danger, horrible danger. This is what happens, right? But Guillermo del Toro stated that this was a theme of the movie, rebellion and disobedience, not following the rules. And I'm going to be honest, I think that's a horrible theme. <laughs> I do. I think it comes across in a lot of Guillermo del Toro's work, such as the new Pinocchio movie that came out recently. Mm. He um, talked about this. Uh, he said that he loved the original story, but it's, it's too much about how kids should obey their parents. In his version, he wants to give Pinocchio this disobedient bent that will make it so that Pino the moral of the story is not obedience to your parents. It's disobedience, sure. right? Because that's just what he does. He thinks people should disobey. Now, this is where I draw the difference between for Bioshock, Ken Levine, and for Guillermo del Toro and their differences on human nature. It comes down to kind of this theme here. Um, so basically, if I could just outline it here, 
Guillermo del Toro, the theme of disobedience only works if one thing is true, and that is that humans are naturally good. At their base or nature, humans will do the right thing. Because if, if humans have a natural intuition to do what's right and to be, to be naturally good, then disobedience means that the, human, the human's intuition isn't matching up with the rules. But the intuition will be right because the natural intuition will be to do good. Whereas if there's ever dissonance with the rules, then disobedience is the right thing to do, so saith Guillermo del Toro, because um, human's na- nature is, is good. And so whenever there's a dissonance, you have to disobey. That's the only times that you would disobey is, is in those moments. Um, whereas I think Ken Levine would go on the opposite side of that. And that say human that nature is not. Human nature is not so great, and maybe you need some rules to be imposed upon you in order to function properly in society, right? So that would be where those two differences um, kind of come together. I, I think the only way Guillermo del Toro's, because I couldn't make sense of it. I'm like, who, the theme of disobedience, it doesn't make sense. Just disobey everything all the time, everyone, well, everywhere. Well, that's where I was going to ask you next. Uh, did you read something where del Toro says about something Pinocchio, about- About Pinocchio, not about this movie specifically. Okay. But this movie clearly has a theme of, yes, disobey. But but when? And it doesn't really do a very good job of telling you when, other than maybe she shouldn't have eaten the grape, <laughs> but she definitely should have gotten the dagger, right? Yeah. But it's like, okay, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong, I guess. But that's just like a lottery kind of thing, like you win some, you lose some. I, I don't love the theme of disobedience as a theme. I don't think it's a I don't think it's a good theme. Well, I would the way Guillermo del Toro delivers it is beautiful. But the theme itself is destructive. I would agree if uh, the if the theme is disobedience for disobedience sake, almost reverse of the I obedience for obedience sake thing. Can't tell right? where the theme's um, going in that sense. So I would agree if that was the case. I, I wonder if that was what was in his mind, which is why I asked if you had read something about it. Because no, no, that's I, not, just the movie. I'm going just on the movie. That's not what I pulled from it so much as to disobey that, that, that it is morally right sometimes and that you need to learn when to decipher when it is right. That, but that second sentence there, yes. that and then, that's not in the movie. I, I don't know if, the movie it's, does not um, say if that. it's making any specific like, uh, you know, on the nose remark about it because in the movie's sense, it's, it's obvious because it's, it's, the, it's the fascist regime you're, you're resisting, right? So it's a pretty easy answer. Yes. To if you but, happen to be in a fascist regime, then always disobey and right. then you'll die, but it's good. Like anyway, there's, anyways, it, I have issues. But with I, I think that uh, it, it's, I, I'm not sure if the point uh, is to say disobedience for disobedience sake. Or, or just disobey all the time. No. I'm not sure just, that that's It's what just he's... disobedience with no commentary on when or where or how or why. Yeah. That's, that's, that, what, that, that's, that's what I see. That's my what problem as well. That's the problem though, with, with, uh, with the whole disobedience theme that uh, Del Toro is not very clear about uh, whether it's all supposed to be all the time or only some of the time. And yeah, I think that this scene is the one that represents, represents the whole thing. Uh, the, the whole problem better by not giving Ophelia a clear motivation for taking the, uh, the, the grape. I mean, even even if he, uh, for me, if uh, Del Toro had made more clear that uh, uh, Ophelia was just starving, for me that would have been enough. But the, that's the problem. It's not it's not in the text, at least not clear enough, uh, in my opinion. I think that that's fair. Um, I think yeah. that's actually really fair. It's which rare is... that I critique a theme, by the way. <laughs> 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 it's like for his theme, he did a killer job. I just don't dig the theme. I don't dig it. I, I, I it's guess the I'm one just, thing I'm that made not, me like this movie less. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not totally convinced, first of all, that, that his intention, right. that mm-hmm. his intention sure. was to say, just disobey all the time. Fair enough. Fair um, enough. Yeah, I, I could be reading it a little too If critically. it is, I would be 100% on your side because that's well, can, ludicrous. <laughs> can, can you give me an yeah. example within this movie where he yeah, going for, it's does... Going for, it will be going where, from one extreme to the other. Yeah, that, yeah I, I right. Don't think, I'm, I'm, I'm a very firm, 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 firm believer in the idea of balance. Yeah. So yeah, only, only because, because if something is on balance on, on one side, the, the, the answer is not going all the way to, to, the, to the other extreme. Exactly. And that's exactly what we brought up in, in our Bioshock uh, yeah, yes. analysis we've been doing, <laughs> exactly. right? Is, is that uh, the, the ideological extremes, uh, when carried out, 
uh, and reality meets the road, they have a very hard time of seeing the holes in their own ideology. And so yeah. just jumping ship for the other, the other extreme is a bad idea. It's yeah. It's uh, in the same place. Uh, uh, so what were you going to ask? Though? You were I want something. an example from this film that gives you me a reason to think that the disobedience is conditional. Um, uh, trial three. No, she disobeys. The yes. Rules. So disobedience, but for the right reason. No, no, but that's not what I'm getting. I'm not getting that. Okay. She just disobeys everything. And in sometimes it happens to be for the right thing. And sometimes it's wrong. I, I wouldn't say that the third trial just so happens to be. Like, it's not a guess. Like, she knows that that's the wrong thing. That's fine. That works towards his theme of disobedience, but it doesn't Disobedience work. for the right reason. No, I not don't. Not just disobedience. Well, I would disagree. I would disagree with that. Like, yes, it was for the right reason that time, but she was. she's just disobeying everything. I, I didn't see any distinction between her disobedience there and the other disobediences, especially working towards the theme. Now, the theme could be disobey when it's the right thing, but um, I, j I don't see that. Well, that's what I'm saying is, is uh, and we probably should wrap up if we're going to get you the train station. Um, we can go to late for but <laughs> let's, go, let's go another hour. Uh, uh, that's why I'm saying that you can read the taking of the grape as being the wrong thing too, right? So like- but if the in, theme is disobedience, so okay, it, sure. no. Uh, but I don't think it is. That's my okay, point. Okay. I think that her disobedience in that instance could be seen as being catastrophically the wrong thing to do. I, and and the fawn okay. is, I mean, really pissed when he comes back. I mean, it's like there's a pretty severe penalty where she almost like is not allowed to continue to her kingdom anymore for making this choice. He, right? He's a bit of a fascist, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> But the way I get, <laughs> Go ahead. I, I'm, just, I'm get, waiting for you to I, finish your point. I, I think uh, but, that but, there's a I think there's a clear Garden of Eden th story happening with the pale man, and I think Guillermo del Toro is trying to say that she did still do the right thing there, okay. um, because um, Ophelia is Eve personified. Basically, she she sees the path that she's supposed to do, and the commandment, the one rule: do not partake of the fruit of this abundant tree that has lots of really good fruit. Don't touch it. And she goes in, she's a woman, she steps in, she looks at the fruit, and she decides, I'm gonna have some. This man representing something along the lines of <clears throat> either the, the negative earthly father or the heavenly father, either way. Demiurge. The Demiurge. <laughs> <laughs> she looks and says, She's, she's what Guillermo del Toro is saying that Eve taking the fruit wasn't a bad choice, that Eve did the right thing. I'm, I'm reading that heavily into this scene right here. Is that uh, something you would agree with, the, though? The, the, I, well, In the Catholic yes. view, it's not. But. Exactly, but that's my point, though. Yeah. He's, he's saying the Catholic Church is wrong in this doctrine of original sin because Eve ate the fruit. Okay. What, so. what Guillermo del Toro, in my opinion, could be saying, I think he's saying in this scene, is that Eve saw the abundance of God and yes, wanted some. And that's the, that was the sin, that she wanted it. But that's wrong, that it's okay, that that wasn't, that disobedience was not um, a bad thing. I think that's what Guillermo del Toro was saying. Okay, let me circle back to that. But I know David's been trying to say something here. Let me pass it to you. Uh, and just, um, just to say that, I don't know if you guys are seeing it, but in the Discord chat, people are getting really excited about this debate. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, good. Oh, snap. Unexpected, unexpected disagreement slash debate between Ma Mike and, and Kaysen. Has this ever <laughs> happened on stream? <laughs> uh, first of all, people should realize it's not that serious. Uh, no. It's yeah. just, but it is interesting sometimes, too. But yeah. when we're trying to nail down the theme, yeah. I, think, I think it's easy enough to say, oh, disobedience when, when it's right. Sure. I don't think that theme is as strong. And given what I do know Guillermo del Toro said about the Pinocchio movie, that he wanted disobedience to be the theme of that movie, um, that yeah. I think disobedience in general is something that he's a fan of and that this movie is preaching very hard. And that doesn't, I, I would still say it's incidental that it happened to be right for, for the third trial. Um, but that doesn't mean that she didn't do it for the right reasons, whatever. I agree. Yes, she did it for the right reasons. Um, but in terms of the fact that we're reading into everything, where everything that we're seeing, that these trials, these trials from the phone mm -hmm. are to test her disobedience, not her obedience. Mm -hmm. these, these trials are to make sure that she will be disobedient, not be blindly obedient, right? To not be blindly obedient, not just to be disobedient for disobedience sake. I, I think that's the part that I'm disagreeing on. Okay, so blind obedience. 
is that, the that theme. blind obedience blind is obedience not is the right. Theme of this film. But I'm not saying I'm, I'm not sure he's saying blind disobedience is. Is my point. Okay, so then disobedience isn't the theme. It's just blind obedience is not right. Yes. I can get with that. Yes, I can get that's with that. what I think it is. That's not what he said for Pinocchio, but whatever. <laughs> this is a different situation. It's a whole different thing. That's fine. I'm, I'm, I think what happened is I read that thing from Pinocchio, and I was like, don't screw up the Pinocchio story. Dude. And I actually kind of got mad at him a little bit. Yes. And then I watched this movie like a day later. Yes. And I was like... I'm seeing disobedience everywhere. Well, this is all Guillermo del Toro is trying to get everyone to just be disobedient. And I'm not <laughs> down with that, man. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I, I guess, no, I mean, um, go ahead. Dave. I, I can say, I can say that yeah, I can say that. Yeah. Guillermo del Toro, when talking about this movie back uh, uh, in the day, yeah. Uh, disobedience is uh, explicitly the theme of, of, of the movie from uh, in, in the text and outside the text. But uh, yeah, the, I, I agree with Mike here. I mean, uh, my, my issue is that he's not very good at uh, pointing out when dis disobedience is, um, is correct and when it's not. And yeah, that makes it come across a little bit that, oh, um, obedi uh, blind obedience is, is a sin, blind disobedience is a virtue. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. That, it, that's, I mean, I don't, I, maybe, um, maybe we are just projecting a little bit. Maybe that was not the intention, but. I get the I get the feeling that um, that's the the part of the movie that I'm a little bit complete, completed about because um, at least the execution I think it could have been better there. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> if we go right. for a negative theme here, which is not blind disobedience, right? I can get behind everything happening here. I think it actually kind of closes a lot of the gaps. Sure. That I see that she is definitely not blindly obeying. Whatever she does, she's not blindly obeying. Now the disobedience yes. thing is like hit or miss as far as I can see with her hmm. but blindly obeying she definitely doesn't blindly obey and that's clear yeah okay so here's wow there's a lot of things I don't know if I'll get <laughs> my mind's a little bit like jumping between different points here um I'll start off with this so uh and I'm not making any accusations by saying this I'm just this is why I'm hesitant to maybe like fully accept uh, some of the things that, that you're saying. Um, in, in my experience of uh, researching to a pretty insane degree, like the development history of the Final Fantasy series, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. And making, making uh, videos that, that the, the, the real sort of heart of them was to be as accurate as possible, like to report as accurately uh, as right, possible right. about what happened and what intentions of, of the artists, <laughs> of the artists yes. were, I have learned very hard lessons about, uh, when and when not to make those claims. Yeah, yeah. Now, again, I'm not making an accusation of you here, but just to say that I, I tend to really, uh, get worried, <laughs> I guess, when, when we start talking about intentions, because I didn't hear the thing that you did uh, that when from about Pinocchio. referring to Pinocchio. Right? Yeah, yeah. So there's part of me that goes like, before I jump on that, I'd like to hear it in context or whatever. So that's the only reason oh, I'm sure. kind of being like all not like uh, I'm a little skittish about like accepting that uh, on the nose, but, and that's good. That's good. Um, honestly, I think that early on I was picking up on the theme of disobedience and we were on the same page up to this trial that it all worked It all. Everything worked towards that theme at yeah. this point, right? That yeah. she she just doesn't do things the way that she's supposed to. Um, but I think that maybe that was a mistake for me to latch too hard onto the disobedience theme. Um, and maybe I can like move over to the blind obedience is wrong kind of thing. I, That's like still, it's a negative theme, but I think that I think it works also better. that the word disobedience in this conversation is partly my fault too. Because I was saying that I think in episode one about like, the theming centered on disobedience, or whatever. Right. But I, I think uh, I may have all I'm that. pulling, all I'm pulling from the text of the movie regarding that is when the doctor tells Vidal later in the movie, only a man like you can blindly obey. Right. I don't think he uses the word disobey. No, or no, like that. She said to to obey to blindly obey without asking questions. That's yeah. something only you can do. So I yeah. I think that me taking that and then using the term disobedience may have painted a little bit differently sure. what I meant to <laughs> say. <laughs> and and so it's maybe like taken this sort of turn into where we arrived at where we're at now. But um, okay. I, I think that the theme of this movie is clearly around learning not to obey uh, without 
thinking for yourself without, or just to do it because you were told to do it. I don't think the, that it's necessarily trying to go to the opposite extreme, like David is saying, where it's like, no, just disobey all the time because, uh, you know, I, I don't know, for whatever reason, just disobey just, just to do it. It seems like that was her trial that was for her to not follow the rules. Yeah. Those are, that's her, her trial. So they give her a bunch of rules and it's her trial to not follow them. <laughs> I am, I'm still latching on to this idea where in every case, as far as the trials go, mm. uh, one with, you know, getting the dress dirty, that's more disobedient towards the real world parents Shh, and right. things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the disobedience to the fawn in the third is clearly the right thing to do. Right. And that's what gives her passage into paradise at the end of the movie. Right. Um, but in the second trial, there's two points at which she disobeys. And the one where she, she questioned the fairies telling her it's this door was right. And that the other one, while it might not have been wrong in the sense that it's not wrong to take from someone who's hoarding from everyone else. Right. It wasn't necessarily right, right either. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because it was That's selfishly sure. driven. She just wanted to eat. If, if yes. what David is saying here, that she had not, that she had eaten, that it, she wasn't, she hadn't gone to bed the night before without eating and right. she was if just really correct. hungry. She yeah. just really wanted to eat a grape because it looked delicious. Right. That's the wrong reason to disobey. Now, if we go back to your Garden of Eden parallel, which I do think is there. It, it's right? not only there, also what are, what's the consequences of her eating the fruit? Right. It, eat. It's, she well, dies. well. Yeah. In the Bible. If, yes. if you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. Right. But like, it's I, also. It's, it's here for sure. Uh, it's also, you gain knowledge, right? You become like yes. God. You which get, is the whole Gnostic interpretation is that the has. Gnosis was, uh, it was right. It to was take being kept from the, Gnosis. the people. So you could yes. almost say Del Toro's interpretation of the Garden of Eden story here is the Gnostic one. It would be closer to that. Yeah. Is, I don't think, uh, 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 necessarily to say it's that disobedience for disobedience sake is right or that just disobeying, but that in this case, God or the demiurge God, not the God that Christians believe in or whatever, right. uh, that the demiurge God who was jealous of Adam and Eve because they had the light of the monad in them, right? Mm, right. And was trying to imprison them in the Garden of Eden right. and, and set up the rules and the structure and the right. oppressive regime, the prison that they Which were in. Which seems quite... That the Gnosis right. was Which the right choice, the yeah, yeah. even though that there were consequences. Which, Which death, is death. Death being one of them, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I don't know. I, I don't want to, because I haven't done enough reading into Del Toro to like even attempt to make any kind of claim about what his intention with the scene was. But I do think <laughs> that there are other ways to look at it in which uh, we don't have to take away that he's trying to say disobey just to do it, right? So that's my take on it. It's but. mostly just that this grape eating ends so horribly that is like, wait, what's Guillermo del Toro trying to say? <laughs> and I think that that leads to what David is saying here. Is <laughs> like, David, I think, is right, right in saying that <laughs> alone without – there being a clear depiction here, because again, I think you can see it two ways. Was she hungry? So it was right to take it, even though she was told not to, right. or was she just, I just really want to eat that grape. Was she lusting after it? In which right. case that's not a justified reason. In which case the consequence Ooh. is that it was wrong to make the choice. Unless we accept the Gnostic reading of the garden of Adam and Eve. Or is it in that? In which case you can, um, Eve, it was okay. It was a good thing for Eve to have some of what God had. Yes. And was keeping from her. Yes. The demiurge, not even the motive. Though, <laughs> even though she dies in the end. Yes. I feel right. like that works um, towards his theme better. It just leads me to, towards a theme that I don't love. Okay. Um, I think we said about all we could say on that. Do you have anything to add, David? <laughs> I, well, about that. Uh, yeah, I think we went enough. I mean, just okay. to, yeah, about I mean. I mean, just to re re reiterate that, yeah, I mean, my issue with the, with the scene is a lack of clarity on uh, um, uh, regarding um, uh, Ophelia's motivation to take the grade. That's my issue. I mean, if, even even if he, she had, uh, be, uh, if it was clear, uh, more clear uh, for for me, it would have uh, worked much better. But yeah, yeah, that's that lack of clarity makes you wonder about what, uh, why the, the thing, this thing, this thing has happened. Although I, I gotta say that yes. what you said, Mike, about Ophelia becoming uh, becoming overconfident because she did disobeyed once and she got it right and she and she thought, uh, okay, 
it looks like I'm on, on the right track. So why I don't keep going? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I can get my uh, I can get behind that idea a little bit better. But yeah, I mean, the, it's the lack of clarity the, in, in, in that regard that um, troubles me. I, I think that that's what I, I want to make clear. Yeah, I think that's fair. So I want to bring up, because there's so much symbolism packed here. It's just crazy. It's like there's Vidal, there's the Catholic Church, there's basically the Garden of Eden. There's like yeah. a ton of stuff all put here all at once. Um, but the Pale Man is amazing because it has achieved its goal of eliminating time, mm. right? Clearly, this is, in this instance, meant to represent Vidal. Sure. After ending time by the killing of children, it sits at a grand feast and does nothing. It doesn't need to do anything. It has stopped time. As long as everything remains perfectly kept in front of him, he has no need to move a finger. He won't even eat the feet, the feast in front of him. He just wants it there. But as soon as Ophelia takes a bite, it's time for the pale man, or time starts up again. Like yeah. something has changed. And what causes change? Well, it's time. Time is the agent of change, right? Mm. So time begins happening again as soon as something changes. And that's what Ophelia does. She she causes something to change, right? right? His room has been disturbed. Something took effect on his meal and things have now changed. Time equals change. Ophelia introduces time to the monster by introducing change. This change then ruins the monster's perfect world that it had created. And the only way to regain that perfection is the destruction of the child. Mm. Children Children represent future and the future and potential. Children represent change and an upcoming generation. Sometimes I look at kids these days and I think, someday these jokers are going to run the world. <laughs> and I, sh I shudder. I really do. <laughs> but in many ways, that's just a traditional impulse that I have not to change things too much. The older I get, the more that I get like that, right? But I just don't want things to change too radically from what I know. But at some point, you have to come to terms with what children mean and what children are. They mean change. They mean flow and future and potential, all of which are encapsulated within time itself. So time is the thing that cha time is the thing that changes. So Pale Man has to kill the child. He has to. He has no choice. The only way to keep things the same is to destroy that which brings about the future and change. He has no choice but to kill the girl. I, I really like this, and, and I want to add to it that yeah? what's so funny about it is I, I have had similar feelings, right? I look at the generation behind me or maybe two behind me or whatever, yeah. and I go- It's like, what are they doing? <laughs> Holy crap, this is just- <laughs> Yeah. This is just nonsense what these people- <laughs> like the, the like the memes of that generation, the the humor of it. It's just something yeah. that's so different, I guess, from the way that I think. Right? It's it's a generational difference. Each oh, generation totally. yeah, yeah. has very different influences. They develop a different culture, a different style of art. Yep. And I yeah, think yeah. that everyone goes through this process of oh, where totally. they age out of yeah. what's cool or what's like yes. coming from the younger generation, right? And they start to look down on it and be yes. condescending yeah. of it. Now, at the same time, as I was having this thought one day. I realized I wouldn't want the version of me as a teenager or in my 20s going anywhere near <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> like running, running anything running <laughs> either. <laughs> me neither. Dude. Because I hold, I hold to this day that I was a complete yeah. moron until I was well into my 30s. Now, <laughs> that, <laughs> that gap. That was like two years ago. That I know. But that gap continues to, there's almost like a five-ish, maybe even less year buffer of, yeah. of stuff I can go back and look at that I did that I can appreciate for being oh, done well. And not embarrass, yeah, embarrassed. Yeah, and not be embarrassed by it. By it. Yeah. If I go back to anything I did in my 20s, it's like, this is this is horrible. Oh my God. <laughs> this is horrible. <laughs> yeah. This is really bad. That's funny. Um, but you know, something I did last year or maybe mm. two years ago, I can look at, oh, that was really well done or that was really right. nice. But I think the older I get, even those things I'm looking at now and thinking were good, I'll probably look at and see all the flaws and yes. problems and, and everything yeah, like yeah. that, That's which is why I, I have not been able to bring myself to finish. I, I have finished it technically. There's all the chapters are written of this book, but I just can't seem to ever be comfortable releasing it because I'm looking uh, at work I, I did it. six ten, years ago, ten years seven ago? years yeah, ago yeah. and saying that sucks. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I think that uh, I guess it's kind of a tangent, but the point is uh, I have felt the same feelings, but I would feel the same feelings towards myself at that age. <laughs> not, not just to, you know, kids today. So <laughs> yeah. anyway, yeah, oh, all so about that is that I mean I I um I struggle a uh, with that a little bit too. But the thing is that um, many years uh, I always remember the same thing because many years ago I read um, 
um, a piece of, uh, a text from a, um, a philosopher from uh, ancient Greece. I don't re I, I don't remember uh, the na the name unfortunately, but I remember clearly when I when I read it. It was like, wait, are you sure that this comes from ancient Greece and not from Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's like it's like when I when I read that it it massively changed my my, my perspective and and even though I still have the, the, those thoughts I whenever I have one of those thoughts of kids kids these these kids days these I always days, try yeah. to remember that that uh, that text because it means that this thing has been around since the the beginning of time yes. and your generation don't believe for a second that your your generation is, is special in any way yeah. right. compared to the ones that are going to come afterwards. Right. Yeah, that's exactly yes. right. Absolutely. That's so funny. Um, let's see. My next note here is the Vidal cutting his own throat in the mirror, okay. which you guys got. I, I have a little bit more. I just wanted to okay. expound just because I have this note here I have not yet read. Um, okay. So when she eats the grape, it's similar to the Garden of Eden. She takes the bite and has to deal with the consequences, the last the last of which require the ultimate sacrifice yeah. to save the world and return to celestial glory seated on the left hand of the king. There's lots of symbolism on the right and left hands. For Ophelia, and maybe more generally, the left hand does represent, among other things, <laughs> rebellion and disobedience. Sure, right? yeah. So, and honestly, you can even look at it in terms of, well, French politics, American politics, left and right, the left side and the right mm. side, right? The right side is more um, conserving things and the yeah. left side is more exploring things, yeah, right? sure. And so the, re the rebel, the... Uh, the, the disobedient will be the explorers and then the conservers um, will be the ones who, who would be less likely to do that. Um, and this is referenced in the Bible even, not the political thing I just said, just the idea of left and right, left hand and right hand. Yeah. Uh, God gathers with his right and pushes away with the left. Um, but Ophelia is disobedient, but instead of being pushed out, she ends up on the sitting, seated at the left hand of the king. Yeah. So that shows that there is a place for the left hand as well. It's the the left hand isn't always well. Yeah, and and I, I think in 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 light out. of the the conversation we're having about all this and <laughs> in, in Bioshock too and everything yeah, else, yeah. right about ideological extremes. Yeah. Uh, maybe this is my filthy centrist mindset, but <laughs> like um, <laughs> balance is important. Like yes. it, it, a lot of people characterize centrism in a way that I think is honestly just. It's it's so stupid. It, it, it's that <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. it's it's, it's, really it's this it's this fence sitting <laughs> position, right? You just can't choose. You don't have the care. You don't have the courage of your convictions to like mm -hmm. choose a side, yeah. and, as if like cho there's the only two choices. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, just it's, it's, uh, it's yeah. moronic. I have, I have a, big, a big problem with that that idea that uh, centrism, or, or at least that idea of, of centrism, is either uh, cowardice or or stupidity, and it's neither. Yeah. No, it's yeah. neither. And and the way that I view it, I mean, like my, I guess what what guides me is it's it's not really about a a right, left, or center ideology to follow. Mm. It's about the fact that there are that these two ideologies that are opposed to each other are really just like we said about um, uh, the, the hermeticism, right? Uh, or, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. The uh, coincidence uh, the, the, of the po polarity, the principle of polarity. The, in the Kabbalion, yeah. Where they're the, exactly the same thing, just at different degrees. Uh, yes. Opposites are. Yes. So uh, solid, liquids, same thing, same element, okay. different degrees, oh, right? Oh, man, I had um, this thought when I was a kid. I was like, the opposite of, of one isn't a negative one. The opposite of one should be negative infinity, right? The opposite of the opposite of red shouldn't be blue. It should be like cat. Like it should be something in a completely different yes, category. Yes, right. But the way the opposites work is it's like, no, it's not in a different category. It's not yeah. a completely opposite thing. It's an opposite side of the, of the same thing. thing. Right. In which case the opposite of what, anyways. Um, so, so we're having this conversation about balance. And my point is that in the end, that there's value in the right and left hand mm. together. Yes. Right? That the left hand exploring, like yeah. you're saying, is is important. It's good. But it's not right everything hemisphere. you find when you explore is going to be good. No, in fact, <laughs> oftentimes you will grab a grape and then get chased by a monster. So mistakes will be made, but you must <laughs> yes. be allowed to use the left hand yes. to explore and make mistakes. Yes. And the right hand you, you must it. also heed to keep you oh, grounded, yeah. but you can't let it dominate you so that you don't do the exploring. Yes. This is the balance we're talking about. In both ideologies, you're going to have areas where they are very, very correct. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. it's worth fighting for that principle. 
Yeah, sure. Both have them. Sure. But yeah. both are very, very wrong in many, many ways. And this is mm. not a both sides thing. I, and the whole problem I have with our political discourse is everyone just tries to dismiss everybody else yeah. by... I think you guys know where I'm going with this. Yeah, there, there were fine people on both sides, yeah. That's, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> that's not what I'm, I'm saying. I'm just kidding. That was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> I know. I'm not yelling at you. I'm but yelling was... at the people who would say that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Point is, I think that what I'm pulling from this movie and from this kind of topic we're exploring in both things that we're analyzing right now is that uh, it's that political extremes, not political extremes, extremist ideology um, on either mm. side can be dangerous, not because the principles are dangerous, but because when you believe in something so completely and you have dedicated yourself to an ideology so completely, You're it becomes for it. really, really hard to self-evaluate properly and to mm. see the holes in your own thinking. Yeah. And when you start to believe you're right about everything, that's what leads to problems. Sure. It's, it's not that it's the hubris. ideology is, an ideology yeah. is a construct. It's just something we made up. It's not, it doesn't really exist. It's abstract. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. exist. What, what <laughs> exists is a person following something to a point in which they're no longer able to look at the holes in their own thinking to, to self evaluate in a, an objective way. Right. That's the problem with it. So yeah. you need both. It's when you, you need become to balance both. ideologically possessed, basically. Yes. It's when you, yeah. Yep. That's that's more or less uh, th what I see in the symbolism of, of, of the balance of, of the right and left hand. That's why balance is important. Very good. Not because well, uh, I, can't, I don't have the courage to choose which one. It, it, you have to make choices individually by point. And yes, that's sometimes hard, that's going to put you this way. And sometimes it's going to put you that well, way. Sometimes it'll put you on neither because both answers are wrong. Yeah, the point is being... Well, I mean, Dedicated to the truth. Go ahead. No, uh, no, I was going to say. I mean, uh, it, it's ironic because the Spanish Civil War. It, it's a very good, uh, uh, a good example of of, uh, of that kind of mentality when two extremes go go, go too far. The oh, thing sure. is that, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, uh, obviously, the, uh, in in Spain, there's a little bit of, of influence from from the, from the from the political discourse in, in America, not in a good way. Yeah, although I think that uh, having the 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 experience of the Spanish Civil War maybe help uh, to be a little bit more grounded. The thing well, is that's that, good. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. The thing is that um, ob obviously the, uh, the 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 right gets more flack, but um, I, I always remember that one of the main reasons why the Republican side lost it was because um, they they they. I mean, the, uh, historia, historians uh, you, uh, very often talk about a civil war inside of, of the civil war, because the Republican side had uh, radical groups inside of it that yes. wanted to uh, do the things their way, and everyone who disagreed in the slightest thing was a, was a fascist who needed to be to be uh, taken out. Yeah, and uh, and George Orwell, uh, the. Um, yeah, you know that yeah. he was uh, oh, yeah. in yeah. in in Spain, in Spain as a journalist to cover the Spanish Civil War, and he was oh, yeah. in, on the side of the Republicans, and he was horrified uh, uh, by the infightings inside the Republican side. Well, yeah. and I, I think it was it was one of the uh, one of his main inspirations to write uh, in 1984, actually. Yeah, it was Spain. So, wow, I didn't know. Yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting because I remember reading that when I was doing a little bit of my you know study, uh, very skim Google search type study on the Spanish civil war leading up to this analysis was that the Republican side was made up of communists, but also like yes. people who definitely weren't communists, <laughs> like people who yeah, were yeah, yeah. against communism, but they were both against the fascists. So like, yeah. but yeah. No, the, the, and, and, and the nationalist side w w was the same thing. I mean, not everyone in the national side w was a fascist. Many, right. many of them were just straight conservatives. Some people were monarchies. Some people were uh, in the center, but they didn't le uh, right. And right. uh, and the uh, and the left to say it was uh, yeah I mean civil wars are always extremely messy, oh, yeah. and uh, it's a little bit of a, of a mistake trying to put in in a black uh, in uh, paint them as a black or, or white a scenario just because one of I mean it's true that of the two sides the nationalist side was much worse, but uh, that doesn't mean that everything that the Republicans did was like a you know like sacred or pure or anything like that I mean there were sure. a lot. Um, I mean, I always remember this uh, this uh, this figure that the um, the Franco side perch. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's only an estimation, but uh, the estimation is that they perch one hundred seventy five thousand people. 
that's oh wow i mean that's, wow. that's a horror film. and here's the thing that's a bunch the there's a, a the same estimate says that the republican side they purge 100 thousand. Mm. obviously the yeah, obviously the the, the national one hundred and seventy five thousand is much worse uh, much worse than one hundred thousand. But one hundred thousand is not nothing to scout. No, yeah. You, you, if yeah. you're on either side, you, the likelihood you're one of the good guys is low. This is why it's called yeah, the fog of war, right? I mean, right. it's not, it's not easy to deter, to determine like yeah who was right, Although who was wrong, the, and because uh, if there's right and wrong on all sides. Although there's the, I mean, there's one thing that uh, it's absolutely true, and um, and it's that. The Republican Repo the Republican government was le le uh, democratic democratically elected and it was 100 uh, percent legitimate. So obviously, trying to take it out by a coup d'état, that's not a good look. No, oh, yeah. yeah. To, to, to say to, to, and, and that's pretty very 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 lightly. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. And okay. Uh, one thing. Uh, okay. I, this is a good opportunity for me to to bring this up. Um, the uh, the during the the Civil War, many people just was loyal to one side because that was the the uh, the side that happened to be in charge of their of, of the region that they were living at mm, yep oh, same, yeah. were, no, same with like uh, sports teams right you, you're sports, only yeah. you're only loyal to <laughs> the, home the sports team. team you root for because you were born you happen to be born yeah. in that area isn't that well, coincidental yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very similar very similar it's like uh oh i'm on the side of of the of franco why just because the nationalists took, took my town and they they were in charge and i had to uh, fight for them and uh, um, otherwise you die that this so. is, yeah and this is uh, i mean uh spain was not very industrialized back in the day so the communications were pretty uh pretty wonky which means that uh, the only things that you uh, ha had to go by to know what the hell was going on was the you know the propaganda that you, that you were fed off. So mm. maybe there yeah. were a lot of people who just happened to be in on on one side and they rooted for them because that's the side that uh, their region uh, was for. And then obviously tribalism ke kicks in. Yeah. So yeah, mm. that's survival. Um, let's see. Where are we okay. at? Where's our next quote well, here? <laughs> well, we're about to leave, so we're about to escape. Um, yeah, well, yeah. I put down that the, the pale man eats the fairies. I think yes. it's uh, it's great. <clears throat> in some ways, this could symbolize Vidal <laughs> in a way because he's eating – well, he's eating the fairies. The fairies don't exist. Fairies aren't real, right? right? So he's eating things that aren't real. Honestly, Vidal wants her to stop reading fairy tales. Um, and oh, he is, he's yeah. destroying the fairy tales basically. So, mm. so the symbolism of the pale man eating the fairies is the symbolism of Vidal wanting to kill the fairy tales. Uh, he is the objective reality that wants to swallow up the fairy tale and destroy its meaning and potential to see or change the world. And then I've got her escape. You know, she goes off. She, the the door disappeared. She didn't do it in the right time, which was her next disobedience. She yep. she wasn't obedient again, uh, but she is able to make her own escape uh, through the ceiling. Yep. Um, so then after that, my next note is I really did not know exactly what to make of this. I think we talked about it briefly a few weeks ago. Um, it shows Vidal kind of standing in front of the mirror, he's like shaving. Yeah. And what was up with them? There's a there's a watch. I don't know if it's the watch he uses to really keep time or if it's his father's watch. I think yeah. it's his father's watch. I think I remember seeing that it was broken mm. or, or shattered. The glass was shattered. And he looks down at it and then he looks up at himself and he makes a cutting motion with his razor across yeah. his neck. I, I was very curious to see what you guys made of that. I think I have a, an idea of what I think about it, but yeah. it was at first I was very confused by this. <laughs> I mean, the best the best that I can do, first off, this foreshadows his death, right? Sure. So it's like, oh, okay, he's a character who's going to die, right? He could have drawn X's on his eyes and all that <laughs> stuff. And it's like, all right, we are foreshadowing the death of this character. Okay, great. But what else does it mean beyond that? Yeah. Um, it also seems to me that he wants to die. This is very similar to what I was saying before about how Guillermo del Toro has this uh, inkling that humans are naturally good. This harkens back to enlightenment debates going like three, 400 years ago. Sure. Like, um, in other words, we're not going to solve it on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's well, different, more idealist type people would say humans are naturally good. More people who are more authoritarian or more uh, maybe realistic, I would say um, they tend to say that humans uh, given their natural tendencies are, are, are not like paragons. They're not angels. They're not good necessarily. Um, but this is interesting because he does a lot of bad things, right? And he's killed people who were innocent and he 
he's not like a great person. And I think this, this scene is trying to show us that he knows that, Hmm. right? Like he's doing his job. He's, I'm just doing my job, sir. You'll notice that there's one of his uh, officers. Um, they, they, they take great, they go to great lengths to show this, one of his, um, his officer's face, uh, as, he is doing bad things, just doing what he's told mm. and he's disgusted by it, but he does it. And that's yeah. the difference between Ophelia or Mercedes and, um, Vidal and his officer who's just has this disgusting look on his face when he has to, oh, like, when he shoots, the shoot guy. people on the ground. Yeah. You remember what I'm talking I do about, remember. right? Yep. That, and it's like, Oh, that guy doesn't want to be doing this. That yep. guy knows it's wrong. Yep. I think this is a sense where when Vidal is alone, he's, he puts on that music, he's got that watch. He looks at himself in the mirror and and he wants he wants to die. He he his natural intuition is telling him you're not a good guy, and and he is he hates himself. Yeah, I, I that's think what I got. I, I like that. Um, how about you, David? Did you read anything from from that scene? Well, Did you have any thoughts um, on it? I mean, this is a, the, uh, yeah, this uh, I seen that I was a little bit confused by. I, I wasn't very sure, but uh, maybe it's it's one of those scenes that are supposed to be read in multiple ways. And yeah, one of, one of them is the one that Kason says that I, I totally agree with. But there's another one that it should be taken into account, which is the fascist mentality. Okay, this is one this is mm. one point in which uh, Franco's uh, fascism and Hitler's uh, Nazism uh, did had have in common, which oh, yeah. was the glorification of 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 heroes through death. You know, yes. like by a hero. That's right. Yeah, Actually, that that harkens yeah, back we, to the ancient Germanic, the the Valhalla, mm. the you know the ancient oh, sure, yeah. pre-Christian, yeah, like pagan Germanic peoples, Norse yeah. mythology. And, yes. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, David. Yeah. 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 And actually, um, going back to the dining scene where this man who met uh, Vidal's father, he mentions that uh, the reason why his father supposedly smashed his uh, clock to, uh, so it marked the, the time when, when he died, he right. says, so his son knows how a brave man dies. Yes, there you go. Yeah, yeah. that's, and that's the thing. I, yeah, that's something that, um, yeah, th- uh, that's very, a, fas- a very fascist thought. The idea that you are supposed to have like a heroic death. Yes. In, in battle uh, again, against like a, an evil en- oh, enemy dude. or something, which is like, a, that, it's great. one of the things that are more scarier ab- about that ideology. And yeah, that's, uh, yeah, uh, like I said, there are many, many ways in which uh, Franco was different from other uh, uh, flavors of fascism, but that was one thing that uh, it was, pretty much the same uh, through all of them. Yeah. Dude, Vidal is fearless when he fights. Oh yeah, like, I was going to bring that up. He just walks straight up and he is just, he's got a pistol sh- fighting dudes with rifles and he's yeah. just like, boom, he does not care if he dies. No, he almost wants it. He's inviting. He, he, he wants to die. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So that he can have that. Oh, it's it's crazy. So yeah, that definitely goes along with this as well. He He's okay with dying. He wants to die. Yeah, I, I definitely feel the same in terms of, there. He, he's looking forward. To the moment he can die and crush his own watch and give it to his son. Yes. That's like he, what he's really living He is for. living until that moment <laughs> happens. Yeah. Right? And so he idolizes his father yep. for having been that sort of war hero. Yeah. He thinks that that's, that's the way to go out, right? So I think what I saw there was when he looks down at the watch, and, it, and I think it is his father's watch he's looking at, mm. and he looks back at himself, he's almost disgusted that, or maybe concerned that he might not like find that sort of noble end or whatever. He's not, he's not living up mm. to the legacy the way he should be mm. somehow. Okay, sure. Yeah. Mm. I and he, and he's sure. making a, a gesture to punish himself for having not, I, I don't know if it's necessarily, if he doesn't, if he feels like maybe he's not doing it right or he's, it, it hasn't happened yet. Or um, obviously that wouldn't huh. be it because he hasn't, his son hasn't been born yet. His son's got to be yet. born first so we can give the watch to the son. But yeah. maybe in some way he feels like he's not living up to the legacy and, or he's afraid that he might not or something like sure, that. Or he's having some that. kind of moment of doubt and he just, he, he makes yeah. that gesture, you know, so. That's good. Um, I like it. Okay. My next note here is that Mercedes told the captain earlier that, there's, that there was only one key to the storehouse, but clearly there's more because she gives one to her brother. Um, this is why they're yeah. able to break into the storehouse later. So there was more than one key. Yep. Right. Um, so uh, there's just that scene where they go out, she and the doctor go out, they give medicine to uh, some of the soldiers. And I think we like meet that. a couple of them too. Yeah. They, they, they cut that one yeah. guy's leg off. Oh uh, yeah. Um, yep. Oh God. 
Yeah, uh, actually, that's something that, uh, yeah, something that I wanted to, br to bring that up because the, the Rebels, we, we haven't uh, talked about them really. And yeah, uh, the thing is that th that group of Rebels actually existed in uh, in in uh, after the Spanish the Spanish Civil War they oh, were yeah. called los maquis los maquis los the maquis yeah and um they uh, although they don't use the name in the in the film so maybe um, i mean at the very least they are inspired by by them cool, cool. and uh, yeah awesome. basically they were a group uh, when the when the war ended and um they they, they uh, franco took over there were many people who uh, they, 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 they took they, they took the, took it to the, to the mountains to hide themselves and keep fighting uh, against Franco's regime. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they were. Um, I mean, they, they haven't made many uh, movies about them because uh, they weren't very successful, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's uh, Del Toro makes a very uh, good uh, depiction of how they uh, they were living. You know, they were living in case, uh, yeah, uh, hidden in, in in the in forest, trying to live uh, to live out uh, from the uh, the help of of villagers. And when they couldn't, and when they didn't have the their help, they had to steal. Oh, of course. Yeah, actually, the the uh, I understand that uh, the majority of the Maquis that were. Yeah, captured by Franco's regime, were uh, captured when they were trying to steal food from from people, and uh, oh, that really? gave Fra and they and they fr uh, they gave Franco the the excuse to label label them as just bandits. Ah, uh, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they would have so started death otherwise, them. though. Yeah. yeah All yeah. right. And, um, and it was uh, and and one one last thing. It was that uh, in that scene where uh, Mercedes and the doctor go go to see them and and help uh, the, the guy with the, with the uh, with the leg that they have to, to cut off there's one moment when the the guy with the starter is trying to read a newspaper yes and they, they the were d-day yeah, they, right? they, they, they were yeah d-day yeah. exactly they were talking about d-day yeah and um yeah that's something that the monkeys were uh, were trying to believe i mean they were very aware of the fight during world war ii and they were hoping that at some point the war will come to spain and they will liberate them which hmm. didn't, didn't happen, happen. <laughs> <laughs> which is tragic yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, so... I've just got... My next note is her talking to her brother. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I think I only have two more. Uh, so why don't we go with that one first? Kay. So uh, she says to her brother, if you do what I say, I'll take you to my kingdom and make you a prince. So she's, re, uh, she's asserting authority over her brother again, but not in the way that authorities assert over her. Mm. Rather, she's making a bit of a bargain. Yeah. If you do as I say, not do as I say, yeah. it's if you do as I say, then I'll do this other thing. It's a softer way of, of getting somebody to do what you want and less harsh than what she's been experiencing from her own authorities, including the fawn. Yeah, right. Um, I, I guess we should also say that the fawn does come back and give her another chance. She's kind of locked in that room, the one that reminds David of his hey, grandfather's yeah, yeah. house. Yeah. She's she's locked in there. She's she's being kept in there and she can't get out. And so the fawn, I, I guess we failed to mention this. The fawn was furious when he found out that she ate the grape, that two of the fairies are dead because the one fairy survived and tells him. And he's like, now you'll never uh, return to your kingdom. You'll never get, you know, uh, your, your kingdom yeah, yeah. back, all this stuff and right. leaves. And she, she feels like, you know, oh no, I'm left behind. Um, in this time, she tries to escape with Mercedes. I think Mercedes is trying to legitimately like leave, like get out. And, and, and Ophelia is like, take me with you, take me with you. Yes. So they try to yeah. escape, they get caught. Mercedes is going to be um, tortured. And then they, they lock Ophelia in her room. Yeah. And she has to use the so, chalk to get out and go get her brother. Yes. Because that's, that's the trial. The third trial is take your brother into the labyrinth, bring him in. Right. So there's a bit of a fight that happens there, and this is really good. So, um, well, before this, um, when they're catching the rebels and stuff, yes. Um, even while fighting, Vidal is checking his pocket watch. Yes. Like as it's like he's waiting. He's like, "What time <laughs> waiting am I going to die?" Moment. It's waiting coming, for it's the coming. moment. Yep. Um, so he's always aware of the time. That's just mm. his thing. Um, and he also says, "This is the only decent way to die." Yep. That's one of his. That's and what I even he wrote says down too. here. Because like, don't be afraid, right? He said, yes. "Don't be afraid, uh, don't be afraid. Uh, uh, captain or whatever." Who is, yes. It's like this is the only decent way to die. This is the yeah. only decent way to die um and then this is where when because i think they win this skirmish right against yes. the rebels mm. and so then when they're going around just putting a bullet in the head of every single person 
who was a rebel, except for the ones that completely survived, like that one guy with the that stutter. have a chance to actually say yeah. to talk. Um, yeah. That guy, just his face, just the he can't believe he's doing this, and he's just like horrified, but he's following orders. Yeah. He's obeying, Without and it's questioning. it's yeah. causing him to live in his own personal hell, where he's gonna have nightmares about this for the rest of his life. Yep, uh, because of his obedience. Yep, which and, is not always a bad thing. And that's where, yeah, right. That's where they capture. The, the stuttering yes. rebel guy and that they torture him. If you can him. count to three, I'll let you go. That is yes. so, that is so it's diabolical. It's so cruel, dude. It is it's so, so evil, cruel. man. Yeah. yeah and, and he like enjoyed it. Too. Yeah. Oh, like absolutely. the torture, he was like, he was like excited to take mm-hmm. that scalpel and just like beat that guy up horribly. Yeah. And so he tortures him. Uh, he ends up talking, but he brings the doctor in. Vidal brings the doctor in because he wants to keep him alive longer to torture him more. Yes, but the doctor basically basically euthanizes yeah, him. Right. And so the doctor <sighs> disobeys yeah, the yes. order. And that's where we get the line where I'm I, I think you can draw mm-hmm. at least the, the clearest thing that I think is in the movie is is uh only only a man like you can obey blindly obey or obey asking. without asking questions, yeah. right? So that's all there. That he shoots it's and kills the, yep, doctor. the doctor. Dies. <clears throat> Which, then well, Mercedes tries again, to escape. Once again, this is great because Vidal is like, this is the only way to die is in war fighting. Yes. Now you look at the doctor and how he accepts his own death. He knows he's dying, right? Yeah. And he, but, but you look at him and you think, now that's the only way to die. Yes. Is when the doc, how the doctor died. Yes. Right. That's the only yes. like true way to die. You, you, you're, you're. You know, you're doing the right thing, and you you disobeyed for the right reason, and your death ends up becoming it's more reason. like martyr martyrdom. Yes, yeah. yeah, something more like for a good cause. Yeah, and and like Ophelia, like that's that's the way to die. And what's Not so interesting, a Vidal. What's so interesting too about that is his wife is in desperate need of that doctor in order to deliver and his I, son. And he is <laughs> he, he doesn't care in in that act of killing the doctor. He basically put his son's life at risk. Yes. He like forgot That's right. his legacy for a moment. Yeah. To to take revenge or or uh maybe you could even say I guess he wasn't ordered to do so, but it falls in line with his duties as the you know, the the leader of this uh, brigade yeah. or whatever. Um and and in f- in following that he basically put his own legacy at risk, which was the only thing he cared about. So now they have to have like a field medic deliver his baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like crazy. that was a really, really risky thing to do. Right. So he he lost the, <laughs> he lost the the forest for the tree a little bit there. Yeah. Um, with that decision, but um, and then as you mentioned, when the fawn was kind of berating Ophelia, there's a specific word there's some specific wording he uses right before he gives her the second chance he says all memory of you will fade in time yes right so right. the fawn is using the word time to threaten ophelia mm. it's really interesting the threat of one's memory fading with time is one that would resonate for vidal yes but for ophelia i i just kind of wonder does ophelia want to stop time like in a way she does she doesn't want a brother really she doesn't want a new dad. She doesn't want her mom to die. She probably doesn't want to become a woman, right? <laughs> she doesn't want to grow up. She does want time to stop. She wants a type of eternal life, right? But yeah. while Vidal Vidal has everything come to him and does not search for it, Ophelia is finding it outside of herself, yeah, right? She's exploring it. And so she's like, she's discovering, you know, what to do with the problem that time doesn't stop. Yeah. Whereas Vidal is like bringing everything to him, like as if he's in control of it. Right. Right. Um, um, and then when the mandrake, mandrake screams, the oh uh, yeah, the whole mandrake born. scene. She's under there taking care of it. He comes in, and finds out what it was. Yeah. This brings into question something that you probably don't. I think you already said you don't find that interesting. But which parts are happening in <laughs> objective reality in the movie, and which parts are not? Because obviously the mandrake's real, so she got that from somewhere. The chalk works because she's literally imprisoned in her room, and she uses the chalk to escape that room. Right. So the magic is real. To some degree, that's evidence for that, but yeah. I don't know how interesting that is to actually dive into or look at. At the it. moment, I just want to say that we all live in a fantasy, and I just, <laughs> like, <laughs> this is life. Well, I mean, like, in, uh, in, interview, in interviews, uh, Del Toro said that the magic is real, but he doesn't disavow the reading that, it, that it's in, 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 uh, in Ophelia's head, so... <laughs> yeah, take that for so well, you, you can well, read well, it either well, way, so. but for what, his um, interpretation, it is real. The magic yeah. is real. Yeah. Is what yeah, Albus in, Dumbledore says. I mean, in my case... Yeah. Yeah, in my case, I believe it's real because if it's not real, then there are a few things in the in the movie that 
don't really don't add up because yeah, the, yeah, the right Mandrake sense. has to come from, from somewhere. If he if the, if the magic is in real, how does she basically teleport at least twice in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, Dumbledore says, of course it's all in your head. But why should that mean that it isn't real? That it isn't real, yes, right? Yeah, exactly. Because this is the uh, this is the the point. Subjective reality is the only reality that you will ever experience. Yep. Okay. So the woman dies, but the baby lives, right? So he killed his wife's doctor. That's just ridiculous. Insane. Um, and then at the funeral, uh, there's the priest there, right? Mm -hmm. And the priest says, oh, and I this, this is yeah. this is so r interesting about the flower, right? So in pain, we find the meaning of life. That's the story right? with the thorns and the, and the rose, yeah. So yeah. another theme of this film, even rules that exist to avoid pain also avoid meaning, yes. right? Mm -hmm. When we live life by the rules and avoid pain and fear and early death, mm -hmm. we also avoid meaning and the vast treasures and rewards that lie in the darkness and in the unknown. This, this goes back to what we were talking about last time with shielding children from dark themes and fantasy stories. Yes. The fantasy stories yes. lose their meaning if there's no... There's scary as, scariness and real conflict and danger and right. a feeling like, uh, you know, allowing the kids to feel the fear of the characters. Um, you know, you lose the value of, of the rose at the end, you know. Yep. So the last part of what the priest says is that God, in his infinite wisdom, has put the solution in our hands. Yeah. Now, I, I well, first off, the left hand, right hand thing, but... Um, like, okay, so Guillermo del Toro is definitely critical of the Catholic Church. Yeah. But this line is so true and is so um, part of the theme that he's building to that he, he, he isn't anti-religious in general. He isn't anti-Christianity. He isn't anti, like, the, the deeper meaning of life and some, something more than just whatever you would call objective reality. He is saying that there there is like deeper meaning to be had. Yeah. Um, but he, I, and so my my I would err on the side of saying that his critique with is more to do specifically with the Catholic Church <laughs> and not about um, belief or religion just in general. Sure, of I would agree with that. Yeah, it's really. I, I think that's the case yeah, most of the time when people critique the Catholic Church and works. It's it's usually not yes. faith or. Um, you know, a belief in the in the spiritual. It's more just the institution itself, right? Yeah, they're yeah. easy. They're easy to pick on. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. David. No, yeah, no. I was gonna say that. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the the problems uh, that Del Toro has with the Catholic Church is more the institution rather than the the belief the, their beliefs. So, sure, because yeah. he's, he, I mean, he said multiple times that he's Catholic himself, and uh, yeah, that's uh, why he's so conflicted when it comes to the uh, to, to the institution and right. why. He criticizes so heavily in the, in this movie. Yeah, this also speaks to the alternate interpretation of the Garden of Eden, which is that pain is where meaning is to be found. Yes, and that in God's infinite wisdom, like anyways, I really don't. I I would. I don't think he sees the way the Catholic Church sees Eve eating the fruit as a bad being thing. a bad. Thing. It does not seem that Guillermo del Toro takes that yeah. view because he's saying no, no. At the end of the pain is the greater promise. Yeah. That you never would have gotten if you just time, well, well, another thing, in the Garden of Eden, there's basically no time. No time. Yeah. Right? Everything stands still, but you don't change, you don't learn, you don't do anything. Yeah. You're just kind of there, right? Yeah. But then once, you know, time starts, once Adam and Eve leave leave the Garden of Eden. Anyways, yeah. there's good stuff there. Um, so, yeah, then I've got <laughs> when Mercedes cuts his cheek. Oh, yes. So, he Mercedes is figured out. He figures her out. But she keeps that dagger in her clothes, mm -hmm. and she pulls it out and cuts this like this like three inch just like portion of his cheek off. And you get this crazy scene where he's sewing his cheek back yes, together. Yes, that's so. Intense. That CG was so well it done. It was so good. <laughs> it was so good. And I'm just like, how did they do that? It looks so real. It looks so yeah, good. Also, yeah. That that scene that scene also has like the most badass line in the in the, in the film when uh, yeah, Mercedes says that you. Uh, don't touch the uh, don't touch the girl. You won't be the first uh, pig. I, I've got it. Yeah, okay. that was great line. It's, it's yep. even str I mean, in stronger. It's even stronger in uh, in Spanish. It's, uh, no toques a la niña, no seas el primer cerdo que de huello. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. also, nice. um, also uh, because uh, I mean, part of it is the actress Maribel Verdú. I mean, she was she was by far the most popular actor in the in the movie when when he first came oh, yeah. out. The second one would be the, uh, Carmen's uh, actress um, uh, Ariana Hill. And yeah, she. Both of them are considered like two of the best actors in in uh, in, in Spain at the moment, if not ever. As a matter of fact, uh, her performance in this uh, film 
uh, landed her her first uh, English speaking role with Fran Francis for for Coppola. The, 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 the oh, Francis for Coppola. Oh, cool. oh wow, nice. nice. Yeah, I yeah. like that. That's awesome. That's cool. Yeah, yeah no, she's uh, she's. Uh, I mean, this one is considered one of, of her best uh, best roles, and that's saying something because again, yeah. she's been a star in you Spain. You know, I haven't the, seen the, any yeah. any of her stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Just just look up this. Maribel Verdú, and you will have like uh, you are Sounds good for, for choice with her. You can go, go you cannot go go wrong with her. Although her think. other uh, popular, um, uh, really popular uh, movie is uh, Itu Mama Itu Mama también. Itu Mama también. Oh, yeah. That, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Although that one is uh, from Mexico rather than from Spain, but yeah, that was the that was oh, the role okay. that made her popular among English speaking audiences. So oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she takes her brother, and um, he knows that he's gonna die. Right, the, yeah. the the rebels are coming. I think one of his officers told him, "Hey, yeah. we only have like ten they, men left." They have though no, nobody left. Yeah. yeah, and he's just like they're attacking, and he's like he knows he's gonna die. Right. Yeah. And now it's a full moon, and um, we can move on to. I'm, okay, I'm up yeah. to where you're at now. Okay, so yeah, the fawn tells her specifically, Ophelia, that this is her last chance. Right. You, if you fail, th that's what I love about this is that. Let's say the choice she made in the last trial was wrong. She, her, she trusted her intuition a second time and it ended right. up being the wrong thing to do, right? Yeah. Now it's like you don't get another chance. So if you, if you make a choice and it's the wrong choice this time, you're, that, that's it for real. Like right. for real, you're not going to be a princess again. <laughs> so that like raises the stakes in a okay, way to sure. where she would almost be more inclined uh, to follow. That's a good point. Right, to do ah, what she's told. Yes. Because yeah, yeah. now the stakes are way higher They're if she's high. if she chooses wrong and yes. disobeys and it turns out to be wrong that she did that. Yeah. So I love that that's the context behind this choice because obviously it's a test to see whether or not she'll sacrifice the baby yeah. to get the, the, to go back to be a princess again, um, which is what she wants more than anything. But she doesn't. Despite all of that, she's still is not a she still will not just blindly obey without mm -hmm. saying no that's wrong i can't do that right and and that's kind of where it really comes together for me the beauty of it because it means that she's sacrificing everything that she worked for everything she wanted the whole movie and she was in love with fairy tales she she was told earlier by one of the ladies when she was wearing the dresses she looked like a princess oh, that made yes. her so happy yes and this fawn is giving her a promise yeah. of becoming of, of going back to her kingdom and being a princess again mm -hmm. that's all she wants and still for this baby that's not her it's her stepbrother the, the son of vidal who she hates yes yeah still will not she'll sacrifice all of that for him it, because she's yeah. not going to follow blindly what the fawn tells her to do. Love it. I think it's beautiful the you know, way that that plays out. It, it is. And it, it's even more potent when it's like the fawn says, I'm not going to kill the baby. I'm yeah. just going to take one drop. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. And she's like, she will not even allow him that. to take one drop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's wonderful. Um, it, so, yeah, yeah I, I, I think I wrote here. Oh, and the fawn says, you promised to obey me. Yes, because he says uh, yeah. that she has to do everything he says without questioning him. Yes. And then she says, obeying all the commands. Mm -hmm. So, like, you cannot question me at all on this one. If, if this is your last chance, <laughs> if you don't do everything I say exactly as I say it, not yeah. even questioning what I say at all, then you can, you know, you can have the promise. But she does. Anyways. And so um, I wrote down, this is exactly what the doctor told the captain. You know, only men like you can do what yeah. you're told without questioning it. So, um, well, the consequence is that he retreats, uh, leaves her when, when, cause she ran through the, she was running away from Vidal. Yeah. She, had, she, she, poisoned, actually, she poisoned him first. Remember yes. she put some drops of poison. This in is actually my cup. biggest criticism of the movie, believe it or not, is that she's hiding from him under a desk that is open. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so like, okay, this okay. desk has it, it's just like a plank of wood with four legs yeah. and Vidal sits at this desk and walks around and does not see her hiding right there <laughs> it's just like <laughs> put a back on the desk so he can at least believe that there's an obstruction that he can't see it was so stupid but anyways she's like hiding she puts the the poison for, yeah. it's her mother's medication only two drops okay. right she put like the whole bottle into yeah, his, into his drink yeah. and so he's all drugged and, and it she may not be poison maybe it's like morphine but like you know sure. it's he's at the very least he's drugged right so he, he's overdosed on whatever it is so yeah. he's chasing her through the labyrinth he shows up the fawn leaves her alone with him he takes yeah. the baby back and shoots her he and shoots kills her. her yeah 
Um, then he's met, of course, by Mercedes and the rest of the rebels. They kill him and they say, the child will never even know your name. That was he, great. he tried to tell them, tell, he's tell, like, yeah, break my watch yeah. and tell him, you know, how his father died. He's like, no, they won't even, the baby won't even know your name. He is horrified. Oh, he, when he hears that's that. the, that's the worst thing. That's he it. <laughs> Oh, that was bad. <laughs> so that was, that was so cathartic. I have to say that was the more kind yeah. of it was. <laughs> it was good. I like seeing it's that. Awesome. I also have this line here. Ophelia is refusing to sacrifice her brother. Instead, she becomes the sacrifice. Yep. She gives herself for her brother and for the future potential of Spain, which is children, right? Yeah. <clears throat> This selfless act, like Pinocchio, leads to her becoming whole again and joining the fairy tale world as a princess, a real, a real princess, you know, seated by the king and queen. Where Pinocchio becomes a real boy, Ophelia leaves what seems like reality and joins the fairy tale. It's a bit of a reversal in that yeah. sense, um, but it's the same kind of story. And there's also just as with Pinocchio and this story, it's the line of Christ in the New Testament where he says, um, "He that loseth his life for my sake," meaning for the right reason or for like for the the intuitive spirit within yourself then he shall find it right yeah right so she becomes something of a martyr in that sense and that's really i thought that was really good and i really like also how you tied that with each trial there was a sacrifice whether it's the 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 pill bug the louse yeah whether it's the fairies and now it's her right there there there's a sacrifice in each one and then i also took this line this is my last note Traces of her life on earth are represented with a flower. With a flower. And then her dress that she's wearing as she enters paradise, there's the rose. That rose. On, on, on her dress. So that's really she cool. passed through the thorns, through the pain. That's right. That's it. And that's she right. received okay, cool. the rose, which is the eternal life that, yes. that was in the story, right? So that's super cool. Perfect ending. It, perfect. It's really, really good. I have just a little bit here. She is seated at the king's left hand. I, I yep. don't even need to explain this. You guys get where I was going the whole time. <laughs> yep. uh, her mother is there, and it is her mother, the actress. I, yeah, I couldn't yeah, tell at first. Right. Carmen. Yes, yes but Carmen, yeah, Carmen is yeah. there. And she's the queen um, and holding her brother. She's holding the baby. Yep, the baby. Mm-hmm. Um, so I also wanted to mention there's a lot of Catholic imagery on both sides here. There is Catholic imagery present in the Iron Cross, in the demand for obedience, in the disregard for the poor, uh, the pale man, etc. But then there is also Catholic imagery in the beautiful moments, yep. in the funeral words by the priest, um, the king's halls at the end of the film, right? That looks like a church. It looks like a cathedral, yes. right? It's beautiful, mm-hmm. and it, but it looks like a Catholic. It, it's it's like this elevation of this Catholic imagery that is as it should be kind of thing. It's, sure. it's really, really cool. Um, it's almost as if this movie is attempting to make a critique of one part of the church while still commending the dreams and hopes of the religion's central message and of Christ's central message, chiefly eternal life, meaning through suffering, the divinity of children, and the mixture of something like fantastical tales with real life. Yeah. In some ways, uh, he's very kind to Catholicism, uh, kinder than many films are. <laughs> <laughs> sure. In other ways, of course, he offers his criticism, right? It's yeah. all implicit in images, etc. right? Yeah. But uh, an important thing to note about Ophelia is that as she as she dies, uh, she smiles, and then Mercedes cries. Right, that part really gets me. You know, mm, like, yep, because she's like twelve, right? Yeah, really young. That's hard to watch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Every I've seen this movie a bunch of times, and it means a lot to me. But like. Whenever you see something like that happen, it's always like, oh, what a tragedy. This is horrible. This should never happen. It like makes me mad. Yeah. And then you see her smile. Yep. Yep. It's good. <laughs> it's good. It's great. <laughs> I agree. It I just agree makes 100%. me feel like it hits me right in the heart. And yes. I'm just like, you know what? We place all this importance on like, oh, you know, you, you, you can't ever die. You've, we got to keep kids yeah. safe, just like Carmen. Yeah. Like you got to keep the kids safe. And, and the most important thing is that the kid's alive. And, and in some ways I have kids, right? Yeah. So, like, I identify with that a lot. Oh, but, sure. But at the same time, it's like you have to let your kids live. Yes. And in order to truly let them live, let them experience life. And and there is a risk to that. Mm-hmm. But you yes. don't get the reward without the risk. Exactly. You don't get what life has to offer without living it, you know? Yes. I, I absolutely agree with that. And, I mean, I we've already talked a little bit. <clears throat> I don't remember if it was the first episode of... Pan's Labyrinth or whether it was sometime at Bioshock, it's all bleeding together for me. <laughs> I know, I know. But feeling the same way about a little bit of how I was raised, feeling overprotected and how I felt like that uh, hindered right. me in some ways, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, you don't want anything bad, any harm to come to your kids. 
but that's what life is. Life is yeah. har- harm. It's thorns. It's trauma. It's y- yeah. bad things happening. But right. the promise that comes with it is the experience of going through those things leads you. You, you learn through those experiences and, and hopefully that leads you to the rose. Right. But you got to stick with it all the way to the end. You can't give up halfway through. That's the worst. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> if you go through that much pain and then give up halfway through, it's like yeah. you didn't get anything. And I mean, that's rough. if you don't enter the thorns at all, then right. you didn't really live. Your life right. was meaningless. Yes, exactly. Right? Exactly. And so yeah. that's the hardest thing I think for a parent, and I'm not a parent yet, but the hardest thing for a parent to grapple with is the instinct to keep them from all harm yeah. Because they need to survive to pass the genes. Right. That's, that's the selfish <laughs> right? gene. Yeah. That's, <laughs> but at the same instinct. time, how can their life be meaningful? How can they enjoy the things in life you did through the thorns you've passed through unless you allow them to also do so? Right. And that's the hardest thing is to know it's they're really making hard. a bad choice or, or a choice that you're not sure there's a lot of risk to it mm-hmm. and to let them do it anyways, yeah. even though there may be harm that comes from it. Uh, and who knows where that freaking fog of war gray area begins oh, and ends. There but. is no <laughs> adequate advice in that arena. Sure. It's like, and that's the intuition. That's where the priest says, oh, if I can scroll right back up there, God in his infinite wisdom, what was it? Oh my gosh, how many lines? Yeah, Sorry. it was during the funeral, right? Yes. God in his infinite wisdom has put the solution in our hands, right? Yep. That it's not like there's not a field manual of rules to follow. Yes, right. It's it's within us. You figure it's it out. It's within each of us. You figure it out, right. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful message. Yep. Um, um, I've got some, just one last paragraph here, okay. and then we, we do have to go. <laughs> yeah. So this is absolutely amazing. In some ways, this new viewing of the film has deepened my appreciation of the movie and made me like it more. There are a few ways that make me move, like it slightly less than usual. The, the theme of disobedience <laughs> is one that comes with, uh, with a difficult situation. Um, it's as if, you know, he's expecting that people will always do the right thing in a difficult situation. And so you should always, whenever you're in conflict, it's like follow your heart. There yeah. is something good about that, though. Like, yeah. I can't completely disagree with it. Yeah. Um, in fact, I probably am not going to read the rest of my note here because in discussing it with you, I have kind of come to a different space with that. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we're a, probably a little more faithful to his actual vision. Sure. Um, rather than calling it disobedience as the theme, just saying that it's um, blind obedience. It's a treatise blind. against blind. Blind obedience. Blind obedience yeah. yeah, and in that case, you know, I don't need to read what I had written before. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, any anything you want to say, real quick? Just keep in mind, David. We need to leave in like two minutes. One so. minute. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, that's the problem. I have a lot, a lot of stuff to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, I'm sorry. I got yeah, no, it. it's fine. It's fine. I mean, I can understand it, and it's uh, it's your show anyway, so <laughs> you should be the the ones leading it. But yeah, it's um. Oh my God, it's like so much. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I always get talked uh, talk up a little bit with the, with the ending. It's too because, good. Uh, I mean, yeah. everything leads up to it so perfectly. And also the uh, the actors, uh, Maribel Verdu and, and Ivana Vaquero, they are like 10 out of 10 uh, there. The music mm. from um, Javier yes. Navarrete, which is like a masterful. The I mean, every time that I hear that lullaby, it's, it's, I can feel I can help but to feel a bit like, a, oh, yeah. please not now. It's not a convenient time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and uh, well, I mean, just to bring it up, uh, I mean, uh, I, I talked uh, before uh, uh, about how the uh, Guillermo del Toro wrote the, the English subtitles himself, and uh, there were a couple oh, right. of uh, places where I didn't agree with uh, with his choices. Uh, but I mean, the, the the example that that stood out to me was in in the scene when um, uh, Mercedes cuts. Uh, um, his cheek, uh, Vidal's cheek. Yeah, yeah, and um, in in Spanish he calls him hijo de puta, which oh, it, it sure. could be uh, translate uh, as son of a bitch. The thing yes. is that that's the worst. Uh, I mean, voice tone is very important uh, when it comes to swearing in Spanish in general. Okay, but in theory, that's the worst thing that you can say in Spanish to a person. Oh, okay. and uh, keep in mind in that that scene she comes, uh, she started uh, even when she, uh, he's threatening to to torture her. Uh, Mercedes is still uh, talking to Vidal in a in a formal way, using usted. But when yeah, she yeah. liberates herself, he she she drops it completely. She right. she he she starts calling him too, and he and and uh, she calls him hijo de puta. Is like oh my god, <laughs> that's what makes the 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 scene even more badass. Oh, and that's I'm good. Not sure, um, that's good yeah, context. And I'm not sure. The thing is that I remember that. Uh, 
um, Del Toro translated the, the sentence as motherfucker in English, and I'm not sure if the same meaning was conveyed, but... Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Gotcha. That's something yeah, for you that, to decide. That, I, I, I do think that that's <laughs> not quite the same, but make sure, uh, David, to leave a comment with any of your final thoughts when this uh, goes yeah, up, yeah. so that people can hear yeah. the rest of what you wanted to say there. Yeah, uh, yeah, otherwise, thank you. Apologize, everyone, that we have to cut out, nice, okay. but we got to go right now. Thank you for watching, and uh, we'll put up a vote real soon for the next thing we cover. Yeah. I have a seeking suspicion it's probably going to be Jacob's Ladder, yep. but um, <laughs> we'll let you vote on that. So uh, until next time, peace out. <laughs>